The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur G. Rees To Arthur Black in Memory of Old Times Chapter 1 Reading by Lars Rolander Hello, is that Hampstead Police Station? Yes, who are you? Detective Inspector Chippenfield of Scotland Yard. Tell Inspector Selden I want him, and be quick about it. Yes, sir. Hang on, sir. I'll put you through to him at once. Detective Inspector Chippenfield of Scotland Yard waited with the receiver held to his ear. While he waited, he scrutinized keenly a sheet of paper which lay on the desk in front of him. It was a flimsy, faintly ruled sheet from a cheap writing pad, blotted and soiled and covered with sprawling letters, which had been roughly printed at irregular intervals, as though to hide the identity of the writer. But the letters formed words, and the words read, "'Sir Horace Fewbanks was murdered last night. Who did it, I don't know, so it's no use trying to find out who I am.' You will find his dead body in the library at Riverbrook. He was shot through the heart. Hello. Is that you, Inspector Chippenfield? Yes, that's you, Solden. Have you heard anything of a murder out of your way? Can't say that I have, have you? Yes, we have information that Sir Horace Fewbanks has been murdered, shot. Mr. Justice Fewbanks shot? Murdered? Inspector Selden gave expression to his surprise in a long, low whistle which travelled through the telephone. Then he added, after a moment's reflection, "'There must be some mistake. He's away.' "'Away where?' "'In Scotland. He went there for the twelfths, when uh, the shooting season opened.' "'Are you sure of that?' "'Yes. He rang me up the day before he left to ask us to keep an eye on his house while he was away.' There was a pause at the Scotland Yard end of the telephone. Inspector Chippenfield was evidently thinking hard. "'We may have been hoaxed,' he said at length, "'but I have been ringing up his house and can get no answer. "'You had better send up a couple of men there at once. "'Better still, go yourself. "'It is a matter which may require tactful handling. "'Let me know, and I'll come out immediately if there is anything wrong.' "'Stay. How long will it take you to get up to the house?' And "'Not more than fifteen minutes in a taxi.' "'Well, I'll ring you up at the house in half an hour. Should our information be correct, see that everything is left exactly as you find it till I arrive?' Inspector Selden hung up the receiver of his telephone, bundled up the papers scattered on his desk, closed it, and stepped out of his office into the next room. "'Anyone about?' he hurriedly asked the sergeant, who was making entries in the charge-book. "'Yes, sir. I saw Flack here a moment ago. Get him at once, and call a taxi. Scotland Yard's rung through to say they've received a report that Sir Horace Fewbanks has been murdered.' "'Murdered?' echoed the sergeant in a tone of keen interest. "'Who told Scotland Yard that?' "'I don't know. Who was on that beat last night?' "'Flack, sir.' Was Sir Horace murdered in his own house? I thought he was in Scotland. So did I. But he may have returned. Ah, here is the taxi. Inspector Selden had been waiting on the steps for the appearance of a cab from the rank round the corner in response to the shrill blast which the sergeant had blown on his whistle. The sergeant went to the door of the station, leading into the yard, and sharply called, Flack! In response, a police constable, without helmet or tunic, came running up the steps from the basement, which was used as a gymnasium. Selden wants you. Get on your tunic as quick as you can. He is in a devil of a hurry. Inspector Selden was seated in the taxicab when Flack appeared. He had been impatiently drumming his fingers on the door of the cab. Jump in, man, he said angrily. What has kept you all this time? Flack breathed stertorously to show that he had been running and was out of breath, but he made no reply to the official rebuke. Inspector Selden turned to him and remarked severely, 
"'Why didn't you let me know that Sir Horace Fewbanks had returned from Scotland?' Flack looked astonished. "'But he hasn't returned, sir,' he said. "'He's away for a month at least,' he ventured to add. "'Who told you that?' "'The housemaid at Riverbrook, before he went away.' "'Hm.' The inspector's next question contained a moral rebuke, rather than an official one. "'You're a married man, Flack?' "'Yes, sir.' "'So the housemaid told you he was going away for a month. "'Well, she ought to know. "'When did she tell you?' "'A week ago, yesterday, sir. "'She told me that all the servants except the butler "'were going down to Delmere the next day. "'That is Sir Horace's country place, "'and that Sir Horace was going to Scotland for the shooting, "'and would put in some weeks at Delmere "'after the shooting season was over. "'Are you sure he hasn't returned?' quite sir i saw hill the butler only yesterday morning and he told me that his master was sure to be in scotland for at least a month longer it's very strange muttered the inspector half to himself it will be a deuce awkward situation to face if scotland yard has been hoaxed beg your pardon sir but is there anything wrong about sir horace yes scotland yard has received a report that he has been murdered Flack's surprise was so great that it lifted the lid of official humility, which habitually covered his natural feelings. "'Murdered!' he exclaimed. "'Sir Horace Fewbanks murdered? You don't say so!' "'But I do say so,' retorted the inspector irritably. He was angry at the fact that the information, whether true or false, had gone direct to Scotland Yard instead of reaching him first. "'When was he murdered, sir?' asked Flack. "'Last night, when you were on that beat.' Flack paled at this remark. "'Last night, sir?' he cried. "'Don't repeat my words like a parrot,' ejaculated the inspector peevishly. "'Didn't you notice anything suspicious when you were along there?' "'No, sir. Was he murdered in his own house?' "'His dead body is supposed to be lying there now in the library,' said Inspector Selden. "'How Scotland Yard got wind of it is more than I know. "'We ought to have heard of it before them. "'How many times did you go along there last night?' "'Twice, sir. About eleven o'clock, and then about three. "'And there was nothing suspicious you saw no one? "'I saw Mr. Roberts and his lady coming home from the theatre. "'But he lives at the other end of Tanton Gardens, "'and I saw the housemaid of Mr. Fielding's come out of, to the pillar-box. "'That was a few minutes after eleven. "'I didn't see anybody at all the second time. "'Nobody at the judge's place? "'No taxi or anything like that?' "'No, sir.' "'The taxicab turned swiftly into the shady avenue of Tanton Gardens, "'where Sir Horace Fewbanks lived, "'and in a few moments pulled up outside of Riverbrook.' The house stood a long way back from the road in its own grounds. Inspector Selden and Flack passed rapidly through the grounds and reached the front door of the mansion. There was nobody about. The place seemed deserted, and the blinds were down on the ground-floor windows. Inspector Selden knocked loudly at the front door with a big old-fashioned brass knocker, and rang the bell. He listened intently for a response, but no sound followed except the sharp note of the electric bell as Flack rang it again, while Inspector Selden bent down with his ear at the keyhole. Then the inspector stepped back and regarded the house keenly for a moment or two. "'Put your finger on that bell, and keep on ringing it, Flack,' he said suddenly. "'I see that some of the blinds are down, but there's one on the first floor which is partly up. It looks as though the house had been shut up and somebody had come back unexpectedly perhaps it's hill the butler said flack if he's inside he ought to answer the bell but keep on ringing while i knock again the heavy brass knocker again reverberated on the thick oak door and inspector selden placed his ear against the keyhole to ascertain if any sound was to be heard "'Take your finger off that bell, Flack,' he commanded. "'I cannot hear whether anybody is coming or not.' He remained in a listening attitude for half a minute, and then plied the knocker again. Again he listened for footsteps within the house. 
Ring again, Flack. Keep on ringing while I go round the house to see if there is any way I can get in. I may have to break a window. Don't move from here. Inspector Selden went quickly round the side of the house, trying the windows as he went. Towards the rear of the house, on the west side, he came across a curious abutment of masonry jutting out squarely from the wall. On the other side of this abutment, which gave the house something of an unfinished appearance, were three French windows close together. The blinds of these windows were closely drawn, but the inspector's keen eye detected that one of the catches had been broken, and there were marks of some instrument on the outside woodwork. Uh, "'This looks like business,' he muttered. He pulled open the window and walked into the room. The light of an afternoon sun showed him that the apartment was a breakfast room, well and solidly furnished in an old-fashioned way, with most of the furniture in covers, as though the occupants of the house were away. The daylight penetrated to the door at the far end of the room. It was wide open and revealed an empty passage. Inspector Selden walked into the passage. The drawn blinds made the passage seem quite dark after the bright August sunshine outside, but he produced an electric torch, and by its light he saw that the passage ran into the main hall. His footsteps echoed in the empty house. The electric bell rang continuously as Flack pressed it outside. Inspector Selden walked along the passage to the hall, flashing his torch into each room he passed. He saw nothing and went to the front door to admit Flack. "'That is enough of that noise, Flack,' he said. "'Come inside and help me search the house above. "'It's empty on this floor, so far as I've been over it. "'If you find anything, call me, and mind you do not touch anything. "'Where did you say the library was?' "'I don't know, sir. "'Well, look about you on the ground floor while I go upstairs. "'Call me if you hear anything.' Inspector Selden mounted the stairs swiftly in order to continue his search. The staircase was a wide one, with broad shallow steps thickly carpeted, and a handsome carved mahogany baluster. The inspector, flashing his torch as he ran up, saw a small electric light niche in the wall before he reached the first landing. The catch of the light was underneath, and Inspector Selden turned it on. The light revealed that the stairs swept round at that point to the landing on the first floor, which was screened from view by heavy velvet hangings, partly caught back by the bent arm of a marble figure of Diana, which faced downstairs, with its other arm upraised and about to launch a hunting spear. By this graceful device the curtains were drawn back sufficiently to give access to the corridor on the first floor. Inspector Selden looked closely at the figure and the hangings. Something strange about the former arrested his eye. It was standing awry on its pedestal, was indeed almost toppling over. He looked up and saw that one of the curtains supported by the arm hung loosely from one of the curtain rings. It was as though some violent hand had torn the curtain in passing almost dragging it from the pool, and precipitating the figure down the stairs. Immediately beyond the landing in the corridor was a door on the right flung wide open. The inspector entered the room with the open door. It was a large room forming part of the front of the house, a lofty large room partly lighted by the half-drawn blind of one of the windows. One side was lined with bookshelves, in the corner of the room farthest from the door was a roll-top desk, which was open. In the centre of the room was a table, and a huddled-up figure was lying beside it, in a dark pool of blood which had oozed into the carpet. The inspector stepped quickly back to the landing. Flack, he called, and unconsciously his voice dropped to a sharp whisper in the presence of death. Flack, come here! When Flack reached the door of the library, he saw his chief kneeling beside the prostrate body of a dead man. The body lay clear of the table, near the foot of an armchair. Instinctively, Flack walked on tiptoe to his chief. "'Is he dead, sir?' he asked. "'Cold and stiff,' replied the inspector in a hushed voice. "'He's been dead for hours.' 
Flack noted that the body was fully dressed, and he saw a dark stain above the breast where the blood had welled forth and soaked the dead man's clothes and formed a pool on the carpet beside him. Inspector Selden opened the dead man's clothes. Over his heart he found the wound from which the blood had flowed. "'There it is, Flack,' he said, touching the wound lightly with his finger. "'It doesn't take a big wound to kill a man.' As he spoke, the sharp ring of a telephone bell from downstairs reached them. "'That's Inspector Chippenfield,' said Inspector Selden, rising to his feet. "'Stay here, Flack, till I go and speak to him.'" End of Chapter 1 of The Hampstead Mystery By John R. Watson and Arthur G. Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter Two of the Hampstead Mystery. Reading by Lars Rolander. Six thirty edition. High Court Judge murdered. It was not quite five p.m., but the enterprising section of the London evening newspapers had their six thirty editions on sale in the streets. To such a pitch had the policy of giving the public what it once been elevated that the halfpenny newspapers were able to give the people of London the news each afternoon, a full ninety minutes before the edition was supposed to have left the press. The time of the edition was boldly printed in the top right-hand corner of each paper as a guarantee of enterprise, if not of good faith. On practical enterprise of this kind does journalism forge ahead. Some people who have been bred up in a conservative atmosphere sneer at such journalistic enterprise. They affect to regard as unreliable the up-to-date news contained in newspapers which are unable to tell the truth about the hands of the clock. From the cries of the newsboys, and from the announcements of the newspaper bills which they displayed, it was assumed by those with a greedy appetite for sensations that a judge of the High Court had been murdered on the bench. Such an appetite easily swallowed the difficulty created by the fact that the law courts had been closed for the long vacation. In imagination they saw a dramatic scene in court. The disappointed, demented, desperate litigant suddenly drawing a revolver and with unerring aim shooting the judge through the brain before the deadly weapon could be wrenched from his hands. But though the sensation created by the murder of a judge of the high court was destined to grow and to be fed by unexpected developments, the changing faces of which monopolized public attention throughout England on successive occasions, there was little in the evening papers to satisfy the appetite for sensation. In journalistic vernacular, they were late in getting on to it and therefore their reference to the crime occupied only a few lines in the stop press news beneath some late horse-racing results. The evening courier, which was first in the streets with the news, made its announcement of the crime in the following brief paragraph. The dead body of Sir Horace Fewbanks, the distinguished High Court judge, was found by the police at his home, Riverbrook, in Tanton Gardens, Hampstead, today. Deceased had been shot through the heart. The police have no doubt that he was murdered. But the morning papers of the following day did full justice to the sensation. It was the month of August when Parliament is up, the law courts closed for the long vacation, and when everybody who is anybody is out of London for the summer holidays. News was scarce, and the papers read with one another in making the utmost of the murder of a high court judge. Each of the morning papers sent out a man to Hampstead soon after the news of the crime reached their offices in the afternoon, and some of the more enterprising sent two or three men. Scotland Yard and Riversboro were visited by a succession of pressmen, representing the London dailies, the provincial press, and the news agencies. The two points on which the newspaper accounts of the tragedy laid stress were the mysterious letter which had been sent to Scotland Yard stating that Sir Horace Fewbanks had been murdered, 
and the mystery surrounding the sudden return of Sir Horace from Scotland to his townhouse. On the first point there was room for much varied speculation. Why was information about the murder sent to Scotland Yard, and why was it sent in a disguised way? If the person who had sent this letter had no connection with the crime and was anxious to help the police, why had he not gone to Scotland Yard personally and told the detectives all he knew about the tragedy? If, on the other hand, he was implicated in the crime, why had he informed the police at all? It would have been to his interest, as an accomplice, even if he had been an unwilling accomplice, to leave the crime undiscovered as long as possible, so that he and those with whom he had been associated might make their escape to another country. But he had sent his letter to Scotland Yard within a few hours of the perpetration of the crime, and had not given the actual murderer time to get out of England. Was he not afraid of the vengeance the actual murderer would endeavour to exact for this disclosure which would enable the police to take measures to prevent his escape? No light was thrown on the cause of the murdered man's sudden return from the grouse shooting in Scotland. The newspaper accounts, though they differed greatly in their statements, surmises and suggestions concerning the tragedy, agreed on the point that Sir Horace had been a keen sportsman and was a very fine shot. In years past he had made a practice of spending the early part of the long vacation in Scotland, going there for the opening of the grouse season on the 12th of August. This year he had been one of a party of five who had rented Cray Lath Hall in the Western Highlands and after five days' shooting he had announced that he had to go to London on urgent business, but would return in the course of a week or less. It was suggested in some of the newspapers' accounts that an explanation of the cause of his return might throw some light on the murder. Inquiries were being made at Crayleth Hall to ascertain the reason for his journey to London, or whether any telegram had been received by him previous to his departure. The fact that one of the windows on the ground floor of Riversbrook had been found open was regarded as evidence that the murderer had broken into the house. Imprints of footsteps had been found in the ground outside the window, and the police had taken several casts of these but whether the man who had broken into the house with the intention of committing burglary or murder was a matter on which speculation differed. If the murderer was a criminal who had broken into the house with the intention of committing a burglary, there could be no connection between the return of Sir Horace Fewbanks from Scotland and his murder. The burglary had probably been arranged in the belief that the house was empty. Sir Horace, having sent the servants away to his country house in Delmer a week before. But if the murderer was a burglar, he had stolen nothing and had not even collected any articles for removal. The only thing that was known to be missing was the dead man's pocket-book, but there was nothing to prove that the murderer had stolen it. It was quite possible that it had been lost or mislaid by Sir Horace. It was even possible that it had been stolen from him in the train during the journey from Scotland. It might be that while prowling through the rooms after breaking into the house, and before he had collected any goods for removal, the burglar had come unexpectedly on Sir Horace, and after shooting him had fled from the house. Only as a last resort to prevent capture did burglars commit murder. Had Sir Horace been shot while attempting to seize the intruder? The position in which the body was found did not support that theory. Two shots had been fired, the first of which had missed its victim and entered the wall of the library. Evidently the murdered man had been hit by the second while attempting to leave the room. It was ingeniously suggested by the daily record that the murderer was a criminal who knew Sir Horace, and was known to him as a man who had been before him at the Old Bailey. This would account for Sir Horace being ruthlessly shot down without having made any attempt to seize the intruder. 
The burglar would have felt on seeing Sir Horace in the room that he was identified, and the only way of escaping ultimate arrest by the police was to kill the man who could put the police on his track. Mr. Justice Fewbanks had had the reputation of being a somewhat severe judge, and it was possible that some of the criminals who had been sentenced by him at Old Bailey entertained a grudge against him. The question of when the murder was committed was regarded as important. Dr. Slingsby of the Home Office, who had examined the body shortly after it was discovered by the police, was of opinion that death had taken place at least twelve hours before, and probably longer than that. His opinion on this point lent support to the theory that the murder had been committed before midnight on Wednesday. It was the daily record that seized on the mystery contained in the facts that the body, when discovered, was fully clothed, and that the electric lights were not turned on. If the murder was committed late at night, how came it that there were no lights in the empty house when the police discovered the body? Had the murderer, after shooting his victim, turned out the lights so that on the following day no suspicion would be created, as would be the case if anyone saw lights burning in the house in the daytime? If he had done so, he was a cool hand. But if the burglar was such a cool hand as to stop to turn out the lights after the murder, why did he not also stop to collect some valuables? Was he afraid that in attempting to get rid of them to a fence or drop, he would practically reveal himself as the murderer and so place himself in danger in case the police offered a reward for the apprehension of the author of the crime? If Sir Horace had gone to bed before the murderer entered the house, it would have been natural to expect no lights turned on. But he had returned unexpectedly. There were no servants in the house, and there was no bed ready for him. In any case, if he intended stopping in the empty house instead of going to a hotel, he would have been wearing a sleeping suit when his body was discovered, or at most he would be only partially dressed if he had got up on hearing somebody moving about the house. But the body was fully dressed, even to collar and tie. It was absurd to suppose that the victim had been sitting in the darkness when the murderer appeared. Another difficult problem Scotland Yard had to face was the discovery of the person who had sent them the news of the murder. How had Scotland Yard's anonymous correspondent learnt about the murder, and what were his motives in informing the police in the way he had done? Was he connected with the crime? Had the murderer a companion with him when he broke into Riversbrook for the purpose of burglary? That seemed to be the most probable explanation. The second man had been horrified at the murder, and desired to disassociate himself from it, so that he might escape the gallows. The only alternative was to suppose that the murderer had confessed his crime to someone, and that his confidant had lost no time in informing the police of the tragedy. The newspaper accounts of the case threw some light on the private and domestic affairs of the victim. He was a widower with a grown-up daughter, his wife, a daughter of the late Sir James Goldsworthy, who changed his ancient family patronymic from Granville to Goldsworthy on inheriting the great fortune of an American kinsman, had died eight years before. Sir Horace's Hampstead household consisted of a housekeeper, butler, chauffeur, cook, housemaid, kitchenmaid, and gardener. With the exception of the butler, the servants had been sent the previous week to Sir Horace's country house in Delmer, Sussex. It appeared that Miss Fewbanks spent most of her time at the country house, and came up to London but rarely. She was at Delmer when the murder was committed, and had been under the impression that her father was in Scotland. According to a report received from the police at Delmer, the first intimation that Miss Fewbanks had received of the tragic death of her father came from them. Naturally, she was prostrated with grief at the tragedy. The butler, who had been left behind in charge of Riversbrook, was a man named Hill, but he was not in the house on the night of the tragedy. 
He was a married man, and his wife and child lived in Camden Town, where Mrs. Hill kept a confectionery shop. Hill's master had given him permission to live at home for three weeks while he was in Scotland. The house in Tanton Gardens had been locked up, and most of the valuables had been sent to the bank for safekeeping. But there were enough portable articles of value in the house to make a good haul for any burglar. Hill had instructions to visit the house three times a week for the purpose of seeing that everything was safe and in order. He had inspected the place on Wednesday morning, and everything was as it had been left when his master went to Scotland. Sir Horace Fewbanks had returned to London on Wednesday evening, reaching St. Pancras by the 6.30 train. Hill was unaware that his master was returning, and the first he learned of the murder was the brief announcement in the evening papers on Thursday. End of chapter 2 of The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur G. Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 3 of The Hampstead Mystery Reading by Lars Rolander Inspector Chippenfield, who had come into prominence in the newspapers as the man who had caught the gang who had stolen Lady Gladwell's jewels, which included the most costly pearl necklace in the world, was placed in charge of the case. It was to his success in this famous case that he owed his promotion to inspector. He had the assistance of his subordinate, Detective Rolfe. So generous were the newspaper references to the acumen of these two terrors of the criminal classes that it was to be assumed that anything which inadvertently escaped one of them would be pounced upon by the other. On the morning after the discovery of the murdered man's body, the two officers made their way to Tanton Gardens from the Hampstead tube station. Inspector Chippenfield was a stout man of middle age, with a red face, the colour of which seemed to be accentuated by the daily operation of removing every vestige of hair from it. He had prominent grey eyes, with which he was accustomed to stare fiercely when he desired to impress a suspected person with what some of the newspapers had referred to as his penetrating glance. His companion Rolf was a tall, well-built man in the early thirties. Like most men in a subordinate position, Rolf had not a high opinion of the abilities of his immediate superiors. He was sure that he could fill the place of any one of them better than it was filled by its occupant. He believed that it was the policy of superiors to keep junior men back, to stand in their light, and to take all the credit for their work. He was confident that he was destined to make a name for himself in the detective world, if only he were given the chance. When Inspector Chippenfield had visited Riversbrook the previous afternoon, Rolf had not been selected as his assistant. A careful inspection of the house, and especially of the room in which the tragedy had been committed, had been made by the inspector. He had then turned his attention to the garden and the grounds surrounding the house. Whatever he had discovered, and what theories he had formed, were not disclosed to anyone, not even his assistant. He believed that the proper way to train a subordinate was to let him collect his own information and then test it for him. This method enabled him to profit by his subordinate's efforts and to display a superior knowledge when the other propounded a theory by which Inspector Chippenfield had also been misled. When they arrived at the house in which the crime had been committed, they found a small crowd of people, ranging from feeble old women to babies in arms, and including a large proportion of boys and girls of school age, collected outside the gates, staring intently through the bars towards the house, which was almost hidden by trees. The morbid crowd made way for the two officers, and speculated on their mission. 
the general impression was that they were the representatives of a fashionable firm of undertakers and had come to measure the victim for his coffin inside the grounds the scotland yard officers encountered a police constable who was on guard for the purpose of preventing inquisitive strangers penetrating to the house well flack said inspector chippenfield in a tone in which geniality was slightly blended with official superiority how are you to-day i'm very well in indeed sir replied the police constable he knew that the state of his health was not a matter of deep concern to the inspector but such is the vanity of human nature that he was pleased at the inquiry the fact that there was a murdered man in the house gave mournful emphasis to the transience of human life and made police constable flack feel a glow of satisfaction in being very well indeed inspector chippenfield hesitated a moment as if in deep thought the object of his hesitation was to give flack an opportunity of imparting any information that had come to him while on guard the inspector believed in encouraging people to impart information, but regarded it as subversive of the respect due to him to appear to be in need of any. As Flack made no attempt to carry the conversation beyond the state of his health, Inspector Chippenfield came to the conclusion that he was an extremely dull policeman. He introduced Flack to Detective Rolfe and explained to the latter. Flack was on duty on the night of the murder, but heard no shots. Probably he was a mile or so away. But in a way he discovered the crime. Didn't you, Flack? When we rang up Seldon, he came up here and brought Flack with him. He'll be only too glad to tell you anything you want to know. Rolf took an official notebook from a breast pocket and proceeded to question the police constable. The inspector made his way upstairs to the room in which the criminal had been committed, for it was his system to seek inspiration in the scene of a crime. Tanton Gardens, a short private street terminating in a cul-de-sac, was in a remote part of Hampstead. The daylight appearance of the street betokened wealth and exclusiveness. The roadway which ran between its broad white gravelled footwalks was smoothly asphalted for motor tires. The avenues of great chestnut trees which flanked the footpaths served the dual purpose of affording shade in summer and screening the houses of Tanton Gardens from view. But after nightfall, Tanton Gardens was a lonely and gloomy place, lighted only by one lamp, which stood in the high road more to mark the entrance to the street than as a guide to traffic along it, for its rays barely penetrated beyond the first pair of chestnut trees. The houses in Tanton Gardens were in keeping with the street. They indicated wealth and comfort. They were of a solid exterior, of a size that suggested a fine roominess, and each house stood in its own grounds. Riversbrook was the last house at the blind end of the street, and its east windows looked out on a wood which sloped down to a valley, the street having originally been an incursion into a large private estate, of which the wood alone remained. On the other side, a tangled nutwood coppice separated the judge's residence from its nearest neighbors, so the house was completely isolated. It stood well back in about four acres of ground, and only a glimpse of it could be seen from the street front because of a small plantation of ornamental trees, which grew in front of the house and hid it almost completely from view. When the carriage drive which wound through the plantation had been passed the house burst abruptly into view a big rambling building of uncompromising ugliness its architecture was remarkable the impression which it conveyed was that the original builder had been prevented by lack of money from carrying out his original intention of erecting a fine symmetrical house 
The first story was well enough, an imposing massive colonnaded front in the Greek style, with marble pillars supporting the entrance. But the two stories surmounting this fade lamentably to carry on the pretentious design. Viewed from the front, they looked as though the builder, after erecting the first story, had found himself in pecuniary straits, but, determined to finish his house somehow, had built two smaller stories on the solid edifice of the first. For the two second stories were not flush with the front of the house, but reared themselves from several feet behind, so that the occupants of the bedrooms on the first story could have used the intervening space as a balcony. Viewed from the rear, the architectural imperfections of the upper part of the house were in even stronger contrast with the ornamental first story. Apparently the impecunious builder, by the time he had reached the rear, had completely run out of funds, for on the third floor he had failed altogether to build in one small room and had left the unfinished brickwork unplastered. The large open space between the house and the fir plantation had once been laid out as an Italian garden at the cost of much time and money, but Sir Horace Fewbanks had lacked the taste or money to keep it up, and had allowed it to become a luxuriant wilderness, though the sloping parterres of the centre flower-beds still retained traces of their former beauty. The small lake in the centre, spanned by a rustic handbridge, was still inhabited by a few specimens of the carp family, sole survivors of the numerous goldfish with which the original designer of the garden had stocked the lake. Sir Horace Fewbanks had rented Riversbrook as a townhouse for some years before his death. Having acquired the lease cheaply from the previous possessor, a retired Indian civil servant, who had taken a dislike to the place because his wife had gone insane within its walls. Sir Horace had lived much in the house alone, though each London season his daughter spent a few weeks with him in order to preside over a few society functions that her father felt it due to his position to give and which generally took the form of solemn dinners, to which he invited some of his brother judges, a few eminent barristers, a few political friends, and their wives. But rumour had whispered that the judge and his daughter had not got on too well together, that Miss Fewbanks was a strange girl who did not care for society, or the society functions which most girls of her age would have delighted in but preferred to spend her time on her father's country estate, taking an interest in the villagers, or walking the countryside with half a dozen dogs at her heels. Rumour had not spared the dead judge's name. It was said of him that he was fond of lady society, and especially of ladies belonging to a type which he could not ask his daughter to meet, that he used to go out motoring, driving himself after other people were in bed, and that strange scenes had taken place at Riversbrook. Flack had told his wife on several occasions that he had heard sounds of wild laughter and rowdy singing coming from Riversbrook as he passed along the street on his beat in the small hours of the morning. Several times in the early dawn, Flack had seen two or three ladies in evening dress come down the carriage drive and enter a taxicab, which had been summoned by telephone. End of chapter 3 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter Four of the Hampstead Mystery. Reading by Lars Rolander. When Rolf had finished questioning Police Constable Flack and joined his chief upstairs, the latter, who had been going through the private papers in the murder man's desk in the hope of alighting on a clue to the crime, received him genially. Well, he said. What do you think of Flack? 
Rolfe had obtained from the police constable a straightforward story of what he had seen, and in this way had picked up some useful information about the crime which it would have taken a long time to extract from the inspector. But he was a sufficiently good detective to have learnt that by disparaging the source of your information you add to your own reputation for acumen in drawing conclusions in regard to it. He nodded his head in a depreciating way and emitted a slight cough, which was meant to express contempt. "'It looks very much like a case of burglary and murder,' he said. He was anxious to know what theory his superior officer had formed. "'And how do you fit in the letter advising us of the murder?' asked the inspector. He produced the letter from his pocket-book and looked at it earnestly. "'There were two of them in it, one savage ruffian who will stick at nothing, and the other a chicken-hearted specimen. They often work in pairs like that.' "'So your theory is that one of the two shot him, and the other was so unnerved that he sent us the letter and put us on the track to save his own neck?' "'Something like that.' "'It is not impossible,' was the senior officer's comment. "'Mind you, I don't say it is my theory. "'In fact, I am in no hurry to form one. "'I believe in going carefully over the whole ground first, "'collecting all the clues, and then selecting the right one.' Rolf admitted that his chief's way of setting to work to solve a mystery was an ideal one, but he made the reservation that it was a difficult one to put into operation. He was convinced that the only way of finding the right clue was to follow up every one until it was proved to be a wrong one. Inspector Chippenfield continued his study of the mysterious message which had been sent to Scotland Yard. It was written on a sheet of paper which had been taken from a writing pad of the kind sold for a few pence by all stationers. It was flimsy and blue-lined, and the message it contained was smudged and badly printed. But to the inspector's annoyance there were no fingerprints on the paper. The fingerprint expert at Scotland Yard had examined it under the microscope, but his search for fingerprints had been vain. "'Depend upon it. We'll hear from this chap again,' said the inspector, tapping the sheet of paper with a finger. I think I may go so far as to say that this fellow thinks suspicion will be directed to him, and he wants to save his neck. It's a disguised hand, said Rolf. Of course he printed it in order not to give us a specimen of his handwriting. Uh, there are telltale things about a man's handwriting which give him away even when he tries to disguise it, but he tries to disguise even his printing. Look how irregular the letters are, some slanting to the right, and some to the left, and some are upright. Look at the two different kinds of U's. He's used two different kinds of pens, said Inspector Chippenfield. Look at the difference in the thickness of the letters. The sooner he writes again, the better, said Rolf. I'm curious to know what he'll say next. "'My idea is to find out who he is and make him speak,' said the inspector. "'Speaking is quicker than writing. I could frighten more out of him in ten minutes than he would give away voluntarily in a month of Sundays.' Again Rolf had to admit that his chief's plan to get the truth was an ideal one. "'Have you any idea who he is?' he asked. Inspector Chippenfield had brought his methods too near to perfection to make it possible for him to fall into an open trap. "'I won't be very long putting my hands on him,' he said. "'But uh, this thing has been in the papers,' said Rolf. "'Don't you think the murderer will bolt out of the country when he knows his mate is prepared to turn King's evidence against him?' "'Ah,' said Inspector Chippenfield, "'I haven't adopted your theory.' 
Then you think that the man who wrote this note knew of the murder but doesn't know who did it? Now you are going too far, said Inspector Chippenfield. The inspector was so wary about disclosing what was in his mind in regard to the letter that Rolf, who disliked his chief very cordially, jumped to the conclusion that Inspector Chippenfield had no intelligible ideas concerning it. If it was burglars, they took nothing as far as we can ascertain up to the present, said Inspector Chippenfield after a pause. They were surprised to find anyone in the house, and after the shot was fired they immediately bolted for fear the noise would attract attention. What knocks a hole in the burglar theory is the fact that Sir Horace was fully dressed when he was shot, said the inspector. Burglars don't break into a house when there are lights about, especially after having been led to believe that the house was empty. So you think, said Rolf, that the window was forced after the murder, with the object of misleading us? I haven't said so, replied the inspector. All I'm prepared to say is that even that was not impossible. It was forced from the outside, continued Rolf. I've seen the marks of a jemmy on the window sill. If it was forced after the murder, the murderer was a cool hand. You can take it from me, exclaimed Inspector Chippenfield with unexpected candor, that he was a cool hand. We are going to have a bit of trouble in getting to the bottom of this, Rolf. If anyone can get to the bottom of it, you can, said Rolf, who believed with Voltaire that speech was given us in order to enable us to conceal our thoughts. Inspector Chippenfield was so astonished at this handsome compliment that he began to think that he had underrated Rolf's powers of discernment. His tone of cold official superiority immediately thought. There were two shots fired, he said, but whether both were fired by the murderer I don't know yet. One of them may have been fired by Sir Horace. Just behind you in the wall is the mark of one of the bullets. I dug it out of the plaster yesterday, and here it is. He produced from a waistcoat pocket a flattened bullet. The other is inside him at present. He waved his hand in the direction of the room in which the corpse lay. Of course you cannot say whether bo both bullets are out of the same revolver, said Rolf. Can't tell till after the post-mortem, said the inspector. And then all we can tell for certain is whether they are of the same pattern. They might be the same size, and yet fired out of different revolvers of the same caliber. Well, it's no use theorizing about what happened in this room until after the post-mortem, said Rolf. You'd better give it some thought, suggested the inspector. In the meantime, I want you to interview the people in the neighborhood and ascertain whether they heard any shots. They'll all say they did, whether they heard them or not. You know how people persuade themselves into imagining things so as to get some sort of prominence in these crimes. But you can sift what they tell you and preserve the grain of truth. Try and get them to be accurate as to the time, as we want to fix the time of the crime as near as possible. Ask Flack to tell you something about the neighbors. He's been in this district fifteen years, and ought to know all about them. While you're away, I'll go through these private papers. I want to find out why he came back from Scotland so suddenly. If we knew that, the rest might be easy. I haven't seen the body yet, said Rolf. I'd like to look at it. Where is it? I had it removed downstairs. You will find it in a big room on the left as you go down the hall. By the by, there is another matter, Rolf. This glove was found in the room. It may be a clue, but it is more likely that it is one of Sir Horace's gloves and that he lost the other one on his way up from Scotland. It's a left-hand glove. 
Men always lose the right-hand glove because they take it off so often. I've compared it with other gloves in Sir Horace's wardrobe, and I find it is the same scythe and much the same quality. But find out from Sir Horace's hoyser if he sold it. Here's the address of the hoysers, Bruden and Marshall, in the Strand. Rolf went slowly downstairs into the room in which the corpse lay, and closed the door behind him. It was a very large room, overlooking the garden on the right side of the house. Somebody had lowered the Venetian blinds as a conventional intimation to the outside world that the house was one of mourning, and the room was almost dark. For nearly a minute Rolf stood in silence, his hand resting on the knob of the door he had closed behind him. Gradually the outline of the room and the objects within it began to reveal themselves in shadowy shape as his eyes became accustomed to the dim light. He had a growing impression of a big lofty room with heavy furniture and a huddle-up figure lying on a couch at the end furthest from the window and deepest in shadow. He stepped across to the window and gently raised one of the blinds. The light of an August sun penetrated through the screen of trees in front of the house and revealed the interior of the room more clearly. Rolf was amazed at its size. From the window to the couch at the other end of the room, where the body lay, was nearly thirty feet. Glancing down the apartment, he noticed that it was really two rooms, divided in the middle by folding doors. These doors folded neatly into a slightly protruding ridge of or arch, almost opposite the door by which he had entered, and was screened from observation by heavy damask curtains, which drooped over the archway slightly into the room. Evidently the deceased judge had been in the habit of using the divided rooms as a single apartment, for the heavier furniture in both halves of it was of the same pattern. The chairs and tables were of heavy, ponderous mid-Victorian make, and they were matched by a number of old-fashioned mahogany sideboards and presses, arranged methodically at regular intervals on both sides of the room. Rolf, as his eye took in these articles, wondered why Sir Horace Fewbanks had bought so many. One sideboard, a vast piece of furniture fully eight feet long, had a whisky decanter and siphon of soda water on it, as though Sir Horace had served himself with the refreshments on his return to the house. The tops of the other sideboards were bare, and the presses used in such a room Rolf was at a loss to conjecture, were locked up. The antique sombre uniformity of the furniture as a whole was broken at odd intervals by several articles of bizarre modernity including a few daring French prints, which struck an odd note of incongruity in such a room. The murdered man had been laid on an old-fashioned sofa at the end of this double apartment, which was furthest from the window. Rolf walked slowly over the thick turkey carpets and rugs with which the floor was covered, glanced at the sofa curiously, and then turned down the sheet from the dead man's face. At the time of his death, Sir Horace Fewbanks was fifty-eight years of age, but since death the grey bristles had grown so rapidly through his clean-shaven face that he looked much older. The face showed none of the wanted placidity of death. The mouth was twisted in an ugly fashion, as though the murdered man had endeavoured to cry for help and had been attacked and killed while doing so. One of Sir Horace's arms, the right one, was thrust forward diagonally across his breast, as if in self-defence, and the hand was tightly clenched. Rolf, who had last seen his honour presiding on the bench, in the full pomp and majesty of law, felt a chill strike his heart 
and the fell power of death which did not even respect the person of a high court judge and had stripped him of every vestige of human dignity in the pangs of a violent end the face he had last seen on the bench full of wisdom and austerity of the law was now distorted into a livid mask in which it was hard to trace any semblance of the features of the dead judge Rolf's official alertness of mind in the face of a mysterious crime soon reasserted itself, however, and he shook off the feeling of sentiment and proceeded to make a closer examination of the dead body. As he turned down the sheet to examine the wound which had ended the judge's life, it slipped from his hand and fell on the floor, revealing that the judge had been laid on the couch just as he had been killed, fully clothed. He had been shot through the body near the heart, and a large patch of blood had welled from the wound and congealed in his shirt. One trouser leg was ruffled up and had caught in the top of the boot. The corpse presented a repellent spectacle, but Rolf, who had seen unpleasant sights of various kinds in his career, bent over the body with keen interest, noting these details with all his professional instinct aroused. For though Rolf had not yet risen very high in the police force, he had many of the qualities which make the good detective, observation, sagacity, and some imagination. The extraordinary crime which he had been called upon to help unravel presented a baffling mystery which was likely to test the value of these qualities to the utmost. Rolf looked steadily at the corpse for some time impressing a picture of it in every detail on his mental retina. Struck by an idea, he bent over and touched the patch of blood in the dead man's breast, then looked at his finger. There was no stain. The blood was quite congealed. Then he tried to unclench the judge's right hand, but it was rigid. As Rolf stood there gazing intently at the corpse, and trying to form some theory of the reason for the murder, certain old stories he had heard of Sir Horace Fewbank's private life and character recurred to him. These rumours had not been much. A jocular hint or two among his fellows at Scotland Yard that his honour had a weakness for a pretty face, and in private life led a less decorous existence than a judge ought to do. Rolf wondered how much or how little truth was contained in these stories. He glanced around the vast room. Certainly it was not the sort of apartment in which a high court judge might be expected to do his entertaining. But Rolf recalled that he had heard gossip to the effect that Sir Horace, because of his virtual estrangement from his daughter, did very little entertaining beyond an occasional bridge or supper party to his sporting friends and rarely went into society. Rolf began to scrutinize the articles of furniture in the room, wondering if there was anything about them which might reveal something of the habits of the dead man. He produced a small electric torch from his pocket, and with his light to guide him in the half-darkened room, he closely inspected each piece of furniture. Then, with the torch in his hand, he returned to the sofa and flashed it over the dead body. He started violently when the light, falling on the dead man's closed hand, revealed a tiny scrap of white. Eagerly he endeavoured to release the fragment from the tenacious clutch of the dead, without tearing it, and eventually he managed to detach it. His heart bounded when he saw that it was a small torn piece of a lace and muslin. He placed it in the palm of his left hand and examined it closely under the light of his torch. To him it looked to be part of a fashionable lady's dainty handkerchief. He was elated at his discovery, and he wondered how Inspector Chippenfield had overlooked it. Then the explanation struck him. The small piece of lace and muslin had been effectually hidden in the dead man's clenched hand, and his efforts to open the hand had loosened it. "'Well, Rolf,' 
said Inspector Chippenfield when his subordinate reappeared. You've been long enough to have unearthed the criminal or revived the corpse. Have you discovered anything fresh? Only this, replied Rolfe, displaying the piece of handkerchief. The find startled Inspector Chippenfield out of his air of bantering superiority. Where, where did you get that? he stammered as he reached out eagerly for it. The dead man had it clenched in his right hand. I wondered if he had anything hidden in his hand when I saw it so tightly clenched. I tried to force open the fingers, and that fell out. Inspector Chippenfield was by no means pleased at his subordinate's discovery of what promised to be an important clue, especially after the clue had been missed by himself. But he congratulated Rolf in a tone of fictitious heartiness. "'Well done, Rolf,' he exclaimed. "'You are coming on. Anyone can see you've the makings of a good detective.' Rolf could afford the, to ignore the sting contained in such faint praise. "'What do you make of it?' he asked. Um, "'Looks as though there is a woman in it,' said the inspector, who was still examining the scrap of lace and muslin. "'There can't be much doubt about that,' replied Rolf. "'We mustn't be in a hurry in jumping to conclusions,' remarked the inspector. "'No.' "'And we mustn't ignore obvious facts,' said Rolf. "'You think a woman murdered him?' asked the inspector. "'I think a woman was present when he was shot. "'Whether she fired the shot, there is nothing to show at present. "'There may have been a man with her. "'But there was a struggle just before the shot was fired, "'and as Sir Horace fell, he grasped at the hand in which she was holding her handkerchief. Or perhaps her handkerchief was torn in his dying struggles when she was leaning over him. You have overlooked the possibility of this having been placed in the dying man's hand to deceive us, said the inspector. If the intention was to mislead us, it wouldn't have been placed where it might have been overlooked. As the inspector had overlooked the presence of the scrap of handkerchief in the dead man's hand, he felt that he was not making much progress with the work of keeping his subordinate in his place. "'Well, it is a clue of a sort,' he said. "'The trouble is that we have too many clues. I wish we knew which is the right one. Anyway—' "'It knocks over your theory of a burglary,' he added in a tone of satisfaction. "'Yes,' Rolf admitted. "'That goes by the board.'" End of Chapter 4 of The Hampstead Mystery By John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 5 of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Chapter 5. What is your name? James Hill, sir. That is an alias. What is your real name? Inspector Chippenfield glared fiercely at the butler in order to impress upon him the fact that subterfuge was useless. Henry Field, sir, replied the man after some hesitation. Inspector Chippenfield opened the capacious pocket-book which he had placed before him on the desk when the butler had entered in response to his summons, and he took from it a photograph which he handed to the man he was interrogating. "'Is uh, that your photograph?' he asked. Police photographs taken in jail for purposes of future identification are always far from flattering.' 
and Henry Field, after looking at the photograph handed to him, hesitated a little before replying. Yes, sir. So, Henry Field, in November 1909, you were sentenced to three years for robbing your master, Lord Melhurst. Yes, sir. Let me see, said the inspector, as if calling on his memory to perform a reluctant task. It was a diamond scarf pin and a gold watch. Lord Melhurst had come home after a good day at Epsom and a late supper in town. Next morning he missed his scarf pin and his watch. He thought he had been robbed at Epsom or in town. He was delightfully vague about what had happened to him after his glorious day at Epsom. But unfortunately for you, the taxicab driver who drove him remembered seeing the pin on him when he got out of the cab. As you had waited up for him, suspicion fell on you, and you were arrested and confessed. I think those are the facts, Field. Yes, sir said the distressed-looking man who stood before him. "'I think I had the pleasure of putting you through,' added the inspector. The butler understood that in police slang, putting a man through meant arresting him and putting him through the criminal court into jail. He made the same reply. "'Yes, sir.' "'I'm glad to see you bear me no ill-will for it,' said Inspector Chippenfield. "'You don't, do you?' No, sir. I never forget a face, pursued the officer, glancing up at the face of the man before him. When I saw you yesterday, I knew you again in a moment, and when I went back to the yard, I looked up your record. The butler was doubtful whether any reply was called for, but after a pause, as an endorsement of the inspector's gift for remembering faces, he ventured on. Yes, sir. And how did you, an ex-convict, come to get into the service of one of His Majesty's judges? He took me in, replied the butler. You mean that you took him in, replied the inspector with a pleasant laugh at his own witticism. No, sir, I didn't take him in, declared the butler. He had not joined in the laugh at the inspector's joke. "'Get away with you,' said the inspector Chippenfield. "'You don't expect me to believe that you told him you were an ex-convict? "'You must have used forged references.' "'No, sir. "'He knew I was a—' "'Hill hesitated at referring to himself as an ex-convict, "'though he had not shrunk from the description by Inspector Chippenfield. "'He knew that I had been in trouble— in fact, sir, if you remember, I was tried before him. The devil you are, exclaimed Inspector Chippenfield in astonishment. And he took you into his service after you had served your sentence? He must have been mad. How did you manage it? After I came out, I found it hard to get a place, said Hill. And when Sir Horace's butler died... I wrote to him and asked if he would give me a chance. I had a wife and child, sir, and they had a hard struggle while I was in prison. My wife had a shop, but she sold it to find money for my defense. Sir Horace told me to call on him, and after thinking it over he decided to engage me. He was a good master to me. And how did you repay him? exclaimed Inspector Chippenfield sternly. By murdering him? The butler was startled by the suddenness of the accusation, as Inspector Chippenfield intended he should be. Me? he exclaimed. As sure as there is a God in heaven, I have nothing to do with it. That won't go down with me, Field, said the police officer, giving the wretched man another prolonged, penetrating look. "'It's true, it's true,' he protested wildly. "'I had nothing to do with it. "'I couldn't do a thing like that, sir. "'I couldn't kill a man if I wanted to. "'I haven't the nerve. "'But I knew I would be suspected,' he added in a tone of self-pity. 
"'Oh, you did,' replied Inspector Chippenfield. "'And why was that?' because of my past where were you on the date of the murder in the morning i came over here to look round as usual and i found everything all right you did that every day while sir horace was away not every day sir three times a week mondays wednesdays and fridays did you enter the house or just look round i always came inside what for to make quite sure that everything was all right. And was everything all right the morning of the 18th? Yes, sir. You are quite sure of that. You looked round carefully. Well, sir, I just gave a glance round, for of course I didn't expect anything would be wrong. Inspector Chippenfield fixed a steady glance on the butler to ascertain if he was conscious of the trap he had avoided. Did you look in this room? Yes, sir. I made a point of looking in all the rooms. You are sure that Sir Horace's dead body was not lying here? Inspector Chippenfield pointed beside the desk where the body had been found. Oh, no, sir. I'd have seen it if it had. There was no sign anywhere of his having returned from Scotland. No, sir. You didn't know he was returning? No, sir. What time did you leave the house? It would be about a quarter past twelve, sir. And what did you do after that? I went home and had my dinner. In the afternoon I took my little girl to the zoo. I'd promised her for a long time that I would take her to the zoo. And what did you do after visiting the zoo? We went home for supper. After supper my wife took the little girl to the picture palace in Camden Road. It was quite a holiday, sir, for her. And what did you do while your wife and child were at the pictures? I stayed at home and minded the shop. When they came home we all went to bed. My wife will tell you the same thing. I've no doubt she will, said the inspector dryly. Well, if you didn't murder Sir Horace yourself, when did you first hear that he had been murdered? I saw it in the papers yesterday evening. And you immediately came up here to see if it was true? Yes, sir. And uh, you were taken to the Hampstead Police Station to make a statement as to your movements on the day and night of the murder? Yes, sir. And the story you have just told me about Sue and the pictures and the rest is virtually the same as the statement you made at the station? Yes, sir. Do you know if Sir Horace kept a revolver? I think he did, sir. Where did he keep it? In the second drawer of his desk, sir. Well, it's gone, remarked Inspector Chippenfield without opening the drawer. What sort of a revolver was it? Did you ever see it? How do you know he kept one? Once or twice I saw something that looked like a revolver in that drawer while Sir Horace had it open. It was a small nickel revolver. Sir Horace always locked his desk? Yes, sir. None of your keys will open it, of course? No, sir. That is, I don't know, sir. I've never tried. Inspector Chippenfield grunted slightly. That trap the butler had not seen until too late. But, of course, all servants went through their master's private papers when they got the chance. Do you know if Sir Horace was in the habit of carrying a pocket-book? he asked. Yes, sir, he was. What sort of a pocket-book? A large Russian leather one with a gold clasp. Did he take it away with him when he went to Scotland? Did you see it about the house after he left? No, sir. I think he took it with him. It would not be like him to forget it or to leave it lying about. And what sort of a man was Sir Horace Field? A very good master, sir. He could be very stern when he was angry, but I got on very well with him. Quite so. 
Do you know if he had a weakness for the ladies? Well, sir, I've heard people say he had. I want your own opinion. I don't want what other people said. You were with him for three years, and kept a pretty close watch on him, I've no doubt. Speaking confidentially, I might say that I think he was, said Hill. He glanced apprehensively behind him, as if afraid of the dead man appearing at the door to rebuke him for presuming to speak ill of him. "'I thought as much,' said the inspector. "'Have you any idea why he came down from Scotland?' "'No, sir.' "'Well, that will do for the present field. If I want you again, I'll send for you.' "'Thank you, sir.' "'May I ask a question, sir?' "'What is it?' "'You don't really think I had anything to do with it, sir?' "'I'm not here, Field, to tell you what I think. "'This much I will say. "'If I find you have tried to deceive me in any way, "'it will be a bad day for you.' "'Yes, sir.' "'Grave, taciturn, watchful, secret and suave, with an appearance of tight-lipped reticence about him, which a perpetual faint questioning look in his eyes denied, he looked an ideal man-servant, who knew his station in life, and was able to uphold it with meek dignity. From the top of his trimly cut grey crown to his neatly shod silent feet, he exuded deference and respectability. His impassive mask of a face was incapable, apart from the faint query note in the eyes, of betraying any of the feelings or emotions which ruffled the countenances of common humanity. On the way downstairs, Hill saw Police Constable Flack in conversation with a lady at the front door. The lady was well known to the butler as Mrs. Holymead, the wife of a distinguished barrister who had been one of his master's closest friends. She seemed glad to see the butler, for she greeted him with a remark that seemed to imply a kinship in sorrow. "'Isn't this a dreadful thing, Hill?' she said. "'It's terrible, madam,' replied Hill respectfully. Mrs. Holymead was extremely beautiful, but it was obvious that she was distressed at the tragedy, for her eyes were full of tears, and her olive-tinted face was pale. She was about thirty years of age, tall, slim, and graceful. Her beauty was of the Spanish type, straight-browed, lustrous-eyed, and vivid, a clear olive skin and full, petulant, crimson lips. She was fashionably dressed in black, with a black hat. "'The policeman tells me that Miss Fewbanks has not come up from Delmer yet,' she continued. "'No, madam. We expect her to-morrow. I believe Miss Fewbanks has been too prostrated to come.' "'Dreadful, dreadful,' murmured Mrs. Holymead. "'I feel I want to know all about it, and yet I am afraid. It's all too terrible for words.' "'It has been a terrible shock, madam,' said Hill. "'Has the housekeeper come up, Hill?' "'No, madam. She will be up to-morrow with Miss Fewbanks.' "'Well, is there nobody I can see?' asked Mrs. Holymead. Police Constable Flack was impressed by the spectacle of a beautiful, fashionably dressed lady in distress. "'The inspector in charge of the case is upstairs, madam.' he suggested. Perhaps you'd like to see him. It suddenly occurred to him that he had instructions not to allow any stranger into the house, and police instructions at such a time were of a nature which classed a friend of the family as a stranger. Uh, perhaps I'd better ask him first, he added, and he went upstairs with a feeling that he had laid himself open to severe official censure from Inspector Chippenfield. He came downstairs with a smile on his face and the message that the inspector would be pleased to see Mrs. Holymead. In his brief interview 
with his superior he had contrived to convey the unofficial information that mrs holymead was a fine-looking woman and he had no doubt that inspector chippenfield's readiness to see her was due to the impression this information had made on his unofficial feelings mrs holymead was conducted upstairs and announced by the butler Inspector Chippenfield greeted her with a low bow of conscious inferiority, and anticipated Hill in placing a chair for her. His large red face went a deeper scarlet in colour as he looked at her. "'Flack tells me that you are a friend of the family, Mrs. Holymead. What is it that I can do for you? I need scarcely say, Mrs. Holymead, that your distinguished husband is well known to us all.' I have had the pleasure of being cross-examined by him on several occasions. Anything you wish to know, I'll be pleased to tell you, if it lies within my power. Thank you, said Mrs. Holymead. She seemed to be slightly nervous in the presence of a member of the Scotland Yard police, in spite of his obvious humility in the company of a fashionable lady, who belonged to a different social world from that in which police inspectors moved. It took Inspector Chippenfield some minutes to discover that the object of Mrs. Holymead's visit was to learn some of the details of the tragedy. As one who had known the murdered man for several years, and the wife of his intimate friend, she was overwhelmed by the awful tragedy. She endeavoured to explain that the crime was like a horrible dream which she could not get rid of. But, in spite of the repugnance with which she contemplated the fact that a gentleman she had known so well had been shot down in his own house, she felt a natural curiosity to know how the dreadful crime had been committed. Inspector Chippenfield availed himself of the opportunity to do the honours of the occasion. He went over the details of the tragedy and pointed out where the body had been found. He showed her the bullet mark on the wall and the flattened bullet which had been extracted. Although from the mere habit of official caution he gave away no information which was not of a superficial and obvious kind, it was apparent he liked talking about the crime and his responsibilities as the officer who had been placed in charge of the investigations. He noted the interest with which Mrs. Holomead followed his words and he was satisfied that he had created a favourable impression on her. It was his desire to do the honours thoroughly, which led him to remark after he had given her the main facts of the tragedy. I am sorry I cannot take you to view the body. It is downstairs, but the fact is the home office doctors are in there making the post-mortem to extract the bullet. Mrs. Holymead shuddered at this information. The fact that such gruesome work as a post-mortem examination was proceeding on the body of a man whom she had known so well brought on a fit of nausea. Her head fell back as if she was about to faint. "'Can I have a glass of water?' she whispered. A fainting woman, if she is beautiful and fashionably dressed, will unnerve even a resourceful police official. Had she been one of the servants, Inspector Chippenfield would have rung the bell for a glass of water to throw over her face, and meantime would have looked on calmly at such evidence of the weakness of sex. But in this case he dashed out of the room, ran downstairs, shouted for Hill, ordered him to find a glass, snatched the glass from him, filled it with water, and dashed upstairs again. His absence from the room totaled a little less than three minutes, and when he held the glass to the lady's lips, he was out of breath with his exertions. Mrs. Holymead took a sip of water, shuddered, took another sip, then heaved a sigh, and opened to the full extent her large dark eyes on the man bending over her, who felt amply repaid by such a glance. She thanked him prettily for his great kindness, and took her departure, being conducted downstairs and to her waiting motor-car at the gate by Inspector Chippenfield. That officer went back to the house with a pleased smile on his features. But he would not have been so pleased with himself 
if he had known that his brief absence from the room of the tragedy for the purpose of obtaining a glass of water had been more than sufficient to enable the lady to run to the open desk of the murdered man touch a spring which opened a secret receptacle at the back of it extract a small bundle of papers close the spring and return to her chair to await in a fainting attitude the return of the chivalrous police officer mrs holymead's return to her home in princess gate was awaited with feverish anxiety by one of the inmates this was mademoiselle gabrielle chiron a french girl of about twenty-eight who was a distant connection of mrs holymead's by marriage a cousin of mrs holymead's had married lucille chiron the younger sister of gabrielle two years ago mrs holymead on visiting the french provincial town where the marriage was celebrated was attracted by gabrielle as the chiron family were not wealthy they welcomed the friendship between gabrielle and the beautiful american who had married one of the leading barristers in london and finally gabrielle went to live with mrs holymead as a companion from the window of an upstairs room which commanded a view of the street gabrielle chiron waited impatiently for the return of the motor-car in which mrs holymead had driven to riversbrook when at length it turned the corner and came into view she rushed downstairs to meet mrs holymead she opened the street door before the lady of the house could ring her gaze was fixed on the handbag which mrs holymead carried a comparatively big handbag which the lady had taken the precaution to purchase before driving out to riversbrook the french girl's face lighted up with a smile as she saw by the shape of the bag that it was not empty have you got them she whispered yes was the reply i followed out your plan it worked without a hitch ah i knew you would manage it said the girl i would have gone but it was best that you should go these police agents do not like foreigners they would be suspicious if i had gone there was a big red-faced man in charge inspector chippenfield they called him said mrs holymead he was in the library as you said he would be he was sitting there calmly as if he did not know what nerves were he knew me as a friend of the family and was quite nice to me i saw as soon as i went in that the desk was opened he had been examining sir horace's private papers i asked him to tell me about the about the tragedy he piled horror on horror and then i pretended to faint he ran downstairs for a glass of water and that gave me time to open the secret drawer they are here she added patting the handbag affectionately let us go upstairs and burn them. End of chapter 5 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Read by Lars Rolander. Chapter Six of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Chapter Six. There was unpleasant news for Inspector Chippenfield when Miss Fewbanks arrived at Riversbrook, accompanied by the housekeeper, Mrs. Hewson. In the first place, he learned with considerable astonishment that it was Miss Fewbanks' intention to stay in the house until after the funeral, and for that purpose she had brought the housekeeper to keep her company in the lonely old place. Although they had taken up their quarters in the opposite wing of the rambling mansion to that in which the dead body lay, 
it seemed to inspector chippenfield whose mind was very impressionable where the fair sex was concerned that miss fewbanks must be a very peculiar girl to contemplate staying in the same house with the body of her murdered father for nearly a week he was convinced that she must be a strong-minded young woman and he did not like strong-minded young women he preferred the weak and clinging type of the sex as more of a compliment to his own sturdy manliness his unfavourable impression of his fewbanks was deepened when he saw her and heard what she had to tell him the girl had come up from the country filled with horror at the crime which had deprived her of her father and firmly determined to leave no stone unturned to bring the murderer to justice it was true that she and her father had lived on terms of partial estrangement for some time past because of his manner of life but all the girl's feelings of resentment against him had been swept away by the news of his dreadful death and all she remembered now was that he was her father and had been brutally murdered when she sent for inspector chippenfield she had visited the room in which lay the body of her father it had been placed in a coffin which was resting on the undertaker's trestles in the bay embrasure of the big room with the folding doors there was nothing in the appearance of the corpse to suggest that a crime had been committed but it had been impossible for the undertaker's men to erase entirely the distortion of the features so that they might suggest the cold calm dignity of a peaceful death the ordeal of looking on the dead body of her father had nerved her to carry through resolutely the task of discovering the author of the crime she awaited the coming of the inspector in a small sitting-room and when he entered she pointed quickly to a chair but remained standing herself in appearance miss fewbanks was a charming girl of the typical english type she was of medium height slight but well built with fair hair and dark blue eyes an imperious short upper lip and a determined chin and the clear healthy complexion of a girl who has lived much out of doors the inspector noted all these details noted too that although her breast heaved with agitation she had herself well under control her pretty head was erect and one of her small hands was tightly clenched by her side. "'Have you found out anything?' she asked the inspector as he entered. The girl had chosen a vague word, because she felt that there were many things which must come to light in unravelling the crime. But from the police point of view of Inspector Chippenfield, the question whether he had found out anything was a stinging reflection on his ability." I consider it inadvisable to make any arrest at the present stage of my investigations, he said with cold official dignity. Do you think you know who did it? asked the girl. It is my business to find out, replied the inspector, in a voice that indicated confidence in his ability to perform the task. The girl was too unsophisticated to follow the subtle workings of official pride. The papers call it a mysterious crime. Do you think it is mysterious? There are certainly some mysterious features about it, said the inspector, but I do not regard them as insoluble. Nothing is insoluble, he added in a sententious tone. If there are mysteries to be solved, you ought to have help, said the young lady. She glanced at Mrs. Hewson significantly and then proceeded to explain to Inspector Chippenfield what she meant. "'I have asked Mr. Crewe, the celebrated detective, to assist you. "'Of course you know, Mr. Crewe, everybody does. "'I know you are a very clever man at your profession, "'but in a thing of this kind two clever men are better than one. "'I hope you will not mind. "'There is no reflection whatever on your ability.' In fact, I have the utmost confidence in you, but 
it is due to my father's memory to do all that is possible to get to the bottom of this dreadful crime if money is needed it will be forthcoming that applies to you no less than to mr crewe but i hope you will be able to carry out your investigations amicably together and that you will be willing to assist one another you will lose nothing by doing so i trust you will place at mr crewe's disposal all the facilities that are available to you as an officer of the police this statement was so clear that inspector chippenfield had no choice but to face the conclusion that miss fewbanks had more faith in the abilities of a private detective to unravel the mystery than she had in the resources of scotland yard he would have liked to have told the young lady what he thought of her interfering with his work and he determined to avail himself of the right opportunity to do so if it came along but the statement that money was not to be spared had a soothing influence on his feelings of course officers of scotland yard were not allowed to take gratitudes however substantial they might be but there were material ways of expressing gratitude which were outside the regulation of the department i shall be very pleased to give mr crewe any assistance he wants said inspector chipperfield bowing stiffly it was seldom that he took a subordinate fully into his confidence but after he left miss fewbanks he flung aside his official pride in order to discuss with rolf the enlistment of the services of crewe rolf was no less indignant than his chief at the intrusion of an outsider into their sphere crewe was an exponent of the deductive school of crime investigation and had first achieved fame over the abinon case some years ago when he had succeeded in restoring the kidnapped heir of the abinon estates after the police had failed to trace the missing child in detective stories the attitude of members of scotland yard to the deductive expert is that of admiration based on conscious inferiority but in real life the experts of scotland yard have the utmost contempt for the deductive experts and their methods the disdainful pity of the deductive experts for the rule of thumb methods of the police is not to be compared with the vigorous scorn of the official detective for the rival who has not had the benefit of police training look here rolf said inspector chippenfield we mustn't let crewe get ahead of us in this affair or we'll never hear the last of it it is scandalous of a man like crewe who has money of his own and could live like a gentleman coming along and taking the bread out of our mouths by accepting fees and rewards for hunting after criminals of course i know they say he is lavish with his money and gives away more than he earns but that's all bosh he sticks it in his own pocket right enough one thing is certain he gets paid whether he wins or loses that is to say he gets his fee in any case but of course if he wins something will be added to his fee in the meantime all you and i get is our salaries and as you know the pay of an inspector isn't what it ought to be rolf assured his superior of his own conviction that the pay at scotland yard ought to be higher for all ranks especially the rank and file he also declared that he was ready to do his best to thwart crew that is the right spirit commented inspector chippenfield approvingly of course we'll tell him we're willing to help him all we can and of course he'll tell us we can depend on his help but we know what his help will amount to he'll keep back from us anything he finds out and we'll do the same for him but the point is rolf that you and i have to put all our brains into this and help one another i'm not the man to despise help from a subordinate if you have any ideas about this case rolf do not be afraid to speak out i'll give them sympathetic consideration i know you will said rolf who was by no means sure of the fact you can count on me as you know rolf there have been cases in which men from the yard haven't worked together as amicably as they ought to have done 
it used to be said when i was one of the plainclothes men that the man in charge got all the credit and the men under him did all the work but as an inspector i can tell you that is very rarely the case in my reports i believe in giving my junior credit for all he has done and generally a bit more it may be foolish of me but that is my way i never miss a chance of putting in a good word for the man under me it would be better if they were all like that said rolf well it's a bargain rolf said inspector chippenfield you do your best on this job and you won't lose by it i'll see to that but in the meantime we don't want to put crew on the scent let us see how much we'll tell him and how much we won't he'll uh, want to see the letter sent to the yard about the murder said rolf the daily recorder published a facsimile of it this morning yes i know about that well he can have it but don't say anything to him about the lace you found in the dead man's hand or at any rate not until you find out more about it the glove he can have since it's pretty obvious that it belonged to sir horace we'll spin crew a john that we are depending on it as a clue crew arrived during the afternoon to inspect the house and the room in which the crime had been committed there was every appearance of cordiality in the way in which he greeted the police officials delighted to see you inspector he said who is working this case with you rolf don't think we have met before rolf have we rolf politely murmured something about not having had the pleasure of meeting mr crewe but of always having wanted to meet him because of his fame very good of you replied crewe this is a very sad business i understand there are some attractive points of mystery in the crime i hope you haven't unravelled it yet before i have got a start you fellows are so quick slow and sure is our motto said inspector chippenfield feeling certain that a sneer and not a compliment had been intended there is nothing to be gained in arresting the wrong man that's a sound maxim for us all said crewe however let's get to business i rang up the yard this morning and they told me you were in charge of the case and that i'd probably find you here can you let me have a look at the original of that letter which was sent to scotland yard informing you of the murder there is a facsimile of it in the daily recorder this morning and from all appearances there are some interesting conclusions to be drawn from it but the original is the thing here you are said the inspector producing his pocket-book taking out the paper and handing it to crewe what do you make out of it crewe sat down and placing the paper before him took a magnifying glass from his pocket as he sat there in his grey tweed suit, his hat pushed carelessly back from his forehead, he might have been mistaken for a young man of wealth with no serious business in life, for his clothes were of a fashionable cut, and he wore them with an air of distinction. But a glance at his face would have dispelled the impression. The clear-cut, clean-shaven features riveted attention by reason of their strength and intelligence and though the dark eyes were rather too dreamy for the face the heavy lines of the lower jaw indicated the man of action and force of character the thick neck and heavily lipped firm mouth suggested tireless energy and abounding vitality at least two peoples have had a hand in it he said after studying the paper for a few minutes in the murder asked the inspector who was astonished at a deduction which harmonized with the theory which had begun to take shape in his mind in writing this said crewe with his attention still fixed on the paper but of course you know that yourself of course assented the inspector who was surprised at the information but was too experienced an official to show his feelings and both hands disguised disguised to the extent of being printed in written characters continued crewe 
It is so seldom that a person writes printed characters that any method in which they are written suggests disguise. The original intention of the two persona who wrote this extraordinary note was for each to write a single letter in turn. That system was carried as far as Sir Horace, or perhaps up to the B in few banks. After that they became weary of changing places, and one of them wrote alternate letters to the end, leaving blanks for the other to fill in. That much is to be gathered from the variations in the spaces between the letters. Sometimes there was too much room for an intermediate letter, sometimes too little, so the letter had to be cramped. Here and there are dots made with a pen, as the first of the two spelled out the words, so as to know what letters to write and what to leave blank. Look at the differences in the letter U. One of the writers makes it a firm downward and upward stroke. The other makes the letter fainter and adds another downward stroke, the letter being more like a small U written larger than a capital letter. The differences in the two hands are so pronounced throughout the note that I am inclined to think that one of the writers was a woman. Exactly what I thought, said the inspector Chippenfield, looking hard at Crewe so that the latter should not question his good faith. Then there are sometimes slight differences in the alternate letters written by the same hand. Look at the T in last and the T in night. The marked variation in the length and angle of the cross stroke. It is evident that the writers were laboring under serious excitement when they wrote this. Rolf was so interested in Crewe's revelations that he stood beside the deductive expert and studied the paper afresh. "'And now about fingerprints?' asked Crewe. "'None,' was the reply of the inspector. "'We had it under the microscope at Scotland Yard.' "'None?' exclaimed Crewe in surprise. "'Why adopt such precautions as wearing gloves to write a note giving away this startling secret?' "'Easy enough,' replied Inspector Chippenfield. "'The people who wrote the note either had little or nothing to do with the murder, but were afraid suspicion might be directed to them, or else they are the murderers and want to direct suspicion from themselves.' "'And now for the bullets,' said Crewe. "'I understand two shots were fired.' "'From two revolvers,' said the Inspector. "'Here are both bullets. This one I picked out of the wall over there. You can see where I've broken away the plaster. This one, much the bigger one of the two, was the one that killed Sir Horace. The doctor handed it to me after the post-mortem. Did Sir Horace keep a revolver? The butler says yes, but if he did it's gone. Crewe stood up and examined the hole in the wall where Inspector Chippenfield had dug out the smaller bullet. Sir Horace made a bid for his life, but missed. Of course, he had no time to take aim while there was a man on the other side of the room covering him. But in any case, those fancy firearms cannot be depended upon to shoot straight. You think Sir Horace fired at his murder fired first? asked Rolf. This small bullet suggests one of those fancy silver-mounted weapons that are made to sell to wealthy people. Sir Horace was a bit of a sportsman and knew something about game-shooting, but I take it he had no use for a revolver. I assume he kept one of those fancy weapons on hand, thinking he would never have to use it, but that it would do to frighten a burglar if the occasion did arise. And when he was held up in this room by a man with a revolver, he made a dash for his own revolver and got in the first shot, suggested Rolf, with the idea of outlining Crewe's theory of how the crime was committed. It is scarcely possible to reconstruct the crime to that extent, said Crewe with a smile, but undoubtedly Sir Horace got in the first shot. If he fired after he was hit, his bullet would have gone wild, would probably have struck the ceiling, whereas it landed there. 
Let us measure the height from the floor. He pulled a small spool out of a waistcoat pocket and drew out a tape measure. A little high for the heart of an average man, and probably a foot wide off the mark. "'And what do you make of the disappearance of Sir Horace's revolver?' asked Rolf, who seemed to his superior officer to be in danger of displaying some admiration for the deductive methods. "'I'm no good at guesswork,' replied Crewe, who felt that he had given enough information away. "'Well,' said Rolf, "'here is a glove which was found in the room. The other one is missing. It might be a clue.' Crewe took the glove and examined it carefully. It was a left-hand glove made of reindeer skin and grey in colour. It bore evidence of having been in use, but it was still a smart-looking glove, such as a man who took a pride in his appearance might wear. "'Burglars wear gloves nowadays,' said Crewe, "'but not this kind. The India-rubber glove, with only the thumb separate, is best for their work. They give freedom of action for the fingers and leave no fingerprints. Have you made inquiries whether this is one of Sir Horace's gloves? Well, it is the same size as he wore, seven and a half, said Inspector Chippenfield. The butler is the only servant here, and he can't say for certain that it belonged to his master. I've been through Sir Horace's wardrobe and through the suit case he brought from Scotland but I can find no other pair exactly similar. Rolf took it to Sir Horace's hoyser, and he is practically certain that the glove is one of a pair he sold to Sir Horace. That should be conclusive, said Crewe thoughtfully. So I think, replied the inspector. Well, I'll take it with me, if you don't mind, said Crewe. You can have it back whenever you want. Let me have the address of Sir Horace's hoyser. I'll give them a call. Take it by all means, said the inspector cordially, referring to the glove, and with a wink at Rolf he added, And when you are ready to fit it on the guilty hand, I hope you will let us know. End of chapter 6 of The Hampstead Mystery By John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander. Chapter Seven of the Hampstead Mystery. Reading by Lars Rolander. Crewe made a careful inspection of the house and the grounds. He took measurements of the impressions left on the sill of the window, which had been forced, and also the footprints immediately beneath the window. He had a long conversation with Hill, and questioned him regarding his movements on the night of the murder. He also asked about the other servants who were at Delmere, and probed for information about Sir Horace's domestic life and his friends. As he was talking to Hill, Police Constable Flack came up to them with a card in his hand. Hill looked at the card and exclaimed, "'Mr. Holymead? What does he want?' "'He asked if Miss Fewbanks was at home.' Hill took the card in to Miss Fewbanks, and on coming out went to the front door and escorted Mr. Holymead to his young mistress. Crewe, as was his habit, looked closely at Holymead. The eminent K.C. was a tall man, nearly six feet in height, with a large, resolute, strongly marked face, which, when framed in a wig, was suggestive of the dignity and severity of the law. In years he was about fifty, and in his figure there was a suggestion of that rotundity which overtakes the man who has given up physical exercise. He was correctly, if sombrely, dressed in dark clothes, and he wore a black tie probably as a symbol of mourning for his friend. His gloves were a delicate grey. Crewe sought out Hill again, and questioned him closely about the relations which had existed between Sir Horace Fewbanks and Mr. Holymead, 
whose enormous practice brought him in an income three times as large as the dead judges and kept him constantly before the public. Hill was able to supply the detective with some interesting information regarding the visitor, and in contrast to his manner when previously questioned at random by Crewe concerning his young mistress's habits seemed willing, if not actually anxious to talk. He had heard from Sir Horace's housekeeper that his late master and Mr. Holymead had been law students together, and after they were called to the bar they used to spend their holidays together as long as they were single. When they were married their wives became friends. Mrs. Holymead had died fourteen years ago, but Mrs. Fewbanks, Sir Horace had not been a baronet while his wife was alive, had lived some years longer. Mr. Holymead had married again. His second wife was a very beautiful young lady, if he might make so bold as to say so, who had come from America. The butler added, depreciatingly, that he had been told that both Sir Horace and Mr. Holymead had paid her some attention, and that she could have had either of them. She was different to English ladies, he added, she had more to say for herself, and laughed and talked with the gentlemen just as if she was one of themselves. He'll mention that she had been out to see Miss Fewbanks the previous day, but that Miss Fewbanks had not come up from Delmy then, so she had seen Inspector Chippenfield instead. While Crewe and the butler were talking, a boy of about fourteen, with the shrewd face of a London Arab, approached them with an air of mystery. He came down the hall with long, cautious strides, and halted at each step as if he were stalking a band of Indians in a forest. "'Well, Joe, what is it?' asked Crewe as he came to a halt in front of them. "'If you don't want me for half an hour, sir, I'd like to take a run up the street.' "'There is a real good picture-house just been opened.' The boy spoke eagerly with his bright eyes fixed on Crewe. "'I may want you any minute, Joe,' replied Crewe. "'Don't go away.' The boy nodded his head and turned away. As he went down the hall again to the front door, he gave an imitation of a man walking with extended arms across a plank spanning a chasm. "'Picture-mad!' commented Crewe, as he watched him. "'I didn't quite understand you, sir,' replied the butler. I "'Spends all his spare time in cinemas,' said Crewe, "'and when he is not there he is acting picture dramas. His ambition in life is to become a cinema actor.' Crewe engaged Police Constable Flack in conversation while waiting for Mr. Holymead to take his departure. Flack had so little professional pride that he was pleased at meeting a gentleman who usurped the functions of a detective without having had any police training, and who could beat the best of the Scotland Yard men like shelling peas, as he confided to his wife that night. He was especially flattered at the interest Crewe seemed to display in his long connection with the police force, and also in his private affairs. The constable was explaining, with parental vanity, the precocious cleverness of his youngest child, a girl of two, when Holymead made his appearance, and he became aware that Mr. Crewe's interest in children was at an end. "'Look at that man,' said Crewe in a sharp, imperative tone to the police constable, as the K.C. was walking down the path of the Italian garden to the plantation. "'You saw him come in?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Do you see any difference?' "'No, sir. He's the same man,' said Flack with stolid certainty. "'Anything about him that is different?' continued Crewe. Police Constable Flack looked at Crewe in some bewilderment. He was not a deductive expert, and, as he told his wife afterwards, he did not know what the detective was driving at. He took another long look at Holymead who was then within a few yards of the plantation on his way to the gates, and remarked in a hesitating tone, as though to justify his failure. "'Well, you see, sir, 
when he was coming in it was the front view i saw now i can only see his back but before he had finished speaking crewe had left him and was following the k c holymead has gone into the house without a walking stick and had reappeared carrying one on his arm crewe admired the cool audacity which had prompted holymead to go into a house where a murder had been committed to recover his stick under the very eyes of the police and he immediately formed the conclusion that the k c had come to the house to recover the stick for some urgent reason possibly not unconnected with the crime and it was apparent that holymead was a shrewd judge of human nature crewe reflected for he calculated that the rareness of the quality of observation even in those who like flack were supposed to keep their eyes open would permit him to do so unnoticed as crewe went down the path he beckoned to the boy joe who at the moment was acting the part of a comic dentist binding a recalcitrant patient to a chair using an immense old-fashioned straight-backed chair which stood in the hall for his stage setting joe overtook his master as he entered the ornamental plantation in front of the house and crewe quickly whispered his instructions as the retreating figure of the k c threaded the wood towards the gates when i catch up level with him joe you are to run into him accidentally from behind and knock his stick off his arm so that it falls near me i will pick it up and return it to him i must handle the stick you understand do not wait to see how he takes it when you bump into him get off round the corner at once and wait for me crewe quickened his pace to overtake the man in front of him he gave no glance backward at the boy for he knew his instructions would be carried out faithfully and intelligently he allowed holymead to reach the big open gates and turn from the gravelled carriage drive into the private street then he hurried after him and drew level with holymead as he did so there was a sound of running footsteps from behind and then a shout joe had cleverly tripped and fallen heavily between the two men bringing down holymead in his fall the k c stick flew off his arm and bounded half a dozen yards away crewe stepped forward quickly secured the stick glanced quickly at the monogram engraved on it and held it out to holymead who was brushing the dust of his clothes with vexatious remarks about the clumsiness and impudence of street boys for a moment he seemed to hesitate about taking the stick i believe this is yours said crewe politely ah yes thank you said the k c giving him a keen suspicious glance End of chapter seven of the Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter eight of the Hampstead Mystery This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. Reading by Mary Rody. THE HAMPSTEAD MYSTERY by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Rees CHAPTER Eight. Crewe had well-furnished offices in Holborn, but lived in a luxurious flat in German Street. Although he went to and fro between them daily, his personality was almost a dual one, though not consciously so. His passion for crime investigation was distinct, in outward seeming at all events from his polished west end life of wealthy ease grave self-contained and inscrutable he slipped from one to the other with an effortless regularity and the fashionable folk with whom he mixed in his leisured bachelor existence in the west end apart from knowing him as the famous crew 
had even less knowledge of the real man behind his suave exterior than the clients who visited his inquiry rooms in holborn to confide in him their stories of suffering shame or crimes committed against them his commissionaire and body-servant stork had once in a rare almost unique convivial moment declared to the caretaker of the building that he knew no more about his master after ten years than he did the first day he entered his service he was deep beyond all belief was stork's opinion delivered with reluctant admiration although crewe did not allow the externals of his two existences to become involved his chief interest in life was in his work he had originally taken up detective work more as a relief from the boredom of his lot as a wealthy young man leading an aimless useless life with others of his class than by deliberate choice of his vocation his initial successes surprised him then the work absorbed him and became his life's career he had achieved some memorable successes and he had made a few failures but the failures belonged to the earlier portion of his career before he had learnt to trust thoroughly in his own great gifts of intuition and insight and that uncanny imagination which sometimes carried him successfully through when all else failed serious devotees of chess knew the name of crewe in another capacity as the name of a man who might have aspired to great deeds if he had but taken the game as his life's career he had flashed across the chess horizon some years previously as a player of surpassing brilliance by defeating turgiev when the great russian master had visited london and had played twelve simultaneous boards at the london chess club crewe was the only player of the twelve to win his game and he did so by a masterly concealed ending in which he handled his pawns with consummate skill proffering the sacrifice of a bishop with such art that turgiev fell into the trap and was mated in five subsequent moves crewe proved this was not merely a lucky win by defeating the young south american champion caranda shortly afterwards when the latter visited england and played a series of exhibition games in london on his way to moscow where he was engaged in the championship tourney once again it was masterly pawn play which brought crewe a fine victory and aged chess enthusiasts who followed every move of the game with trembling excitement declared afterwards that crewe's conception of this particular game had not been equalled since morphy died they predicted a dazzling chess career for crewe but he disappointed their aged hearts by retiring suddenly from match chess and they mourned him as one unworthy of his great chess gifts and the high hopes they had placed in him but as a matter of fact crewe's intellect was too vigorous and active to be satisfied with the triumphs of chess and his disappearance from the chess world was contemporary with his entrance into detective work which appealed to his imagination and found scope for his restless mental activity but if detective work so absorbed him that he gave up match chess entirely he still retained an interest in the science of chess reserving problem play for his spare moments and when not immersed in the solution of a problem of human mystery he would turn to the chessboard and seek solace and relaxation in the mysteries of an intricate four-mover he had once said that there was a certain affinity between solving chess problems and the detection of crime mystery once the key move was found the rest was comparatively easy but he added with a sigh that a really perfect crime mystery was as rare as a perfect chess problem 
human ingenuity was not sufficiently skillful, as a rule, to commit a crime or construct a chess problem with completely artistic concealment of the key move. And for that reason, most problems and crimes were far too easy of detection to absorb one's intellectual interests and attention. It was the morning after Crewe's visit to Riversbrook, and the detective sat in his private office, glancing through a notebook which contained a summary of the Hampstead mystery. Crewe was a painstaking detective as well as a brilliant one, and it was his custom to prepare several critical summaries of any important case on which he was engaged, writing and rewriting the facts and his comments until he was satisfied that he had a perfect outline to work upon, with the details and clues of the crime in consecutive order and relation to one another. Experience had taught him that the time and labor this task involved were well spent. If an unexpected development of the case altered the facts of the original summary, Crewe prepared another one in the same painstaking way. The summaries, when done with, were methodically filed and indexed and stored in a strong room at the office for future reference, where he also kept full records of all the cases upon which he had been engaged, together with the weapons and articles that had figured in them, huge volumes of newspaper reports and clippings, photographs of criminals with their careers appended, and a host of other odds and ends of his detective investigations, the whole forming an interesting museum of crime and mystery, which would have furnished a store of rich material for a fresh Newgate calendar. It was an axiom of Crewe's that a detective never knew when some old scrap of information or some trifling article of some dead and forgotten crime might not afford a valuable clue. Expert criminals frequently repeated themselves, like people in lesser walks of life, and Crewe's library and museum, as he called it, had sometimes furnished him with a simple hint for the solution of a mystery which had defied more subtle methods of analysis. Crewe, after carefully reading his summary of the murder of Sir Horace Fewbanks, and making a few alterations in the text, drew from his pocket the glove which Inspector Chippenfield had handed him as a clue, took it to the window, and carefully examined it through a large magnifying glass. He was thus engrossed, when the door was noiselessly opened, and Stork, the bodyguard, entered. Stork belied his name. He was short and fat, with a red mottled face, a model of discretion and imperturbability, who had served Crewe for ten years, and bade fair to serve him another ten, if he lived that long. In his heart of hearts he often wondered why a gentleman like Crewe should so far forget what was due to his birth and position as to have offices in Holborn, Holborn of all parts of London. But the awe he felt for Crewe prevented his seeking information on the point from the only person who could give it to him. So he served him and puzzled over him in silence, his inward perturbation of spirits being made manifest occasionally by a puzzled glance at his master when the latter was not looking. It was nothing to Stork that his master was a famous detective. The problem to him was why he was a detective when he had no call to be one, having more money than any man, let alone a single man, could spend in a lifetime. Stork coughed slightly to attract Crewe's attention. "'If you please, sir,' he said, "'the boy has come.' While Crewe was busy with his magnifying glass, Stork returned with the boy who had accompanied Crewe on his visit to Riversbrook on the previous day. The boy, a thin, white-faced, sharp-eyed London street urchin, seemed curiously out of place in the handsomely furnished office, with his legs tucked up under the carved rail of a fine old oak chair, 
and his big dark eyes fixed intently on Crewe's face. The tie between him and the detective was an unusual one. It dated back some twelve months, when Crewe, in the investigation of a peculiarly baffling crime, found it advisable to disguise himself and live temporarily in a crowded criminal quarter of Islington. The rooms he took were above a second-hand clothing shop kept by a drunken female named Lever, a supposed widow who lived at the back of the shop with her two children, Lizzie, a bold-eyed girl of seventeen, who worked at a Clerkenwell clothing factory, and Joe, a typical cockney boy of fourteen, who sold papers in the streets during the day, and was fast qualifying for a thief at night, when Crewe went to the place to live. Crewe soon discovered, through overhearing a loud quarrel between his landlady and her daughter, that Mrs. Lever's husband was alive, though dead to his wife for all practical purposes, inasmuch as he was serving a life's imprisonment for manslaughter. A fortnight after he had taken up his temporary quarters above the shop, the woman was removed to the hospital, suffering from the effects of a hard drinking bout, and died there. The girl disappeared, and the boy would have been turned out on the streets but for Crewe, who had taken a liking to him. Joe was self-reliant, alert, and precocious, like most London street boys. But in addition to these qualities, he had a vein of imagination unusual in a lad of his upbringing and environment. He devoured the exciting feuilleton stories in the evening papers he vended, and spent his spare pennies at the cinema theatres in the vicinity of his poor home. His appreciation of the crude mysteries of the film detective drama amused the famous expert in the finer art of actual crime detection, until he discovered that the boy possessed natural gifts of intuition and observation, combined with penetration. Crewe grew interested in developing the boy's talent for detective work. When the lad's mother died, Crewe decided to take him into his Holborn offices as messenger boy. Crewe soon discovered that Joe had a useful gift for shadowing work, and his street training as a newspaper runner enabled him not only to follow a person through the thickest of London traffic, but to escape observation where a man might have been noticed and suspected. "'Well, Joe,' said Crewe, as the boy entered on the heels of Stork, I have a job for you this morning. I want you to find the glove corresponding to this one. Crewe, having finished his examination of the glove, handed it to the boy, whose first act was to slip it on his left hand and move his fingers about to assure himself that they were in good working order in spite of being hidden. It was the first occasion on which Joe had worn a glove. It was found in the room in which Sir Horace Fewbanks was murdered, continued Crewe. The other one was not there. The question I want to solve is, did it belong to Sir Horace, or to someone who visited him on the night he was murdered? The police think it belonged to Sir Horace, because it is the same size as the gloves he wore, and because Sir Horace's hosier stocks the same kind as does nearly every fashionable hosier in London. They think he lost the right-hand glove on his way up from Scotland. It will occur to you, Joe, though you don't wear gloves, that it is more common for men to lose the right-hand glove than the left hand, because the right hand is used a great deal more than the left, and even men who would not be seen in the street without gloves find there are many things they cannot do with the gloved hand. For instance, to dive one's hand into one's trouser pocket, where most men keep their loose change, the glove has to be removed. Then the gentleman would take off his right glove when he paid for his taxicab from St. Pancras, said Joe, who was familiar through the accounts in the newspapers with the main details of the Fewbanks mystery. "'Right, Joe,' said his master approvingly. 
and in that case he dropped the glove between the taxicab outside his front gates and his room, and it would have been found. I have made inquiries, and I am satisfied it was not found. He might have lost it when he was getting into the train at Scotland, suggested the lad. He had to change trains at Glasgow, and he might have lost it there. That is a rule of thumb deduction, said Crewe, with a kindly smile. It is good enough for the police, for they have apparently adopted it, but it is not good enough for me. What you don't understand, Joe, is that an odd glove is of no value in the eyes of a man who wears gloves. He doesn't take it home as a memento of his carelessness in losing the other. He throws it away. Therefore, if this is Sir Horace's glove, he took it home because he was unaware that he had lost the other. He would put on his gloves before leaving the train at St. Pancras, and he would pull off the right-hand one. He was not left-handed. When the taxicab was nearing his home, so as to be able to pay the fare. Therefore, if it is Sir Horace's glove, the fellow to it was dropped in the taxicab, or dropped between the taxicab and the house. If the glove had been lost at the other end of the journey in Scotland, Sir Horace would have flung this one out of the carriage window when he became aware of the loss. As I have told you, no glove was found between the gate at Riversbrook and the room in which Sir Horace was murdered. I got from the police the number of the taxicab in which Sir Horace was driven from St. Pancras, and the driver tells me that no glove was left in his cab. So what have we to do next, Joe? To find the missing glove? It's a tough job, ain't it, sir? Yes and no, replied Crewe. It is possible to make some reasonable safe deductions in regard to it. These would indicate what had happened to it, and, knowing where to look, or rather, in what circumstances we might expect to find it, we might throw a little light on it. In the first place, it might be assumed that if the glove did not belong to Sir Horace, it belonged to someone who visited him on the night he returned unexpectedly from Scotland. That indicates that his visitor knew Sir Horace was returning. A most important point— for if he knew Sir Horace was returning, he knew why he was returning, which no one else knows up to the present as far as I have been able to gather, and in all probability was responsible for his return, say, sent him a letter or a telegram which brought him to London. So we come to the possibility of an angry scene in the room in which Sir Horace's dead body was subsequently found. We have the possibility of the visitor leaving the house in a high state of excitement, hastily snatching up the hat and gloves he had taken off when he arrived, and in his excitement dropping unnoticed the right-hand glove on the floor. "'And leaving his gold-mounted stick behind him,' said Joe, who was following his master's line of reasoning with keen interest. "'Right, Joe,' said Crewe. That was placed in the stand in the hall, and when the visitor left hurriedly was entirely forgotten. But at what stage did the visitor become conscious of the loss of his glove? Not until his excitement cooled down a little. How long he took to cool down depends upon the cause of his excitement and his temperament, things which, at present, we can only guess at. He would probably walk a long distance before he cooled down. Then he would resume his normal habits, and, among other things, would put on his gloves, if he had them. He would find that he had lost one, and that he had left his stick behind. He would know that the stick had been left behind in the hall, but he would not know the glove had been dropped in the house. The probabilities are that he would think he had dropped it while walking, but if he felt that he had dropped it in the house, and he had the best of all reasons for not wishing anyone to know that he had visited Sir Horace that night, he would destroy the remaining glove, and our chance of tracing it would be gone. The fact that he had left his stick behind was a minor matter that he could easily account for if he had been a friend of Sir Horace who had been in the habit of visiting Riversbrook. 
If anything cropped up subsequently about the stick, he could say that he had left it there before Sir Horace closed up his house and went to Scotland. But the problem of the glove is a different matter, Joe. There are three phases to it. First, if the visitor thought he had dropped it in the house and wanted to keep his visit there a profound secret from subsequent inquiry, he would take home the remaining glove and destroy it, probably by burning it. Secondly, if he thought he had dropped it after leaving the house, he would not feel that safety necessitated the destruction of the remaining one, but he would probably throw it away where it would not be likely to be found. In the third place, if he had no particular reason for wishing to hide the fact that he had visited Riversbrook, he would throw it away anywhere when he became conscious that he had lost the other. He would throw it away merely because an odd glove is of no use to a man who wears gloves. The man who doesn't wear gloves would pick up an odd glove from the ground and think he had made a find. He would take it home to his wife, and she would probably keep it for finger-stalls for the children. Crewe put down his notes and got up from his chair. Your job is this, Joe. Go to Riversbrook and make a careful search on both sides of the road for the missing glove. I do not think he threw it away, if he did throw it away, until he had walked some distance. But you mustn't act on that assumption. Look over the fences of the houses and into the hedges. Walk along in the direction of Hampstead Underground. Search the gutters and all the trees and hedges along the road. Take one side of the street to the Underground Station, and if you do not find the glove, go back to Riverside along the other side. Make a thorough job of it, as it is most important that the glove should be found, if it is to be found. After Joe had departed, Crewe put on his hat and left his office for the Strand. His first call was at the shop of Bruden and Marshall, hosers, in order to find out if any information was to be obtained there about the ownership of the glove. He was aware that the police had been there on the same mission, but his experience had often shown that valuable information was to be gathered after the police had been over the ground. On introducing himself to the manager of the shop, that gentleman displayed as much humble civility as he would have done towards a valued customer. He could not say anything about the ownership of the glove which Crewe had brought, and he could not even say if it had come from their shop. It was an excellent glove, the line being known in the trade as First Choice Reindeer. They stocked that particular kind of article at ten and six the pair. They had the pleasure of having had the late Sir Horace Fewbanks on their books. He was quite an old account, if he might use the expression. He was one of their best customers, being a gentleman who was particular about his appearance, and who would have nothing but the best in any line that he fancied. On the subject of Sir Horace's taste in hose, the manager had much to say, and, in spite of Crewe's efforts to confine the conversation to gloves, the manager repeatedly dragged in socks. He did it so frequently that he became conscious his visitor was showing signs of annoyance, so he apologized, adding with an inspiration, After all, hose is really gloves for the feet. Crewe ascertained that a large number of legal gentlemen were customers of Bruden and Marshall. He innocently suggested that the reason was because the shop was the nearest one of its kind to the law courts, but this explanation offended the shopman's pride. It was because they stocked high-class goods and gave good value in every way, combined with attention and civility and a desire to please, that they did such an excellent business with legal gentlemen. In refutation of the idea that proximity to the courts was the direct reason of their having so many legal gentlemen among their customers, the manager declared that they received orders from all parts of the world, 
India, Canada, Australia, and South Africa, to say nothing of American gentlemen who liked their hosiery to have the London hallmark. Their orders from the colonies came from gentlemen who found that these things in the colonies were not what they had been used to, and so they sent their orders to Bruden and Marshall. Coo's interest was in the legal customers, and he asked for the names of some. The manager ran through a list of names of judges, barristers, and solicitors, but the name Crewe wanted to hear was not among them. He was compelled to include the name among half a dozen others he mentioned to the manager. He ascertained that Mr. Charles Holymead was a customer of the firm, but it was apparent from the manager's spiritless attitude towards Mr. Holymead that the famous K.C. was not a man who ran up a big bill with his hosier, or was very particular about what he wore. The world regarded some of the men of this type famous or distinguished, but in the hosier's mind they were all classed as commonplace. But the manager would not go so far as to say Mr. Holymead would not buy such a glove as that which Crewe had brought in. He might, and he might not, but, as a general rule, he did not pay more than eight and six for his gloves. Crewe took a taxi to Princess Gate in order to have a look at the house in which Holymead lived. It occurred to him that if Holymead was not particular about what he spent on his clothes, he was extravagant about the amount he spent in house rent. Of course, a leading barrister, earning a huge income, could afford to live in a palatial residence in Princess Gate, but it was not the locality or residence that an economically-minded man would have chosen for his home. But Crewe had little doubt that the beautiful wife Holymead possessed was responsible for the choice of house and locality. After looking at the house, Crewe walked back to the cab stand at Hyde Park Corner. He had arrived at the conclusion that it was necessary to settle beyond doubt whether the K.C. had visited Riversbrook the night Sir Horace had returned from Scotland. If the K.C. had done so, he was anxious to keep the visit secret, for not only had he not informed the police of his visit, but he had kept it from Miss Fewbanks. Crewe had ascertained from Miss Fewbanks that Mr. Holymead, when he had called at Riversbrook on a visit of condolence, had not mentioned to her anything about having left his stick in the hall stand on a previous visit. On leaving Miss Fewbanks, Mr. Holymead had gone up to the hall stand and taken both his hat and stick as if he had left them both there a few minutes before. Crewe reasoned that if Holymead had gone out to see Sir Horace Fewbanks at Riversbrook and had desired to keep his visit a secret, he would not have taken a cab at Hyde Park Corner to Hampstead, but would have travelled by underground railway or omnibus. In all probability the tube had been used, because of its speed being more in harmony with the feelings of a man impatient to get done with the subject so important that Sir Horace had been recalled from Scotland to deal with it. He would leave the tube at Hampstead and take a taxicab. He would not be likely to go straight to Riversbrook in the taxicab if he were anxious that his movements should not be traced subsequently. He would dismiss the taxicab at one of the hotels bordering on Hampstead Heath, for they were the resort of hundreds of visitors on summer nights and his actions would thus easily escape notice. From the hotel he would walk across to Riversbrook, but the return journey would be made in a somewhat different way. If Holymead left Riversbrook in a state of excitement, he would walk a long way without being conscious of the exertion. He would want to be alone with his own thoughts. Gradually he would cool down, and becoming conscious of his surroundings, would make his way home. Again he would use the tube, for it would be more difficult for his movements to be traced if he mixed with the crowd of travellers than if he took a cab to his home. It was impossible to say what station he got in at, for that would depend on how far he walked before he cooled down, 
but he would be sure to get out at Hyde Park Corner, because that was the station nearest to his house. Allowing for a temperamental reaction, during a train journey of about twenty minutes, he would feel depressed and weary, and would probably take a taxicab outside Hyde Park Station to his home. That was a thing he would often be in the habit of doing when returning late at night from the theatre or elsewhere, and therefore could be easily explained by him if the police happened to make inquiries as to his movements. As Crewe anticipated, he had no difficulty in finding the driver of the taxicab in which Holymead had driven home on the night of Wednesday last. The KC frequently used cabs, and he was well known to all the drivers on the rank. Crewe got into the cab he had used, and ordered the man to drive him to his office, and there invited him upstairs. He adopted this course because he knew that the driver, who gave his name as Taylor, would be more likely to talk freely in an office where he could not be overheard than he would do on the cab rank with his fellow drivers crowding him, or in a hotel parlor where other people were present. "'Tell me exactly what happened when you drove Mr. Holymead home on Wednesday night,' said Crewe. "'Did you notice anything strange about him, or was his manner much the same as on other occasions that he used your cab?' "'Well, I don't see whether I should tell you whether he was or whether he wasn't,' replied the taxicab driver, who was as surly as most of his class. "'What is it to do with you, anyway? He's a regular customer of mine on the rank, and he's not one of your tuppenny dipsters, either. He's a gentleman, and if he got to know that I had been telling tales about him, it would not do me any good.' "'It would not.' replied Crewe, with cordial acquiescence. Therefore, Taylor, I give you my word of honor not to mention anything you tell me. Furthermore, I'll see that you don't lose by it now or at any other time. I cannot say more than that, but that's a great deal more than the police would say. Now, would you sooner tell me, or tell the police? Here's a sovereign to start with, and if you have an interesting story to tell, you'll have another one before you leave. The appeal of money and the conviction that the police would use less considerate methods if Crewe passed him over to them abolished Taylor's scruples about discussing a fare, and it was in a much less surly tone that he responded. I didn't notice anything strange about him when he called me off the rank, but I did afterwards. First of all, I didn't drive him home. That is, I did drive him home, but he didn't go inside. When I drew up outside his house in Princess Gate, I looked around, expecting to see him get out. As he didn't move, I got down and opened the door. "'Aren't you getting out here, sir?' I said in a soft voice. "'No,' he said. "'Drive on. "'This is your house, sir.' I ventured to say. I'm not going in, he replied. Drive on. I was surprised. I thought he was the worse for drink, and I'd never seen him that way before. But some gentlemen are so obstinate in liquor that you can't get them to do anything except the opposite of what you ask them. I thought I'd try and coax him. Better go inside, sir, I said. You'll be better off in bed. "'Do you think I'm drunk?' he said sharply. "'You could have knocked me down with a feather. "'He was as sober as a judge, all in a moment. "'No, sir, I didn't,' I said. "'I wouldn't take the liberty,' I said. "'Then get back on your seat and drive me to the Hyde Park Hotel. "'No, I think I'll go to Verney's. "'But don't go there direct. "'Drive me round the park first. "'I feel I want a breath of cool air.' "'Go on,' said Crewe, in a tone which indicated approval of Taylor's method of telling his story. "'Well, I turned the cab round and drove through the park. "'But I was puzzled about him and looked back at him once or twice, "'pretending that I was looking to see if a cab or car was coming up behind. 
and as we passed over the serpentine bridge, I saw him throw something out of the window. A glove? suggested Crewe quickly. The driver looked at him in profound admiration. Well, if you don't beat all the detectives I've ever heard of. He tried to throw it in the water, continued Crewe, as if explaining the matter to himself rather than to his visitor. Did you get it? "'Hold on a bit,' said Taylor, who had his own ideas of how to give value for the extra sovereign he hoped to obtain. "'I couldn't see what it was he had thrown away, and, of course, I couldn't pull up to find out. I drove on, but I kept my eye on him, though I had my back to him. As we were driving back along the broad walk, I had another look at him, and bless me if he wasn't crying, crying like a child.' He had his hands up to his face, and his head was shaking as if he was sobbing. I said to myself, He's barmy. He's gone off his rocker. I thought to myself I ought to drive him to the police station, but I reckoned it was none of my business after all, so I'll take him to Verney's and be done with it. So I drove to Verney's. He got out and paid me, but I couldn't see that he had been crying, and he looked much as usual, so far as I could see. I thought to myself that perhaps, after all, he'd only had a queer turn. However, I said to myself I'd drive back to the bridge and see what he'd thrown out of the window. It was a glove, sure enough. It had fallen just below the railing. I looked about for the other one, but I couldn't find it. So I suppose it must have fallen into the water." "'No, it didn't,' said Crewe. "'I have it here.' He opened a drawer in his desk and produced the glove. "'It was a right-hand glove you found. Just look at this one and see if it corresponds to the one you picked up.' Taylor looked at the glove. "'They're as like as two peas,' he said. "'What did you do with the one you found?' inquired Crewe. "'I hope you didn't throw it away.' "'I'm not a fool,' retorted Taylor. "'I've had odd gloves left in my cab before. "'I kept this one thinking that sooner or later "'somebody might leave another like it, "'and then I'd have a pair for nothing.' "'Well, I'll buy it from you,' said Crewe. "'Have you anything more to tell me?' "'I went back to the rank, "'and one of the chaps was curious that I'd been so long away.' for he knew that Mr. Holymead's place isn't more than ten minutes' drive from the station. But he got nothing out of me. I know how to keep my mouth shut. You're the first man I've told what happened, and I hope you won't give me away. I've already promised you that, said Crewe, flipping another sovereign from his sovereign case and handing it to Taylor, and I'll give you five shillings for the glove. Taylor looked at him darkly. Five shillings isn't much for a glove like that,' he said insolently. "'What about my loss of time going home for it? "'I suppose you'll pay the taxi fare for the run-down from Hyde Park.' "'No, I won't,' said Crewe cheerfully. "'Then I don't see why I should bring it for a paltry five shillings,' said Taylor. "'If you want the glove, you'll have to pay for it.' "'But I don't want the glove,' said Crewe who disliked being made the victim of extortion. What made you think so? I'll sell you this one for five shillings. We may as well do a deal of some kind. It is no use each of us having one glove. What do you say, Taylor? Will you buy mine for five shillings, or shall I buy yours? Taylor smiled sourly. You're a deep one, he said. Here's the other glove. He dipped his hand into the deep pocket of his driving coat and produced a glove. I suppose you knew I'd have it on me. Five shillings, and it's yours. The pair are worth about five shillings to me, said Crewe, as he paid over the money. Do you remember what time it was when Mr. Holymead engaged you at Hyde Park? Eleven o'clock. You are quite sure as to the time. I heard one of the big clocks striking as he was getting into my cab. Taylor took his departure, and Crewe, after wrapping up the left-hand glove which he had to return to Inspector Chippenfield, 
put the other one in his safe. "'We're getting on,' he said in a pleased tone. "'This means a trip to Scotland. "'But I'll wait until the inquest is over.'" End of chapter 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Hampstead Mystery by John R. Watson and Arthur J. Reese. Chapter 9 At the inquest on the body of Sir Horace Fewbanks, which was held at the Hampstead Police Court, there was an odd mixture of classes in the crowd that thronged that portion of the court in which the public were allowed to congregate. The accounts of the crime which had been published in the press, and the atmosphere of mystery which enshrouded the violent death of one of the most prominent of His Majesty's judges, had stirred the public curiosity, and therefore, in spite of the fact that everyone was supposed to be out of town in August, the attendance at the court including a sprinkling of ladies of the fashionable world and their escorts. Both branches of the legal profession were numerously represented. All of the victim's judicial colleagues were out of town, and, though some of them intended as a mark of respect for the dead man to come up for the funeral, which was to take place two days later, they were too familiar with legal procedure to feel curiosity as to the working of the machinery at a preliminary inquiry into the crime. They were emphatic among their friends on the degeneracy of these days which rendered possible such an outrageous crime as the murder of a high court judge. The fact that it was without precedent in the history of British law added to its enormity in the eyes of gentlemen who had been trained to worship precedent as the only safe guide through the shifting quicksands of life. They were insistent on the urgency of the murderer being arrested and handed over to justice in the person of the hangman, for, as each asked himself, where was this sort of crime to end? In spite of the degeneracy of the times, they were reluctant to believe in such a far-fetched supposition as the existence of a band of criminals who, in revenge for the judicial sentences imposed on their members, of their class had sworn to exterminate the whole of his majesty's judges but until the murderer was apprehended and the reason for the crime was discovered it was impossible to say that the english judicature would not soon be called upon to supply other victims to criminal violence the murder of a judge seemed to them a particularly atrocious crime in the punishment of which the law might honorably sacrifice temporarily its well-earned reputation for delay. The bar was represented chiefly by junior members. The senior members were able to make full use of the long vacation, spending it at health resorts or in the country. But the incomes of the young shoots of the great parasitical profession did not permit them to enjoy more than a brief holiday out of town. Of course it would never have done for them to admit even to each other that they could not afford to go away for an extended holiday, and therefore they told one another in bored tones that they had not been able to make up their minds where to go. The junior bar included old men who, through lack of influence, want of energy, want of advertisement, want of ability, or some other deficiency, had never earned more than a few guineas at their profession though they had spent year after year in chambers. They lived on scanty private means. Broken in spirit, they had even ceased to attend the courts in order to study the methods and learn the tricks of successful counsel. But the murder of a high court judge was a thing which stirred even their sluggish blood, and in the hope of sensational development, they had put on faded silk hats and shabby black suits and gone out to Hampstead to attend the inquest. The interest of the junior bar in the crime was as personal as that of the members of the judicial bench, though it manifested itself in an entirely different direction. They speculated among themselves as to who would be appointed to the vacancy on the high court bench. A leading KC with a political pull would of course be selected by the Attorney General, 
but there were several K.C.s who possessed these qualifications, and therefore there was room for difference of opinion among the junior bar as to who would get the offer. The point on which they were all united was that vacancies of the high court bench were a good thing for the bar as a whole, for they removed leading K.C.s and the dispersion of their practice was like rain on parched ground. Metaphorically speaking, everyone, including even the junior bar, had the chance of getting a shove-up when a leading K.C. accepted a judicial appointment. Some of the more irreverent spirits among the junior bar, in drawing attention to the fact that Sir Horace Fewbanks had been one of the youngest members of the high court bench, expressed the hope that the shock of his death would be felt by some of the extremely aged members of the bench, who were too infirm in health to be able to stand many shocks. The members of the junior bar chatted with the representatives of the lower branch of the profession, who ranged from article clerks whose young souls had not been entirely dried up by association with parchment, to hard old delvers in dusty documents who had lived so long in the legal atmosphere of quibbling, obstruction, and deceit, that they were as incapable of an honest, impetuous act as of an illegal one. The gossip concerning the murdered judge, in which the two branches of the profession joined, had reference to his moral character in legal circles. There had always been gossip of the kind in his lifetime. So Horace's judicial reputation was beyond reproach, and he had known his law a great deal better than most of his judicial colleagues. Comparatively few of his decisions had been upset on appeal, but everyone about the courts knew that he was susceptible to a pretty feminine face and a good figure. Many were the conflicts that arose in court between bench and bar as a result of Mr. Justice Fewbanks's habit of protecting pretty witnesses from cross-examining questions which he regarded as outside the case. There was no suggestion that his judicial decisions were influenced by the good looks of ladies who were parties to the cases heard by him, but there were rumors that on occasions the relations between the judge and a pretty witness begun in court had ripened into something at which moral men might well shake their heads. While the members of the legal profession struggled to obtain seats in the body of the court, an entirely different class of spectators struggled to get into the gallery. For the most part, they were badly dressed men who needed a shave, but there were a few well-dressed men among them, and also a few ladies. Detective Rolfe took a professional interest in the occupants of the gallery. What a collection of crooks, he whispered to Inspector Chippenfield. A regular rogues gallery. Look, there is Nosy George. It is time he was in again, and behind him is that cunning old drop, Icky Samuels. I wish we could get him. Look at the other end of the first row. Isn't that Sonny Jim? He's grown a beard since he's been out. We'll soon have it off again for him. He's got the impudence to scowl at us. He'll lay for you one of these nights, Inspector. The judicial duties of the murdered man had been concerned chiefly with civil cases at the royal courts of justice. But when the criminal calendar had been heavy, he had often presided at number one court at the Old Bailey. It was this fact which had given the criminal class a sort of personal interest in his murder and accounted for the presence of many well-known criminals who happened to be out of ghoul at the time. The spectators in the gallery included men whom the murdered man had sentenced, and men who had been fortunate enough to escape being sent sentenced by him owing to the vagaries of the juries. There were pickpockets, sneak thieves, confidence men, burglars, and receivers among the occupants of the gallery, and many of them had brought with them the ladies who assisted them professionally or presided over their homes when they were not in ghoul. I wouldn't be surprised if the man we want is among that bunch, said Rolfe to Inspector Chippenfield. You've got a lot to learn about them, my boy, said his superior. There is crew up among them, continued Rolfe. I wonder what he thinks he's after. Inspector Chippenfield gave a glance in the direction of crew, 
but did not deign to give him any sign of recognition. The fact that Crewe, by his presence in the gallery, seemed to entertain the idea that the murderer might be among the occupants of that part of the court could not be as lightly dismissed as Rolfe's vague suggestion. It annoyed Inspector Chippenfield to think that Crewe might be nearer at the moment to the murderer than he himself was, even though that proximity was merely physical and unsupported by evidence or even by any theory. It would have been a great relief to him if he had known that Crewe's object in going to the gallery was not to mix with the criminal classes, but in order to keep a careful survey of what took place in the body of the court without making himself too prominent. Mr. Holymead, K.C., arrived, and members of the junior bar deferentially made room for him. He shook hands with some of these gentlemen, and also with Inspector Chippenfield, much to the gratification of that officer. Miss Fewbanks arrived in a taxicab a few minutes before the appointed hour of eleven. She was accompanied by Mrs. Holymead, and they were shown into a private room by Police Constable Flack, who had received instructions from Inspector Chippenfield to be on the lookout for the murdered man's daughter. Miss Fewbanks and Mrs. Holymead had been almost inseparable since the tragedy had been discovered. Immediately on the arrival of Miss Fewbanks from Delmer, Mrs. Holymead had gone out to Riversbrook to console with her and to support her in her great sorrow. But the murdered man's daughter, who, on account of having lived apart from her father, had developed a self-reliant spirit, seemed to be less overcome by the horror of the tragedy than Mrs. Holymead was. It was with a feeling that there was something lacking in her own nature that the girl realized that Mrs. Holymead's grief for the violent death of a man who had been her husband's dearest friend was greater than her own grief at the loss of a father. One of the directions in which Mrs. Holymead's grief found expression was in a feverish desire to know all that was being done to discover the murderer. She displayed continuous interest in the investigations of the detectives engaged on the case and she had implored Miss Fewbanks to let her know when any important discovery was made. She applauded the action of her young friend in engaging such a famous detective as Crewe, and declared that if anyone could unravel the mystery, Crewe would do it. She had been particularly anxious to hear through Miss Fewbanks what Crewe's impressions were with regard to the tragedy. The court was opened punctually, the coroner being Mr. Bodyman, a stout, clean-shaven, white-haired gentleman who had spent thirty years of his life in the stuffy atmosphere of police courts hearing police court cases. Police Inspector Selden nodded in reply to the inquiring glance of the coroner, and the inquest was opened. The first witness was Miss Fewbanks. She was dressed in deep black and was obviously a little unnerved. In a low tone, she said she had identified the body as that of her father. She was staying at her father's country house in Delmere, Sussex, when the crime was committed. She had no knowledge of anyone who was evilly disposed towards her father. He had never spoken to her of anyone who cherished a grudge against him. Evidence relating to the circumstances in which the body was found was given by Police Constable Flack. He described the position of the room in which the body was found and the attitude in which the body was stretched. He was on duty in the neighborhood of Tanton Gardens on the night of the murder, but he saw no suspicious characters and heard no sounds. The evidence of Hill was chiefly a repetition of what he had told Inspector Chippenfield as to his movements on the day of the crime and his methods of inspecting the premises three times a week in accordance with his master's orders. He knew nothing about Sir Horace's sudden return from Scotland. His first knowledge of this was the account of the murder, which he read in the papers. Inspector Chippenfield gave evidence for the purpose of producing the letter received at Scotland Yard, announcing that Sir Horace Fewbanks had been murdered. The letter was passed up to the coroner for his inspection, and when he examined it, he sent it to the foreman of the jury. Then followed medical evidence, which showed that death was due to a bullet wound, which could not have been self-inflicted. 
the coroner in his summing up dwelt upon the loss sustained by the judiciary by the violent death of one of its most distinguished members and the jury after re a retirement of a few minutes brought in a verdict of willful murder by person or persons unknown as the occupants of the court filed out into the street crewe who was watching holymead noticed the k c give a slight start when he saw miss fewbanks and his wife mr holymead went up to the ladies and shook hands with miss fewbanks and to crewe it seemed as if he was on the point of shaking hands with his wife but he stopped himself awkwardly he saw the ladies into their cab and raising his hat went off as mr holymead had seen miss fewbanks in court when she gave evidence it was obvious to crewe that he could not have been surprised at meeting her outside it was therefore the presence of his wife which had surprised him that fact if it were a fact opened a limitless field of speculation to crewe but in spite of the possibility of error a possibility which he frankly recognized he was pleased with himself for having noticed the incident to him it seemed to provide another link in the chain he was constructing. It harmonized with Taylor's story of Mr. Holymead's decision to stay at Bernie's instead of entering his own home the night Taylor drove him from Hyde Park Corner. Rolfe also possessed the professional faculty of observation, but in a different degree. He had seen Mr. Holymead talking to his wife and Miss Fewbanks but he had noticed nothing but gentlemanly ease in the barrister's manner. What did astonish him in connection with Mr. Holymead was that after he had left the ladies and was walking in the direction of the cab rank, he spoke to one of the former occupants of the gallery. This was a man known to the police and his associates as Kincher. His name was Kemp, and how he had obtained his nickname was not known. He was a criminal by profession and had undergone several heavy sentences for burglary. He was a thick-set man of medium height, about fifty years of age. Apart from a rather heavy lower jaw, he gave no external indication of his professional pursuits, but looked with his brown and weather-beaten face and rough blue reefer suit, not unlike a seafaring man. The likeness was heightened by a tattooed device which covered the back of his right hand and a slight roll in his gait when he walked. But appearances are deceptive, for Mr. Kemp, at Liberty or in Ghoul, had never been out of London in his life. He was born and bred a London thief, and had served all his sentences at Wormwood Scrubs. For over a minute he and Mr. Holymead remained in conversation. Rolfe, would have described it officially as familiar conversation, but that description would have overlooked the deference, the sense of inferiority in Kincher's manner. For a time, Rolf was puzzled by the incident, but he eventually lighted on an explanation which satisfied himself. It was that, in the earlier days, before Mr. Holymead had reached such a prominent position at the bar, he had been engaged in practice in the criminal courts, and Kincher had been one of his clients. With a cheerful smile, Holymead brought the conversation to an end and went on his way. Kemp walked on hurriedly in the opposite direction. He had his eyes on a young man whom he had seen in the gallery and who had seemed to avoid his eye. It was obvious to him that this young man, for whom he had been on the watch when Mr. Holymead spoke to him, had seized the opportunity to slip past him while he was talking to the eminent K.C. The young man, even from the back view, seemed to be well-dressed. "'Hello, Fred!' exclaimed Mr. Kemp, as he reached within a yard or two of his quarry. "'Hello, Kincher,' replied the young man, turning around. "'I didn't notice you. Were you up at the court?' "'Yes, I looked in,' said Mr. Kemp. "'There wasn't much doing, was there?' "'No,' said Fred. "'He won't trouble us any more,' pursued Mr. Kemp. "'No.' The young man seemed to have a dread of helping along the conversation, and therefore sought refuge in monosyllables. Mr. Kemp coughed before he formed his question. "'Did you go up there that night?' "'No.' The reply came instantaneously.' 
but the young man followed it up with a look of inquiry to ascertain if his denial was believed. "'A good thing, as it happened,' said Mr. Kemp. "'I had nothing to do with it,' said Fred earnestly. "'I never said you had,' replied Mr. Kemp. "'Nothing whatever to do with it,' continued the young man with emphasis. "'That's not my sort of game.' "'I'm not saying anything, Fred,' replied the elder man. "'But whoever done it might have done it by accident-like.' "'Accident or no accident, I had nothing to do with it, thank God.' "'That is all right, Fred. I'm not saying you know anything about it. "'But even if you did, you'd find I could be trusted. "'I don't go blabbing around to everybody.' "'I know you don't, but as I said before, I had nothing to do with it. "'I didn't go there that night. I changed my mind.' "'A very lucky thing, then.' "'because if they do look you up, you can prove an alibi.' "'Yes,' said Fred. "'I can prove an alibi easy enough. "'But what makes you talk about them looking me up? "'Why should they get into me? "'Why should they look me up? "'I told you I didn't go there.' "'That is all right, Fred,' said the other in a soothing tone. "'If that pal of yours keeps his mouth shut, "'there is nothing to put them on your tracks.' but I don't like the looks of him. He seems to me a bit nervous. And if they put him through the third degree, he'll squeak. That's my impression. If he squeaks, he'll have to settle with me, said Fred, and he'll find there is something to pay. If he tries to put me away, I'll, I'll, I'll do him in. Kincher, instead of being horrified at this sentiment, seemed to approve of it as the right thing to be done. "'I'd let him know if I was you, Fred,' he said. "'I didn't like the look of him. The reason I came out here today was to have a look at him, and when I saw him in the box, I said to myself, "'Well, I'm glad I've staked nothing on you, for it seems to me that you'll crack up if the police shake their thumbscrews in your face.' I felt glad I hadn't accepted your invitation to make it a two-handed job, Fred. It was the fact that someone else I'd never seen had put up the job that kept me out of it when you asked me to go with you. A man can't be too careful, especially after he's had a long spell in stir. But of course you're all right if you changed your mind and didn't go up there. But if I was you, I'd have my alibi ready. It was no good leaving things until the police are there at the door and making one up on the spur of the moment. Yes, I'll see about it, said Fred. It's a good idea. Come in and have a drink, Fred, said Kincher. It will do you good. It was dry work listening to them talking up there about the murder. Fred accompanied Mr. Kemp into the bar of the hotel they reached, and the elder man, after inquiring glance at his companion, ordered two whiskies. Kincher added water to the contents of each glass, and lifting his glass in his right hand, waited until Fred had done the same, and then said, "'Well, here's luck and long life to the man that did it, whoever he is.' Fred offered no objection to this sentiment, and they drained their glasses. End of chapter 9「ten of the Hampstead Mystery」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 10 And so you had no luck, Rolf. Inspector Chippenfield, glancing up from his official desk in Scotland Yard, put this question in a tone of voice which suggested that the speaker had expected nothing better. 
"'I've seen the heads of at least half a dozen likely Western shops,' Rolfe replied, "'and they tell me there is nothing to indicate where the handkerchief was bought. "'The scrap of lace merely shows that it was torn off a good handkerchief, "'but there is nothing about it to show that the handkerchief was different "'in any marked way from the average filmy scrap of muslin and lace "'which every smart woman carries as a handkerchief.' I thought so myself before I started to make inquiries. Well, Rolf, we must come at it another way, said the inspector. Undoubtedly there is a woman in the case, and it ought not to be impossible to locate her. Your theory, Rolf, is that the murder was committed by someone who broke into the place while Sir Horace was entertaining a lady friend, or waiting for the arrival of a lady he expected. Either the lady had not arrived, or had left the room temporarily when the burglar broke into the house. He had spotted the place some days before, and ascertained that it was empty and when he found that Sir Horace had returned alone, he decided to break in, and, covering Sir Horace with a revolver, tried to extort money from him. A riskier but more profitable game than burgling in an empty house, if it came off. With his revolver in his hand, he made his way up to the library. Sir Horace parleyed with him until he could reach his own revolver, and then got in the first shot, but missed his man. The burglar shot him, and then bolted. The lady heard the shots, and rushing in found Sir Horace in his death agony. She was stooping over him with her handkerchief in her hand, and in his convulsive moments he caught hold of a corner of it, and the handkerchief was torn. The lady left the place, and on arrival home concocted the letter which was sent here, telling us that Sir Horace had been murdered. "'Is that it?' "'Yes,' assented Rolf. "'Of course, I don't lay it down that everything happened, just as you've said. "'But uh, that's my idea of the crime. "'It accounts for all the clues we've picked up, and uh, that is something.' "'It is an ingenious theory, and it does you credit,' said the inspector, who had not forgotten that he had proposed to Rolf that they should help one another to the extent of taking one another fully into each other's confidence for the purpose of getting ahead of crew. But you have overlooked the fact that it is possible to account in another way for all the clues we have picked up. Suppose Sir Horace's return from Scotland was due to a message from a lady friend Suppose the lady went to see him, accompanied by a friend whom Sir Horace did not like, a friend of whom Sir Horace was jealous. Suppose they asked for money, blackmail, and there was a quarrel in which Sir Horace was shot. Then we have your idea as to how the lady's handkerchief was torn. I agree with that in the main. The lady and her friend fled from the place. Later in the night the place is burgled by someone who has had his eye on it for some time. And on entering the library he is astounded to find the dead body of the owner. Suppose he went home and on thinking things over sent the letter to Scotland Yard with the idea that if the police got on to his tracks about the burglary, the fact that he had told us about the murder would show he had nothing to do with killing Sir Horace. That is a good theory, too, said Rolf in a meditative tone. And uh, the only person who can tell us which is the right one is Sir Horace's lady friend. The problem is to find her. Right, said the inspector approvingly. And while you have been making inquiries at the shops about the handkerchief, I have been down to the law courts branch of the equity bank where Sir Horace kept his account. It occurred to me that a look at Sir Horace's account might help us. You know the sort of man he was. You know his weakness for the ladies. But he was careful. I looked through his private papers out at Riversbrook, 
expecting to get on the track of something that would show some one had been trying to blackmail him over an entanglement with a woman. But I found nothing. I couldn't even find any feminine correspondence. If Sir Horace was in the habit of getting letters from ladies, he was also in the habit of destroying them. No doubt he adopted that precaution when his wife was alive, and found it such a wise one that he kept it up when there was less need for it. But a weakness for the ladies costs money, Rolf, as you know, and that is why I had a look at his banking account. He made some payments that it would be worth while to trace, payments to western drapers and that sort of thing. Of course, Sir Horace, being a cautious man and occupying a public position, might not care to flaunt his weakness in the eyes of western shopkeepers, and, instead of paying the accounts of his lady friend of the moment, may have given her the money and trusted to her paying the bills. A thing that women of that kind are never in a hurry to do. In that case, the payments to western shopkeepers are for good supply to his daughter. However, I've taken a note of the names, dates, and amounts of a number of them, and I want you to see the managers of these shops. We are getting close to it now, said Rolf approvingly. I think so, was the modest reply of his superior. There is one thing about Sir Horace's account which struck me as peculiar. Every four weeks for the past eight months, Sir Horace drew a cheque for twenty-four pounds, and every cheque of the kind was made payable to number 365. Now, unless he wished to hide the nature of the transaction from his bankers, why not put in the cheque in the name of the person who received the money? It couldn't have been for his personal use, for in that case he would have made the cheque payable to self. Besides, a man with a banking account doesn't draw a regular twenty-four pounds every four weeks for personal expenses. He draws a cheque just when he wants a few pounds, instead of carrying five-pound notes about with him. I asked the bank manager about these cheques, and he looked up a couple of them and found they had been cashed over the counter. So he called up the cashier, and from him I learned that Sir Horace came in and cashed them. As far as he can remember, Sir Horace cashed all these twenty-four-pound cheques. I assume he did so, because he realized that there was less likely to be comment in the bank than if a well-dressed, good-looking young lady arrived at the bank with them. This twenty-four pound a month suggests that Sir Horace had something choice and not too expensive stowed away in a flat. That is a matter on which Hill ought to be able to throw some light. If he knows anything, I'll get it out of him. It struck me as extraordinary that Sir Horace should have taken Hill into his service knowing what he was. But this apparently is the explanation. He knew that Hill wouldn't gossip about him for fear of being exposed, for that would mean that Hill would lose his situation and would find it impossible to get another one without a reference from him. We'll have Hill brought here. There was a knock at the door, and a boy in buttons entered and handed Inspector Chippenfield a card. Selden from Hampstead, he explained to Rolf. Don't go away yet. It may be something about this case. Police Inspector Selden entered the office and held the door ajar for a man behind him. He shook hands with Inspector Chippenfield and Rolf, and then motioned his companion to a chair. This is Mr. Robert Evans, the landlord of the Flower Jew Hotel, Covent Garden, he explained. He looked at Mr. Evans with the air of a police court inspector, waiting for a witness to corroborate his statement. But, as that gentleman remained silent, he sharply asked, "'Isn't that so?' "'Quite right,' said Mr. Evans, in a moist, husky voice. He was a short, fat man, with an extremely red face and bulging eyes, which wanted very much and apparently required to be constantly mopped with a handkerchief which he carried in his hand. 
this peculiarity gave mr evans the appearance of a man perpetually in mourning and this effect was heightened by a species of incipient palsy which had seized on his lower facial muscles and caused his lips to tremble violently he was bald in the front of the head but not on the top the baldness over the temples had joined hands and left isolated over the centre of the forehead a small tuft of hair which with the playfulness of second childhood showed a tendency to curl yes you're quite right he repeated huskily as though some one had doubted the statement evans is my name and i'm not ashamed of it he came to me this morning and told me that hill gave false evidence at the inquest yesterday inspector selden explained so i brought him along to see you false evidence hill exclaimed inspector chippenfield with keen interest let us hear about it well you will remember hill said he was at home on the night of the murder pursued inspector selden i looked up his depositions before i came away and what he said was this i took my daughter to the zoo in the afternoon we left the zoo at half past five and went home and had tea my wife then took the child to the picture palace and i remained at home i did not go out that night they returned about half past ten and after supper we all went to bed but evans tells me he saw hill in his bar at three o'clock on the morning of the nineteenth of august he has an early license for the accommodation of the covent garden traffic he can swear to hill a man who goes to bed at half past ten has no right to be wandering about covent garden at three a m and besides hill told us nothing about this so i brought evans along to see what you make of it inspector chippenfield had taken up a pencil and was making a few notes very interesting indeed he said then he turned to evans and asked are you sure you saw hill in your bar at three a m there is no possibility of a mistake he's the man who was knocked down outside by a porter running into him said mr evans mopping his eyes i could bring half a dozen witnesses who will swear to him you see it's this way interpolated inspector selden taking up the landlord's narrative his police court training had taught him to bring out the salient points of a story and he was naturally of the opinion that he could tell another man's story better than the man could tell it himself hill was staring about him it was probably the first time he had been to covent garden in the early morning and got knocked over he was stunned and some porters took him into the bar sat him on a form and poured some rum into him some of the porters were for ringing up the ambulance others were for carrying hill off to the hospital but he soon recovered however he sat there for about twenty minutes and after having several drinks at his own expense he went away evans served him with the drinks good said inspector chippenfield who liked the circumstantial details of the story and uh, you can get half a dozen porters to identify him bill cribb harry winch charlie brown a fellow they call green violets i don't know his real name mr evans was calling on his memory for further names but was stopped by inspector chippenfield oh that will do very well and how did you happen to be at the inquest at hampstead that is a bit out of your way mr evans mopped his eyes and inspector selden took upon himself to reply for him he has a brother-in-law in the trade at hampstead keeps uh, the three jugs in calter street evans had to go out to see his brother-in-law on business and his brother-in-law took him along to the court out of curiosity inspector chippenfield nodded rolf he said take down mr evans's statement outside and get him to sign it don't go away when you've finished i want you mr evans 
even if he felt that full justice had been done to his story by inspector selden was disappointed at the police officer's failure to do justice to his many scruples in coming forward to give evidence against a man who had never done him any harm addressing inspector chippenfield he said i don't altogether like mixing myself up in this business that isn't my way if i have a thing to say to a man i like to say to his face i don't like a man to say things behind a man's back that is if he calls himself a man but i thought over this thing after leaving the court and hearing this chap hill say he hadn't left home that night and i talked it over with my wife you did the right thing said inspector chippenfield with the emphasis of a man who had profited by the triumph of right mr evans was under the impression that the inspector's approval referred chiefly to the part he had played as a husband in talking over his perplexity with his wife rather than the part he had played as a man in revealing that hill had lied in his evidence i always do he said my wife's one of the sensible sort and when a man takes her advice he don't go far wrong she advised me to go straight to the police station and tell them all i know it's a cruel murder she said and who knows but it might be our turn next this example of the imaginative element in feminine logic made no impression on the practical official who listened to the admiring husband that is all right said inspector chippenfield soothingly i understand your scruples they do you credit but an honest man like you doesn't want to shield a criminal from justice best of all a cold-blooded murderer when rolfe returned to his superior with evans's signed statement in his hand he found the inspector preparing to leave the office put on your hat and come with me said the inspector we will go out and see mrs hill i'll frighten the truth out of her and then tackle hill he is sure to be up at riversbrook and we can go there from camden town while on the way to camden town by tube inspector chippenfield arranged his plans with the object of saving time he would interview mrs hill and while he was doing so rolfe could make inquiries at the neighboring hotels about hill it was the inspector's conviction that a man who had anything to do with the murder would require a steady supply of stimulants next day. Mrs. Hill kept a small confectionery shop adjoining a cinema theatre to supplement her husband's wages by a little earnings of her own in order to support her child. Although the shop was an unpretentious one and catered mainly for the haporth of the juvenile patrons of the picture house next door it was called the camden town confectionery emporium and the title was printed over the little shop in large letters inspector chippenfield walked into the empty shop and rapped sharply on the counter a little thin woman with prematurely gray hair and a depressed expression appeared from the back in response to the summons she started nervously as her eye encountered the police uniform but she waited to be spoken to is your name hill asked the inspector sternly mrs emily hill the woman nodded feebly her frightened eyes fixed on the inspector's face then i want a word with you continued the inspector walking through the shop into the parlor come in here and answer my questions mrs hill followed him timidly into the room he had entered it was a small shabby furnished apartment and the inspector's massive proportions made it look smaller still he took up a commanding position on the strip of drugget which did duty as a hearthrug and staring fiercely at her suddenly commenced mrs hill where was your husband on the night of the eighteenth of august when his employer sir horace fewbanks was murdered mrs hill shrank before that fierce gaze and said in a low tone please sir he was at home at home was he i'm not so sure of that tell me all about your husband's movements on that day and night what time did he come home to begin with 
"'He came home early in the afternoon to take our little girl to the zoo, "'which was a treat she had been looking forward for a long while. "'I couldn't go myself, there being the shop to look after. "'So Mr. Hill and Daphne went to the zoo, "'and after they came home and had tea, I took her to the pictures, "'while Mr. Hill minded the shop. "'It was not the picture palace next door, but the big one in High Street, "'where they were showing East Lynn.' Then, when we come home about ten o'clock, we all had supper and went to bed. And your husband didn't go out again? No, sir. When I got up in the morning to bring him a cup of tea, he was still sound asleep. But might he not have gone out in the night while you were asleep? No, sir. I'm a very light sleeper, and I awake at the least stir. Mrs. Hill's story seemed to ring true enough, although she kept her eyes fixed on her interrogator with a kind of frightened brightness. Inspector Chippenfield looked at her in silence for a few seconds. "'So that's the whole truth, is it?' he said at length. "'Yes, sir,' the woman earnestly assured him. "'You can ask Mr. Hill, and he'll tell you the same thing.' Something reminiscent in Inspector Chippenfield's mind responded to this sentence. He pondered over it for a moment, and then remembered that Hill had applied the same phrase to his wife. Evidently there had been collusion, a comparing of tales beforehand. The woman had been tutored by her cunning scoundrel of a husband, but undoubtedly her tale was false. "'The whole truth?' said the inspector again. "'Yes, sir,' answered Mrs. Hill. "'Now look here,' said the police officer, in his sternest tones, as he shook a warning finger at the little woman. "'I know you are lying. I know Hill didn't sleep in the house that night. He was seen near Riversbrook in the early part of the night, and he was seen wandering about Covent Garden after the murder had been committed.' It is no use lying to me, Mrs. Hill. If you want to save your husband from being arrested for this murder, you'll tell the truth. What time did he leave here that night? I've already told you the truth, sir, replied the little woman. He didn't leave the place after he came back from the zoo. Inspector Chippenfield was puzzled. It seemed to him that Mrs. Hill was a woman of weak character, and yet she stuck firmly to her story. Perhaps Evans had made a mistake in identifying Hill as the man who had been carried into his bar after being knocked down. Nothing was more common than mistakes of identification. His glance wandered round the room as though in search of some inspiration for his next question. His eye took mechanical note of the trumpery articles of rickety furniture, wandered over the cheap almanac prints which adorned the walls, but became riveted in the cheap overmantel which surmounted the fireplace. For, in the slip of mirror which formed the centre of that ornament, Inspector Chippenfield caught the sight of the features of Mrs. Hill, frowning and shaking her head at somebody invisible. He turned his head warily, but she was too quick for him, and her features were impassive again when he looked at her. Following the direction indicated by the mirror, Inspector Chippenfield saw Mrs. Hill had been signalling through the window which looked into the backyard. He reached it in a step and threw open the window. A small and not overclean little girl was just leaving the yard by the gate. Inspector Chippenfield called to her pleasantly, and she retraced her steps with a frightened face. "'Come in, my dear. I want you,' said the inspector, wreathing his red face into a smile. "'I'm fond of little girls.' The little girl smiled, nodded her head, and presently appeared in response to the inspector's invitation. He glanced at Mrs. Hill, noticed that her face was grey and drawn with sudden terror. She opened her mouth as though to speak, but no words came. The inspector lifted the child on to his knee. She nestled to him confidingly enough, and looked up into his face with an artless glance, 
What is your name, my dear? Daphne, sir. Daphne Hill. How old are you, Daphne? Please, sir, I'm eight next birthday. Why, you're quite a big girl, Daphne. Do you go to school? Oh, yes, sir. I'm in the second form. Do you like going to school, Daphne? Yes, sir. I suppose you like going to the zoo better. Did you like going with father the other day? The child's eyes sparkled with retrospective pleasure. Oh, yes, she said delightedly. We saw all kinds of things, lions and tigers and elephants. I had a ride on an elephant. Her eyes grew big with a memory. And he took a bun with his long nose out of my hand. That was splendid, Daphne. Which did you like best, the zoo or the pictures? I liked them both, she replied. Was father at home when you came home from the pictures? No, said the little girl innocently. He was out. Mrs. Hill, standing a little way off with fear on her face, uttered an inarticulate noise and took a step towards the inspector and her daughter. Better not interfere, Mrs. Hill, unless you want to make matters worse, said the inspector meaningly. Now tell me, Daphne, dear, when did your father come home? Not till the morning, replied the little girl with a timid glance at her mother. How do you know that? Because I slept in mother's bed that night with mother, like I always do when father is away. But father came home in the morning and lifted me into my own bed, because he said he wanted to go to bed. What time was that, Daphne? I don't know, sir. It was light, Daphne. You could see. Oh, yes, sir. Inspector Chippenfield told the child she was a good girl, and gave her sixpence. The little one slipped off his knee and ran across to her mother, with delight, to show her the coin, all unconscious that she had betrayed her father. The mother pushed the child from her with a heartbroken gesture. A heavy step was heard in the shop, and the inspector, looking through the window, saw Rolf. He opened the door leading from the shop and beckoned his subordinate in. Rolf was excited and looked like a man burdened with weighty news. He whispered a word in Inspector Chippenfield's ear. Let's go into the shop, said Inspector Chippenfield promptly. But first I'll make things safe here. He locked the door leading to the kitchen, put the key into his pocket, and followed his colleague into the shop. Now, Rolf, what is it? I've found out that Hill put in nearly the whole day after the murder, drinking in a wine tavern. He sat there like a man in a dream and spoke to nobody. The only thing he took any interest in was the evening papers. He bought about a dozen of them during the afternoon. Where was this? asked the inspector. At a little wine tavern in High Street, where he's never been seen before. The man who keeps the place gave me a good description of him, though. Hill went there about ten o'clock in the morning and started drinking port wine, and as fast as the evening papers came out, he sent the boy out for them, glanced through them, and then crumpled them up. He stayed there till after five o'clock. By that time, the 6.30 editions would reach Camden Town, and, if you remember, it was the 6.30 editions which had the first news of the murder. The tavern keeper declares that Hill drank nearly two bottles of Tarragona port in threepenny glasses during the day. I should have credited Hill with a better taste in port, with his opportunities as Sir Horace Fewbanks' butler, said the inspector Chippenfield dryly. What you have found out, Rolf, only goes to bear out my own discovery that Hill is deeply implicated in this affair. I have found out for my part that Hill did not spend the night of the murder at home here. There was a ring of triumph in Inspector Chippenfield's voice as he announced this discovery, but before Rolf could make any comment upon it, there was a quick step behind them, and both men turned to see Hill. The butler was astonished at finding the two police officers in his wife's shop. He hesitated, and apparently his first impulse was to turn into the street again. But, realizing the futility of such a course, 
He came forward with an attempt to smooth his worried face into a conciliatory smile. "'Hill,' said Inspector Chippenfield sternly, "'once and for all, will you own up where you were on the night of the murder?' Hill started slightly. Then, with admirable self-command, he recovered himself and became as tight-lipped and reticent as ever. "'I've already told you, sir,' he replied smoothly. "'I spent it in my own home. "'If you ask my wife, sir, she'll tell you "'I never stirred out of the house "'after I came back from taking my little girl to the zoo.' "'I know she will, you scoundrel!' burst out the choleric inspector. "'She's been well tutored by you, "'and she tells the tale very well. "'But it is no good, Hill.' You forgot to tutor your little daughter, and she's innocently put you away. What's more, you were seen in London before daybreak the night after the murder. The game's up, my man. Inspector Chippenfield produced a pair of handcuffs as he spoke. Hill passed his tongue over his dry lips before he was able to speak. Don't put them on me, he said imploringly, as Inspector Chippenfield advanced towards him. I'll... I'll confess. End of chapter 10 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Read by Lars Rolander. Chapter 11 of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and arthur reads chapter eleven inspector chippenfield's first words were a warning you know what you are saying hill he asked you know what this means any statement you make may be used in evidence against you at your trial i'll tell you everything faltered hill the impassive mask of the well-trained English servant had dropped from him, and he stood revealed as a trembling elderly man with furtive eyes and painfully shaken manner. "'I'll be glad to tell you everything,' he declared, laying a twitching hand on the inspector's coat. "'I've not had a minute's peace of rest since, since it happened.' The dry official manner in which Inspector Chippenfield produced a notebook was in striking contrast to the trapped man's attitude. "'Go ahead,' he commanded, wetting his pencil between his lips. Before Hill could respond, a small boy entered the shop, a ragged, shock-headed, dirty urchin, bareheaded and barefooted. He tapped loudly on the counter with a halfpenny. "'What do you want, boy?' roughly asked the inspector a porth of black boys responded the child in a confident tone of a regular customer if you'll permit me sir i'll serve him said hill and he glided behind the little counter took some black sticky sweetmeats from one of the glass jars on the shelf and gave them to the boy who popped one in his mouth and scurried off "'I think we had better go inside and hear what Hill has to say, Inspector, while Mrs. Hill minds the shop,' said Rolfe. He had caught a glimpse of Mrs. Hill's white, frightened face peering through the dirty little glass pane in the parlour door. Inspector Chippenfield approved of the idea. "'We don't want to spoil your wife's business, Hill. She's likely to need it,' he said, with cruel official banter. "'Come here, Mrs. Hill,' he said, raising his voice. The faded little woman appeared in response to the summons, bringing the child with her. She shot a frightened glance at her husband, which Inspector Chippenfield intercepted. 
"'Never mind looking at your husband, Mrs. Hill,' he said roughly. "'You've done your best for him, and the only thing to be told now is the truth. Now you and your daughter can stay in the shop. We want your husband inside.' Mrs. Hill clasped her hands quickly. "'Oh, what is it, Henry?' she said. "'Tell me what has happened. What have they found out?' "'Keep your mouth shut,' commanded her husband harshly. "'This way, sir, if you please.' Inspector Chippenfield and Rolf followed him into the parlour. "'Now, Hill,' impatiently said the Inspector Chippenfield. The butler raised his head wearily. "'I suppose I may well begin at the beginning and tell you everything,' he said. "'Yes,' replied the inspector. "'It is not much use keeping anything back now.' "'Oh, it's not a case of keeping anything back,' replied Hill. "'You're too clever for me, and I've made up my mind to tell you everything. But I thought I might be able to cut the first part short so as to save your time.' but so that you'll understand everything i've got to go a long way back shortly after i entered sir horace fewbanks service in fact i hadn't been long with him before i began to see he was leading a strange life a double life if i may say so a servant in a gentleman's house particularly one in my position sees a good deal he's not meant to see in fact, he couldn't close his eyes to it if he wanted to, as no doubt you, from your experience, sir, know very well. A confidential servant sees and hears a lot of things, sir. Inspector Chippenfield nodded his head sharply, but he did not speak. I think Sir Horace trusted me to, continued Hill humbly, more than he would have trusted most servants on account of my, my past. I fancy, if I may so, so that he counted on my gratitude because he had given me a fresh start in life. And he was quite right. At first, Hill dropped his voice and looked down as he uttered the last two words. I'd have done anything for him. But as I was saying, sir, I hadn't been long in his house before I found out that he had a, a weakness. Hill timidly bowed his head, as though apologizing to the dead judge for assailing his character. A weakness for... for the ladies. Sometimes Sir Horace went off for the weekend without saying where he was going, and sometimes he went out late at night and didn't return till after breakfast. Then he had ladies visiting him at Riversbrook. Not real ladies, if you understand, sir. Sometimes there was a small party of them, and then they made a noise singing music hall songs and drinking wine, but generally they came alone. Towards the end there was one who came a lot oftener than the others. I found out afterwards that her name was Fanning, Doris Fanning. She was a very pretty young woman, and Sir Horace seemed very fond of her. I knew that because I've heard him talking to her in the library. Sir Horace had a rather loud voice, and I couldn't help overhearing him sometimes when I took things to his rooms. One night, it was before Sir Horace left for Scotland, a rainy, gusty night, this young woman came. I forgot to mention that when Sir Horace expected visitors, he used to tell me to send the servants to bed early. He told me to do so this night, saying as usual, "'You understand, Hill?' And I replied, "'Yes, Sir Horace.' The young woman came about half-past ten o'clock, and I let her in the side door and showed her up to the library on the first floor, where he used to sit and work and read. Half an hour afterwards I took up some refreshments, some sandwiches and a small bottle of champagne for the young lady, and then went back downstairs to Sir Horace rang for me to let the lady out, which was generally about midnight. But this night I'd hardly been downstairs more than a quarter of an hour when I heard a loud crash, followed by a sort of scream. 
before i could get out of my chair to go upstairs i heard the study door open and sir horace called out hill come here i went upstairs as quick as i could and the door of the study being wide open i could see inside sir horace and the young lady had evidently been having a quarrel they were standing up facing each other and the table at which they had been sitting was knocked over and the refreshments i had taken up had been scattered all about the young woman had been crying i could see that at a glance but sir horace looked dignified and the perfect gentleman like he always was he turned to me when he saw me and said hill kindly show this young lady out i bowed and waited for her to follow me which she did after giving sir horace an angry look i let her out the same way as i let her in and took her through the plantation to the front gate which i locked after her when i got inside the house again and was beginning to bolt up things for the night sir horace called me again and i went upstairs hill he said in the same calm and collected voice if that young lady calls again you are to deny her admittance that is all hill and he turned back into his room again i didn't see her again until the morning after sir horace left for scotland i had arranged for the female servants to go to sir horace's estate in the country during his absence as he instructed before his departure and they and i were very busy on this morning getting the house in order to be closed up putting covers on the furniture and locking up the valuables it was sir horace's custom to have this done when he was away every year instead of keeping the servants idling about the house on board wages and the house was then left in my charge as i told you sir and after the servants went to the country it was my custom to live at home till sir horace returned coming over two or three times a week to look over the place and make sure that, that everything was all right on this morning sir after superintending the servants clearing up things i went outside the house to have a final look round and to see that the locks of the front and back gates were in good working order i was going to the back first sir but happening to glance about me as i walked round the house i saw the young woman that sir horace had ordered me to show out of the house the night before he went to scotland peering out from behind one of the fir trees of the plantation in front of the house as soon as she saw that i saw her she beckoned to me i would not have taken any notice of her only i didn't want the women servants to see her sir horace i knew would not have liked that so i went across to her i asked her what she wanted and i told her it was no use her wanting to see sir horace for he had gone to scotland i don't want to see him she said as impudent as brass it's you i want to see field or hill or whatever you call yourself now it gave me quite a turn i, sh I assure you to find that this young wo woman knew my secret and i turned round apprehensive like to make sure that none of the servants had heard her she noticed me and she laughed it's all right hill she said i'm not going to tell on you i've just brought you a message from an old friend fred birchill he wants to see you to-night at this address and with that she put a bit of paper into my hand i was so upset and excited that i said i'd be there and she went away this fred birchill was a man i'd met in prison and he was in the cell next to me how he'd got on my tracks i had no idea but i seemed to see all my new life fall into pieces now he knew i tried to run straight since i served my sentence and i knew sir horace would stand to me but he couldn't afford to have any scandal about it and i knew that if there was any possibility of my past becoming known i should have to leave his employ and then there was my poor wife and child and this little business sir nothing was known about my past here so i determined to go and see this birchill sir the address she had given me was in westminster and as my time was practically my own when sir horace wasn't home i went down that same evening 
and when i got up the flight of stairs and knocked at the door it was a woman's voice that said come in i thought i recognized the voice when i opened the door you can imagine my surprise when i saw the young woman to be doris fanning who had had the quarrel with sir horace that night and had brought me the note that morning birchill was sitting in a corner of the room with his feet on another chair smoking a pipe come in number twenty one he says with an unpleasant smile come in and see an old friend put a chair for him doris and leave the room the girl did so and as soon as the door was closed behind her birchill turned round to me and burst out hell that damned employee of yours has showed me a nasty trick but i'm going to get even with him and you're going to help me i was taken back at his words but i wanted to hear more before i spoke then he told me that the young woman i had seen had been brutally treated by sir horace she had been living in a little flat in westminster on a monthly allowance which sir horace made her but he'd suddenly cut off her allowance and she'd have to be turned out in the street to starve because she couldn't pay her rent a nice thing said birchill fiercely for this high-placed loose liver to carry on like this with a poor innocent girl whose only fault was that she loved him too well if i could show him up and pull him down i would but i've done time like you hill he was the judge who sentenced me and if i tried to injure him that way my word would carry no weight but i'll put up a job on him that'll make him sorry for the longest day he lives and you'll help me sir horace is in scotland and you're in charge of his place get rid of the servants hill and we'll burgle his house we can easily do it between us at this stage of his narrative hill stopped and looked anxiously at his audience as though to gather some idea of their feelings before he proceeded further but inspector chippenfield with a fierce stare merely remarked and you consented i didn't at first hill retorted earnestly but when i refused he threatened me threatened that he'd expose me and drag me and my wife and child down to poverty i pleaded with him but it was of no use and at last i had to consent i had some hope that in doing so i might find an opportunity to warn sir horace but birchill did not give me a chance he insisted that the burglary should take place without delay all i was to do was to give him a plan of the house explain where to find most valuable articles that had been left there and wait for him at the flat while he commented the burglary his idea in making me wait for him at the flat was to make sure that i didn't play him false put the double on him as he called it and he told the girl not to let me out of her sight till he came back if anything went wrong i should have to pay for it when he came back in accordance with sir horace's instructions i sent the servants off to his country estate it had been arranged that birchill was to wait for me to come over to the flat on the eighteenth of august the night fixed for the burglary but about seven o'clock while i was at riversbrook i heard the noise of wheels outside and looking out i saw to my dismay sir horace getting out of a taxicab with a suitcase in his hand my first impulse was to tell me everything indeed i think that if i had had a chance i would have but he came in looking very severe and without saying a word about why he had returned from scotland said very sharply hill have the servants been sent down to the country as i directed i told him that they had very good he said then you go away at once i won't want you any more i want the house to myself to-night sir horace i began trembling a little but he stopped me go immediately he said don't stand there and he said it in such a tone that i was glad to go there was something in his look that frightened me that night i got across to birchill's place and found him and the girl waiting for me i told him what had happened and begged him to give up the idea of the burglary but he'd been drinking heavily and was in a nasty mood 
First he said I'd been playing him false and had warned Sir Horace. But when I assured him that I hadn't, he insisted on going to commit the burglary just the same. With that he pulled out a revolver from his pocket and swore with an oath that he'd put a bullet through me when he came back if I'd played him false and put Sir Horace on his guard and that he'd put a bullet in the old scoundrel, meaning Sir Horace, if he interrupted him while he was robbing the house. He sat there, cursing and drinking till he fell asleep, with his head on the table, snoring. I sat there not daring to breathe, hoping he'd sleep till morning. But Miss Fanning woke him up about nine, and he staggered to his feet to get out, with his revolver stuck in his coat pocket. He was away over three hours, and the girl and I sat there without saying a word, just looking at each other and waiting for a clock on the mantelpiece to chime the quarters. It was a cuckoo clock, and it had just chimed twelve when we heard a quick step coming upstairs to the flat. The girl fixed her big dark eyes inquiringly on me, and then we heard a hoarse whisper through the keyhole, telling us to open the door. The girl ran to the door and let him in, but she shrieked at the sight of him when she saw him in the light, for he looked ghastly, and there was a spot of blood on his face, and his hands were smeared with it. He was shaking all over, and he went to the whiskey bottle and drained the drop of spirit he'd left in it. Then he turned to us and said, "'Sir Horace Fewbanks is dead, murdered.' I suppose he read what he saw in our eyes, for he burst out angrily. "'Don't stand there staring at me like a pair of damned fools. You don't think I did it. As God's my judge, I never did it. He was dead and stiff when I got there.' Then he told us his story of what had happened. He said that when he got to Riversbrook there was a light in the library, and he got over the fence and hid himself in the garden. Then he noticed that there was a light in the hall, and that the hall door was open. He thought Sir Horace had left it open by mistake, and he was going to creep into the house and hide himself there till after Sir Horace went to bed. But suddenly the light in the library went out, and Birchill again hid behind a tree for he thought Sir Horace was retiring for the night. Then the light in the hall went out, and immediately after Birchill heard the hall door being closed. Then he heard a step on the gravel path, and saw a woman walking quickly down the path to the gate. She was a well-dressed woman, and Birchill naturally thought that she was one of Sir Horace's lady friends, but he thought it odd that Sir Horace, who was always a very polite gentleman to the ladies, should not have shown her off the premises. He waited in the garden about half an hour, and as everything in the house seemed quite still, he made his way to a side window and forced it open. He had an electric torch with him, and he used this to find his way about the house. First of all, he wanted to find out in which room Sir Horace was sleeping, and he knew from the plan he'd made me draw for him which was Sir Horace's bedroom. So he went there and opened the door quietly and listened but he could not hear anyone breathing. Then he tried some of the other rooms and turned on his torch, but could see no one. He thought that perhaps Sir Horace had fallen asleep in a chair in the library, and he went there. He listened at the door, but could hear no sound. Then he turned on his torch, and by its light he saw a dreadful sight. Sir Horace was lying huddled up near the desk, dead, just dead, he thought because there were little bubbles of blood on his lips as if they had been blown there when breathing his last. He didn't wait to see any more, but he turned and ran out of the house. I didn't believe his story, though Miss Fanning did, but he stuck to it and seemed so frightened that I thought there might be something in it till he brought out that he'd lost his revolver somewhere. Then I remember the horrid threats he used against Sir Horace, and I was convinced that he had committed the murder. But of course I dared not let him think I suspected him, and I pretended to console him. But the feeling that kept running through my head was that both of us would be suspected of the murder. I told this to Birchill, and that frightened him still more. "'What are we to do?' he kept saying. We shall both be hanged. Then after a while we recovered ourselves a bit and began to look at it from a more common-sense point of view. 
Nobody knew about Birch's visit to the house except our two selves and the girl, and there was no reason why anybody should suspect us as long as we kept that knowledge to ourselves. Birch's idea after we talked this over was that I should go quietly home to bed and pay a visit to Riversbrook on Friday as usual, discover Sir Horace Fewbanks' body, and then tell the police. But I didn't like to do that for two reasons. I didn't think that my nerves would be in a fit state to tell the police how I found the body without betraying to them that I knew something about it and I couldn't bear to think of Sir Horace's body lying neglected all alone in that empty house till the following day, though I kept that reason to myself. It was the girl who hit on the idea of sending a letter to the police. She said that it would be the best thing to do, because if they were informed and went to the house and discovered the body, it wouldn't be so difficult for me to face them afterwards. I agreed to that, and so did Birchill, who was very frightened in case I might give anything away, and consented on that account. The girl showed us how to write the letter, too. She said she'd often heard of anonymous letters being written that way, and she brought out three different pens and a bottle of ink and a, a writing pad. After we'd agreed to write, she showed us how to do it, each one printing a letter on the paper in turn and using a different pen each time. "'You took care to leave no fingerprints,' said Inspector Chippenfield. Oh, "'We used a handkerchief to wrap our hands in,' said Hill. "'Birchill got tired of passing the paper from one to another and wrote all his letters, leaving spaces for the girl and me to write in ours.' When the letter was written, we wrote the address on the envelope the same way and stamped it. Then I went out and posted the letter in a pillar-box. "'At Covent Gardener?' suggested Inspector Chippenfield. "'Yes, at Covent Garden,' said Sill. "'When I got home, my wife was awake and in a terrible fright. She wanted to know what I'd been, but I didn't tell her.' I told her, though, that my very life depended on nobody knowing I'd been out of my own home that night, and I made her swear that no matter who questioned her, she'd stick to the story that I'd been at home all night and in bed. She begged me to tell her why, and as I knew that she'd have to be told the next day, I told her that Sir Horace Fewbanks had been murdered. She buried her face in a pillow with a moan. But when I took an oath that I had had no hand in it, she recovered and promised not to tell a living soul that I had been out of the house, and I knew I could depend on her. Next morning, as soon as I got up, I hurried off to a little wine tavern and asked to see the morning papers. It was a foolish thing to do, because I might have known that nothing could have been discovered in time to get into the morning papers, for I hadn't posted the letter until near four, for I hadn't posted the letter until nearly four o'clock. But I was all nervous and upset, and as I couldn't face my wife or settle to anything until I knew the police had got the letter and found the body, I though a strictly temperate man in the ordinary course of life, sir, sat down in one of the little compartments of the place and ordered a glass of wine to pass the time till the first editions of the evening papers came out. They are usually here about noon, but there was no news in the first editions, and so I stayed there drinking port wine and buying the papers as fast as they came out, but it was not till the 6.30 editions came out late in the afternoon that the papers had news. I hurried home then and went up to Riversbrook and reported myself to you, sir. As Hill finished his story, he buried his face in his hands and bowed his head on the table in an attitude of utter dejection. Rolf, looking at him, wondered if he were acting a part or if he had really told the truth. He looked at Inspector Chippenfield to see how he regarded the confession, but his superior officer was busily writing in his notebook. 
In a few moments, however, he put the pocket-book down on the table and turned to the butler. "'Sit up, man,' he commanded sternly. "'I want to ask you some questions.' Hill raised a haggard face. "'Yes, sir,' he said with what seemed to be a painful effort. "'What is this girl fanning like?' "'Rather a showy piece of goods, if I may say so, sir. "'She has big black eyes and black hair and small regular teeth.' "'And Sir Horace had been keeping her?' "'I think so, sir.' "'And a fourth night before Sir Horace left for Scotland there was a quarrel. "'Sir Horace cast her off.' "'That is what it looked like to me,' said the butler." "'What was the cause of the quarrel?' "'That I don't know, sir.' "'Didn't Birchill tell you?' "'Well, not in so many words. "'But I gathered from things he dropped "'that Sir Horace had found out "'that he was a friend of Miss Fanning's "'and didn't like it.' "'Naturally,' said the philosophic police official. "'Is Birchill still at this flat, and is the girl still there?' "'The last I heard of them they were, sir. "'Of course they had been talking of moving "'after Sir Horace stopped all the allowance.' "'Well, Hill, I'll investigate this story of yours,' "'said the inspector, as he rose to his feet "'and placed his notebook in his pocket. "'If it is true,' If you have given us all the assistance in your power, and have kept nothing back, I'll do my best for you. Of course you realize that you are in a very serious position. I don't want to arrest you unless I have to, but I must detain you while I investigate what you have told us. You will come up with us to the Camden Town Station, and then your statement will be taken down fully. I'll give you three minutes in which to explain things to your wife. End of chapter 11 of The Hampstead Mystery By John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 12 of The Hampstead Mystery This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 12 "'Do you think Hill's story is true?' Rolf asked Inspector Chippenfield, as they left Camden Town Police Station and turned in the direction of the tube station. "'We'll soon find out,' replied the inspector. "'Of course there is something in it, but there is no doubt Hill will not stick at a lie to save his own skin. But we are more likely to get at the truth by threatening to arrest him than by arresting him.' If he were arrested, he would probably shut up and say no more. And uh, are you going to arrest Birchill? Yes. For the murder? asked Rolf. No, for burglary. It would be a mistake to charge him with murder until we get more evidence. The papers would jeer at us if we charged him with murder and then dropped the charge. "'Do you think Birchill will squeak?' "'On Hill?' said the inspector. "'When he knows that Hill has been trying to fit him for the murder, "'he'll try to do as much for Hill. "'And between them we'll come at the truth. "'We are on the right track at last, my boy. "'And thank God we have beaten our friend Crewe. Inspector Chippenfield's satisfaction in his impending triumph of a crew was increased by a chance meeting with the detective. 
as the two police officials came out of leicester square station on their way to scotland yard to obtain a warrant for birchill's arrest they saw crewe in a taxicab crewe also saw them and telling the driver to pull up leaned out of the window and looked back at the two detectives when they came up with the taxicab they saw that crewe had on a light overcoat and that there was a suitcase beside the driver crewe was going on a journey of some kind anything fresh about the riverbrook case he asked no nothing fresh replied inspector chippenfield looking crewe straight in the face you are a long time in making an arrest said crewe in a bantering tone we want to arrest the right man was the reply there is nothing like getting the right man to start with it saves such a lot of time and trouble where are you off to i'm taking a run down to scotland the inspector glanced at crewe rather enviously you are fortunate in being able to enjoy yourself just now he said meaningly i won't drop work altogether remarked crewe i'll make a few inquiries there about the riversbrook affair yes with the murderer practically arrested inspector chippenfield permitted himself the luxury of smiling at the way in which crewe was following up a false scent i thought the murder was committed in london not in scotland he said wrong chippenfield said crewe with a smile sir horace was murdered in scotland and his body was brought up to london by train and placed in his own house in order to mislead the police good-bye as the taxicab drove off inspector chippenfield turned to his subordinate and said we'll rub it into him when he comes back and finds that we've got our man under lock and key he's on some wild goose chase scotland he might as well go to siberia while he's about it with a warrant in his pocket inspector chippenfield accompanied by rolf set out for macaulay mansions westminster they found the mansions to be situated in a quiet and superior part of westminster not far from victoria station and consisting of a large block of flats overlooking a square a pocket handkerchief patch of green which was supposed to serve as breathing space for the flats which surrounded it macaulay mansions had no lift and number forty three the scene of the events of hill's confession was on the top floor inspector chippenfield and rolfe mounted the stairs steadily and finally found themselves standing on a neat coconut door mat outside the door of number forty three the door was closed well well said the inspector as he paused panting on the door mat and rang the bell snug quarters these very snug strange that these sort of women never know enough to run straight when they are well off the door opened and a young woman confronted them she was hardly more than a girl pretty and refined looking with large dark eyes a pathetic drooping mouth and a wistful expression she wore a well-made indoor dress of soft satin without ornaments and her luxuriant dark hair was simply and becomingly coiled at the back of her head she held a book in her left hand with one finger between the leaves as though the summons to the door had interrupted her reading and glanced inquiringly at the visitors waiting for them to intimate their business she was so different from the type of girl they had expected to see that inspector chippenfield had some difficulty in announcing it are you miss fanning he asked yes she replied then you are the young woman we wish to see and with your permission we'll come inside said inspector chippenfield recovering from his first surprise and speaking briskly they followed the girl into the hall and into a room off the hall to which she led the way 
A small Pomeranian dog, which lay on an easy chair, sprang up, barking shrilly at their entrance. But at the command of the girl it settled down on its silk cushion again. The apartment was a small sitting-room, daintily furnished in excellent feminine taste. Both police officers took in the contents of the room with the glance of trained observers, and both noticed that, prominent among the ornaments on the mantelpiece, stood a photograph of the late Sir Horace Fewbanks in a handsome silver frame. The photograph made it easy for Inspector Chippenfield to enter upon the object of the visit of himself and his subordinate to the flat. "'I see you have a photograph of Sir Horace Fewbanks there,' he said in what he intended to be an easy conversational tone, waving his hand towards the mantelpiece. The wistful expression of the girl's face deepened as she followed his glance. Yes, she said simply. It is so terrible about him. Was he a... a relative of yours? asked the inspector. She had come to the conclusion they were police officers, and that they were aware of the position she occupied. He was very kind to me, she replied. When did you see him last? How long before he... before he died? Are you detectives? she asked. From Scotland Yard, replied Inspector Chippenfield with a bow. Why have you come here? Do you think that I... that I know anything about the murder? Not in the least. The inspector's tone was reassuring. We merely want information about Sir Horace's movements prior to his departure for Scotland. When did you see him last? I don't remember, she said after a pause. You must try, said the inspector in a tone which contained a suggestion of command. Oh, uh, a few days before he went away. A few days, repeated the inspector. "'And you parted on good terms?' "'Yes, on very good terms,' she met his glance frankly. Inspector Chippenfield was silent for a moment. Then, fixing his fiercest stare on the girl, he remarked abruptly, "'Where's Birchill?' "'Birchill?' She endeavoured to appear surprised, but her sudden pallor betrayed her inward anxiety at the question. "'I—' I don't know what you mean. I mean the man you've been keeping with Sir Horace Fewbanks' money, said the inspector brutally. I've been keeping nobody with Sir Horace Fewbanks' money, protested the girl feebly. It's cruel of you to insult me. That'll about do to go on with, said Inspector Chippenfield, with a sudden change of tone, rising to his feet as he spoke. Rolf. Keep an eye on her while I search the flat. Rolf crossed over from where he had been sitting and stood beside the girl. She glanced up at him wildly, with terror dawning in the depth of her dark eyes. What do you mean? How dare you? she cried in an effort to be indignant. Now, don't try your tragedy airs on us, said the inspector. We've no time for them. If you won't tell the truth, you had better say nothing at all. He plunged his hand into a jardiniere and withdrew a briarwood pipe. This looks to me like Birchill's property. Keep that dog back, Rolf. The little dog had sprung off his cushion and was eagerly following the inspector out of the room. Rolf caught up the animal in his arms and returned to where the girl was sitting. Her face was white and strained, and her big dark eyes followed Inspector Chippenfield, but she did not speak. The inspector tramped noisily into the little hall, leaving the door of the room wide open. Rolf and the girl saw him fling open the door of another room, a bedroom, and stride into it. He came out again shortly, and went down the hall to the rear of the flat. 
A few minutes later he came back to the room where he had left Rolfe and the girl. His knees were dusty, and some feathers were adhering to his jacket, as though he had been plunging in odd nooks and corners, and beneath beds. He was hot, flurried, and out of temper. "'The bird's flown,' were his first words addressed to Rolfe. "'I've hunted high and low, while I cannot find a sign of him. It beats me how he's managed it. He couldn't have gone out the front way without my seeing him go past the door, and the back windows are four stories high from the ground.' "'Perhaps he wasn't here when we came in,' suggested Rolfe. "'Oh, yes, he was. Why, he'd been smoking that pipe in this very room. She was clever enough to open the window to let out the tobacco smoke before she left us in. But she didn't hide the pipe properly, for I saw the smoke from it coming out of the jardinière. And when I put my hand on the bowl, it was hot. Feel it now.' Rolf placed his hand on the pipe which Inspector Chippenfield had deposited on the table. The bowl was still warm, indicating that the pipe had recently been alight. "'He must have been smoking the pipe when we knocked at the door and dashed away to hide before she let us in,' grumbled the inspector. "'But the question is, where can he have got to? I've hunted everywhere, and there's no way out except by the front door, so far as I can see. Go and have a look yourself, Rolf, and see if you can find a trace of him. I'll watch the girl. Rolf put down the little dog he had been holding, and went out into the hall. The dog accompanied him, frisking about him in a friendly fashion. Rolf first examined the bedroom that he had seen Inspector Chippenfield enter. It was a small room containing a double bed. It was prettily furnished in white, with white curtains and toilet table articles in ivory to match. A glance round the room convinced Rolf that it was impossible for a man to secrete himself in it. The door of the wardrobe had been flung open by the inspector and the dresses and other articles of feminine apparel it contained flung out on the floor. There was no other hiding-place possible, except beneath the bed, and the ruthless hand of the inspector had torn off the white muslin bed hangings, revealing emptiness underneath. Rolf went out into the hall again, and entered the room next the bedroom. This apartment was apparently used as a dining-room, for it contained a large table, a few chairs, a small sideboard, a spirit-stand, a case of books and ornaments, and two small oak-presses. Plainly, there was no place in it where a man could hide himself. The next room was the bathroom, which was also empty. Opposite the bathroom was a small bedroom, very barely furnished, offering no possibility of concealment. Then the passage opened into a large, roomy kitchen, the full width of the rooms on both sides of the hall, and the kitchen completed the flat. Rolf glanced keenly around the kitchen. There were no cooking appliances visible, or pots or pans, but there was much lumber and odds and ends as though the place were used as a storeroom. Presumably, Miss Fanning obtained her meals from the restaurant on the ground floor of the mansions, and had no use for a kitchen. The room was dirty and dusty, and crowded with all kinds of rubbish. But the miscellaneous rubbish stored in the room offered no hiding place for a man. Rolf nevertheless made a conscientious search, shifting the lumber about and ferreting into dark corners without result. Finally he crossed the room to look out of the window, which had been left open, no doubt, by Inspector Chippenfield. The mansions in which the flat was situated formed part of a large building with back windows overlooking a small piece of ground. The flat was on the fourth story. Rolf looked around the neighboring roofs and down onto the ground fifty feet below, but could see nothing. He withdrew his head and was turning to leave the room when his attention was attracted by the peculiar behavior of the dog. 
which had followed him throughout on his search. The little animal, after sniffing about the floor, ran to the open window and started whining and jumping up at it. Rolf quickly returned to the window and looked out. "'Why, of course,' he muttered. "'How could I have overlooked it? "'Inspector!' he called aloud. "'Come here!' Inspector Chippenfield appeared in the kitchen in a state of some excitement at the summons. He carried the key of the front room in his hand, having taken the precaution to lock Miss Fanning in before he responded to the call of his colleague. "'What is it, Rolf?' he asked eagerly. "'This dog has tracked him to the window, so he's evidently escaped that way,' explained Rolf briefly. He's climbed along the window ledge. Inspector Chippenfield approached the window and looked out. A broad window ledge immediately beneath the window ran the whole length of the building beneath the windows on the fourth floor, and so far as could be seen continued round the side of the house. It was a dizzy, but not a difficult feat for a man of cool head to walk along the ledge to the corner of the house. "'I wonder where that infernal ledge goes to,' said Inspector Chippenfield, vainly twisting his neck and protruding his body through the window to a dangerous extent to see round the corner of the building. "'I dare say it leads to the water-pipe, and the scoundrel, knowing that, has been able to get round, shin down, and get clear away.' "'I'll soon find out,' said Rolf. "'I'll walk along to the corner and see.' "'Do you think you can do it, Rolf?' asked the inspector nervously. "'If you fell!' he glanced down to the ground far below with a shudder. "'Nonsense!' laughed Rolf. "'I won't fall. Why, the ledge is a foot broad, and I've got a steady head. He may not have got very far after all, and I may be able to see him from the corner.' He got out of the window as he spoke and started to walk carefully along the ledge towards the corner of the building. He reached it safely, peered round, screwed himself round sharply, and came back to the open window, almost at a run. "'You're right!' he gasped as he sprang through. "'I saw him. He is climbing down the spouting, using the chimney brickwork as a brace for his feet. If we get downstairs, we may catch him.' He was out of the kitchen in an instant, up the passage, and racing down the steps at a time before the inspector had recovered from his surprise. Then he followed as quickly as he could, but Rolf had a long start of him. When Inspector Chippenfield reached the ground floor, Rolf was nowhere in sight. The inspector looked up and down the street, wondering what had become of him. At that instant a tall young man, bareheaded and coatless, came running out of an alleyway, pursued by Rolf. "'Stop him!' cried Rolf to his superior officer. Inspector Chippenfield stepped quickly out into the street in front of the fugitive. The young man canooned into the burly officer before he could stop himself, and the inspector clutched him fast. He attempted to wrench himself free but Rolf had rushed to his superior's assistance and drew the baton with which he had provided himself when he set out from Scotland Yard. "'You needn't bother about using that thing,' said the young man contemptuously. "'I'm not a fool. I realize you've got me.' "'We'll not give you another chance,' Inspector Chippenfield dexterously snapped a pair of handcuffs on the young man's wrist." "'What are these for?' said the captive, regarding them sullenly. "'You'll know soon enough when we get you upstairs,' replied the inspector. "'Now then, up you go.' They reascended the stairs in silence, Inspector Chippenfield and Rolf walking on each side of their prisoner, holding him by the arms, in case he tried to make another bolt. They reached the flat and found the front door open, as they had left it. The inspector entered the hall and unlocked the drawing-room door. 
The girl was sitting on the chair where they had left her, with her head bowed down in an attitude of the deepest dejection. She straightened herself suddenly as they entered, and launched a terrified glance at the young man. "'Oh, Fred!' she gasped. "'They were too good for me, Doris,' he responded, as though in reply to her unspoken query. "'I would have got away from this chap,' he indicated Rolf with a nod of his head. "'But I ran into the other one.' He stooped as he spoke to brush with his manacled hands some of the dirt from his clothes, which he had doubtless gained in his perilous climb down the side of the house, and then straightened himself to look loweringly at his captors. He was a tall, slender young fellow of about twenty-five or twenty-six, clean-shaven, with a fresh complexion and a rather effeminate air. He was well dressed in a grey lounge suit, a soft shirt with a high double collar and silk necktie. He looked, as he stood there, more like a dandified city clerk than the desperate criminal suggested by Hill's confession. "'Come on, what's the charge?' he demanded insolently, with a slight glance at his manacled hands. "'Is your name Frederick Birchill?' asked Inspector Chippenfield. The young man nodded. "'Then, Frederick Birchill, you're charged with burglariously entering the house of Sir Horace Fewbanks at Hempstead on the night of the 18th of August.' "'Burglary?' said Birchill. "'Anything else?' "'That will do for the present,' replied the inspector. We may find it necessary to charge you with a more serious crime later. Well, all I can say is that you've got the wrong man. But that is nothing new for you chaps, he added with a sneer. Surely you're not going to charge him with the murder, said the girl imploringly. The inspector's reply was merely to warn the prisoner that anything he said might be used in evidence against him at his trial. "'He had nothing whatever to do with it. He knows nothing about it,' protested the girl. "'If you let him go, I'll tell you who murdered Sir Horace.' "'Who murdered him?' asked the inspector. "'Hill,' was the reply. End of chapter 12 of the Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Read by Lars Rolander. Chapter Thirteen of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Chapter 13 Doris Fanning got off a Holborn tram at King's Cross, and, with a hasty glance around her as if to make sure she was not followed, walked at a rapid pace across the street in the direction of Caledonian Road. She walked up that busy thoroughfare at the same quick gait for some minutes, then turned into a narrow street, and, with another suspicious look around her, stopped at the doorway of a small shop a short distance down. The shop sold those nondescript goods which seemed to afford a living to a not inconsiderable class of London's small shopkeepers. The windows and the shelves were full of dusty old books and magazines, trumpery curious and cheap china, second-hand furniture, and a collection of miscellaneous odds and ends. A thick dust lay over the whole collection and the shop and its contents presented a deserted and dirty appearance. Moreover, the door was closed, as though customers were not expected. 
The girl tried the door and found it locked, a fact which seemed to indicate that customers were not even desired. After another hasty look up and down the street, she tapped sharply on the door in a peculiar way. The door was opened after the lapse of a few minutes by a short, thick-set man over fifty, whose heavy face displayed none of the suavity and desire to please which is part of the stock-in-trade of the small shopkeeper of London. A look of annoyance crossed his face at the sight of the girl, and his first remark to her was one which no well-regulated shopkeeper would have addressed to a prospective customer. "'You!' he exclaimed. "'What in God's name has brought you here? I told you on no account to come to the shop. How do you know somebody hasn't followed you?' "'I could not help it, Kincher,' the girl responded piteously. "'I'm distracted about Fred, and I had to come over to ask your advice.' "'You women are all fools,' the man retorted. "'You might have known that I would read all about the case in the papers, "'and that I'd let you hear from me.' "'Yes, Kincher,' she replied humbly. "'But they let me see Fred for a few minutes yesterday at the police court, "'and he told me to come over and see you. "'Oh, if you only knew what I've suffered since he was arrested. "'Yesterday he was committed for trial.' I haven't closed my eyes for over a week. So you attended the police court proceedings, said Kemp, and when the girl nodded her head, he went on. The more fool you. I suppose it would be too much to expect a woman to keep away even though she knew she could do no good. I knew that, Kincher, but I simply had to go. I should have died if I had stayed in that dreadful flat alone. I tried to, but I couldn't. I got so nervous that I had to put my handkerchief into my mouth to prevent myself from screaming aloud. Well, since you are here, you'd better come inside instead of standing there and giving yourself and me away to every passing policeman. He led the way inside, and the girl followed him to a dirty, cheerless room behind the shop which was furnished with a sofa bedstead, a table, and a chair. It was evident that Kemp lived alone and attended to his own wants. The remains of an unappetizing meal were on a corner of the table, and a kettle and a teapot stood by the fireplace, in which a fire had recently been made with a few sticks for the purpose of boiling a kettle. Bedclothes were heaped on the sofa bedstead in a disordered state and in the midst of them nestled a large tortoise-shell cat. "'Sit down,' said Kemp. There was an old chair near the fireplace, and he pushed it towards her with his foot. "'What's brought you over here?' The girl sank into the chair and began to cry. "'I can't help it, Kincher,' she said. I don't know what to say or do. Fancy Fred being charged with murder. Oh, it's too dreadful to think about, and yet I can think of nothing else. Crying your eyes out won't help matters much, replied the unsympathetic Kemp. The girl did not reply, but rocked herself backwards and forwards on the chair. She sobbed so violently that she appeared to be threatened with an attack of hysteria. Kemp watched her silently. The cat on the sofa bedstead, as if awakened by the noise, got up, yawned, looked inquiringly round, and then, with a measured leap, sprang into the girl's lap. She was startled by his act, and then she smiled through her sobs as she stroked the animal's coat. "'Poor old Peter!' she exclaimed. He wants to console me, don't you, Peter? I say, Kinshay, I wish you'd give me, Peter. You don't want him. Oh, look at the dear. The cat had perched himself on one of her knees to beg, and he sawed the air appealingly with his forepaws. I must give him a titbit for that. She eyed the remains of the meal on the table disdainfully. 
no peter there is nothing fit for you to eat positively nothing why he understands me like a human being she continued in amazement as the huge cat dropped on all fours and deliberately sprang back to the sofa bedstead i say kincher you really want a woman in this place to look after you it's in a most shocking state it's like pigsty kemp made no reply but continued to watch her her tears had vanished and she sat forward with her dark eyes sparkling one hand supporting her pretty face as she glanced round the room have you a cigarette she asked suddenly kemp went into the shop and came back with a packet of cheap cigarettes the girl pushed them away petulantly i don't like that brand she said haven't you got anything better the man shook his head no then here goes i must have a smoke of some sort she stuck one of the cheap cigarettes daintily into her mouth a match kincher why the box is filthy you must have a woman in to look after you even if i have to find you one myself i don't want a woman in the place retorted kemp there is no peace for a man when a woman is about but let us have no more of this idle chatter what brought you over here i suppose it's about fred poor fred the girl looked downcast for a moment then she tossed her head puffed out some smoke and exclaimed energetically but he's not guilty kincher and we'll get him off won't we not merely by saying so replied kemp but you'd better tell me how it came about that he was arrested for the murder the police gave away nothing at the police court bill dobbs was down there and he told me they let out nothing except that their principal witness against fred is that fellow hill i always knew he'd squeak i told fred to have nothing to do with the job the girl's eyes flashed viciously she tossed the cigarette into the fireplace and straightened herself that's the low dirty scoundrel who committed the murder she exclaimed he ought to be in the dock not fred was fred up there that night asked hemp up where at riversbrook or whatever they call it yes he told me he didn't go it's because he was up there that the police have arrested him said the girl hill gave him away oh he's a double-dyed villain is hill and so quiet and respectable looking with it all he used to let me in when i went to riversbrook and let me out again and pocket the half-crowns i gave him and i like a fool never suspected him once or thought that he knew anything about fred coming to the flat he didn't let it out till the night sir horace quarrelled with me sir horace found out about about fred and when i went up to see him as usual he told me that he had finished with me and he called hill up to show me out show this young lady out he said in that cold haughty voice of his and the vilely old villain hill just bowed and held the door open he followed me downstairs and let me out at the side door there he said i'll escort you to the front gate if you will permit me miss i usually lock the gate about this time i thought nothing of this because he had come with me to the front gate before he followed me down the garden path through the plantation till we reached the front gate he opened the gate for me and i said good night hill but instead of his replying good night miss fanning as he usually did he hissed out like a serpent you tell birchill i want to see him to-morrow and i'll come to the flat about nine o'clock tell him an old friend named field wants to see him don't forget the name field then he locked the gate and was gone before i could speak a word i gave fred his message next morning i wish to god that i hadn't she continued i asked fred not to keep the appointment but he insisted on doing so 
He said that he and Field had been good friends in the jail, and that Field had told him that if he ever got on to anything he would let him know. He seemed quite pleased at the idea of meeting Field again. I told him to beware that Field wasn't lying a trap for him, but he wouldn't listen to me. Sure enough, Field, or Hill as he calls himself now, did come over that evening, and I let him in myself. I took him into the sitting room where Fred was, and I sat down in a corner of the room pretending to read a book, so that I could hear what our visitor had to say. But the cunning old devil whispered something to Fred, and Fred came over to me and asked if I'd mind leaving them alone for half an hour. I didn't mind so much, because I knew I could get it all out of Fred after Hill had gone. He remained shut up with Fred for nearly two hours, and then I heard Fred letting him out of the front door. Fred came in to me, and I soon got the strength of it all from him. What do you think Hill had come for? To get Fred to burgle Sir Horace's house. And Fred had agreed to do it. I cried and I stormed and went into hysterics. But he wouldn't budge. You know how obstinate he can be when he likes. He said that Hill had told him there was a good haul to be picked up. Sir Horace was going to Scotland for the shooting, and the servants were to be sent to his country house, so the coast would be clear. Hill was to leave everything right at Riversbrook on the afternoon of the 18th of August, and he was to come across to the flat and let Fred know. Hill came as he promised, but as soon as he came in I could see that something had happened. The first words he said were that Sir Horace had returned unexpectedly from Scotland. I was glad to hear it, for I thought that meant that there would be no burglary. I said as much to Fred, and he would have agreed with me, but that devil Hill was too full of cunning. Of course, if you're frightened, we'd better call it off, he said. Fred had been drinking during the day, and you know what he's like when he's had a little too much. I was never frightened of any job yet, he said. And I'd do this job tonight if the house was full of rossers. Hill pretended that he wasn't particular whether the thing came off or not that night. But all the while he kept egging Fred on to do it. Oh, I can see now what his game was. In spite of all I could do or say, it was arranged that Fred should go over and see if it was quite safe to carry out the job. Hill said he thought Sir Horace was going out that night and wouldn't be home until the early morning. About nine o'clock Fred went off, leaving Hill and me alone in the flat together. How I wish now that I had killed him when I had such a good chance! We sat there, scarcely speaking, and heard the clock strike the hours. After midnight I began to get restless, for I thought something must have happened to Fred. Hill said in a low voice, "'It's time Fred was back.' The words were scarcely out of his mouth when I heard Fred step outside, and I ran to let him in. He came in as white as a sheet. Fred, I cried as soon as I saw him, there is some blood on your face. He didn't answer a word until he had taken a big drink of whiskey out of the decanter. Then he said in a whisper, Sir Horace Fewbanks has been murdered. Murdered, cried Hill, leaping up from his chair. He can act well, I can tell you. My God, Fred, you don't mean it. "'He's dead, I tell you,' replied Fred fiercely. "'I thought, and at the time I suppose Hill thought "'that Fred had shot him either accidentally "'or in order to escape capture. "'He seemed to guess what we were thinking, "'for he swore that he had nothing to do with it. "'Sir Horace was dead on the floor when he got there. "'He told us all that had happened. "'When he got to Riversbrook he found lights burning on the ground floor.' He jumped over the fence at the side and hid in the garden. He was there only a few minutes when he saw the lights go out. Then the front door was slammed and a woman walked down the garden path to the gate. "'A woman!' exclaimed Kemp. "'Yes, a woman. 
Why not? She had been to see Sir Horace, one of his society mistresses. I'll bet it was on her account that he came back from Scotland. What time was this? he asked with interest. About half past ten, replied the girl. And this woman, this lady, turned out the lights and closed the front door? So Fred says. Of course he thought Sir Horace had done it, but he found out later that Sir Horace was dead. I can't understand it, said Kemp. What was she doing there? If she found the man dead, why didn't she inform the police? Now, wait a minute. She'd be afraid to do that if she was a society woman. It might be her who killed him, said the girl. Does Fred think that? asked Kemp, looking at her closely. Fred doesn't know what to think, she replied. But it must have been this woman or Hill who killed him. I feel sure myself that it was Hill. This woman puzzles me, said Kemp thoughtfully. She must have been a cool hand if she went round turning out the lights after finding his dead body. About half past ten, you said. That is as near as Fred can make it. Go on with your story, he said. I am interested in this. You were saying that Fred saw the lights go out, and then this woman came out of the house and walked away? Well, Fred got into the house through one of the windows at the side. The one Hill had told him to try, continued the girl. But first of all he waited about half an hour in the garden, so as to give Sir Horace time to go to sleep. He was able to find his way about the house, as Hill had given him a plan. He felt his way upstairs, and finding a door open, he went into the room and flashed his electric torch. By its light he saw Sir Horace Fewbanks lying huddled up in a corner, with a big pool of blood beside him on the floor. He felt him to see if he was dead. The body was quite warm, but it was limp. Sir Horace was dead. Fred says he lost his nerve and ran for it as hard as he could. He rushed downstairs and out of the house and got back to the flat as fast as he could. The three of us sat there, shaking with fear and wondering what to do. Hill was the first to recover himself. In his cunning, plausible way, he pointed out that it was altogether unlikely that suspicion would fall on Fred or him. All we had to do was to keep quiet and say nothing. Then we'd have no awkward questions put to us. It was his suggestion that we should send an anonymous letter to Scotland Yard telling them that Sir Horace had been murdered. That would be much better, he said, than leaving the body there until he went over and found it, when he had to go over to Riversbrook to take a look round, in accordance with the instructions that had been given him when Sir Horace went to Scotland. Knowing what he did, he was afraid that if he was allowed to discover the body and inform the police, he would let something slip when the police came at him with their hundreds of questions. We printed the letter to Scotland Yard, each one doing a letter at a time. Hill took it with him, saying he would post it on his way home. When he left, Fred and I sat there thinking. Suddenly it came to me as clear as daylight that Hill had committed the murder, and had fixed up things so as to throw suspicion on Fred. He must have known Sir Horace was coming back from Scotland that night, and he had laid in wait for him and shot him. Then he had come over to my flat in order to persuade Fred to carry out the burglary, and direct suspicion to Fred for the murder, if the police worried him. I told Fred what I thought, but he only laughed at me and said I was talking nonsense. But I was right. For a week afterwards the police came and arrested Fred at the flat. "'How did they get him?' asked Kemp. "'I saw them coming along the street from the window, and I pointed them out to Fred. He tried to get away through the kitchen window along the ledge and down the spouting. He almost got away, but one of the detectives saw him before he reached the ground, and they dashed downstairs and got him in the street.' 
Next day I saw in the papers that Hill had made an important statement to the police, and this had led to Fred's arrest. Hill is the murderer, Kincher. The cunning, wicked, treacherous villain told the police about Fred being up there. He wants to see Fred hang in order to save his own neck. The girl's voice rose to a shriek, and she sprang to her feet with blazing eyes. Kincher, she cried, you've got to help me put the rope round this wretch's neck. Do you hear me? Kemp's impassivity was in marked contrast to the girl's hysterical excitement. What do you want me to do? he asked. Fred wants you to get up an alibi for him. He sent me over to ask you to arrange it without delay. He wants you and two or three others to swear that he was over here on the night of the murder. That will be sufficient to get him off. Not me, said Kemp, shaking his head decidedly. I won't do it. It's too risky. The police have too many things against me for my word to be any good as a witness. I'd only be landing myself in trouble for perjury instead of helping Fred out of trouble. He ought to have got an alibi ready before he was arrested. I told him at the inquest that he ought to look after it, and he swore he'd not been up there on the night of the murder. It is too late to do anything in the alibi line now. I don't know anybody I could get to come forward and swear Fred was in their company that night. There is a difference between fixing up a tale for the police before a man's arrested and going into the witness box and committing perjury on oath. He spoke in such an uncompromising tone that the girl saw it was useless to pursue the matter further. Suppose I went to the police and told them that Hill is the murderer, she suggested. Kemp shook his head slowly. There is only your word for it that Hill killed him, he said. It doesn't look to me as if he did when he went over to your flat and told Fred that Sir Horace had come back from Scotland. If he had killed him, he would have let Fred go over without saying a word about it. Oh, that was part of his cunning, said the girl. If he had said nothing about Sir Horace's return, Fred would have suspected him when he found the dead body. I am as certain that Hill committed the murder as if I had seen him do it with my own eyes. Kemp shrugged his shoulders as though realizing the uselessness of attempting to combat such a feminine form of reasoning. Didn't Fred say that the body was warm when he touched it? he asked. She meditated a moment over this evidence of Hill's innocence. Well, if Phil didn't kill him, the woman Fred saw leaving the house must have done so, she declared. There is something in that, said Kemp. Look here, we've got to get Fred a good lawyer to defend him, and we must be guided by his advice as to what is the best thing to do. He knows more about what will go down with the jury than you do. I paid a solicitor to defend him at the police court, said the girl, but the money I gave him was thrown away. He said nothing, and did nothing. That shows he's a man who knows his business, replied Kemp. What's the good of talking to police court beaks in a case that is bound to go to trial? It's a waste of breath. The thing is to see that Fred is properly defended, when the case come on at the old bailey we want somebody who can manage the jury i should say holymead is the man if you can get him i don't know as he'd be likely to take up the case for he don't go in much for criminal courts and yet it seems to me that he might you ought to try to get him at least he used to be a friend of your friend sir horace so if he took up the case, it would look as if he believed Fred had nothing to do with the murder. It would be bound to make a good impression on the jury. Wouldn't it be very expensive? asked the girl. Not so expensive as getting hanged, said Kemp grimly. You take my advice and have him. 
if you can get him. Never mind what he costs, if you can raise the money. You've got some money saved up, haven't you? Yes, I've nearly two hundred pounds. Sir Horace put hundred pounds in the savings bank for me on my last birthday. And the furniture at the flat is mine. I'd sell that and everything I've got for Fred's sake. That is the way to talk said Kemp. You go to this solicitor you had at the police court and tell him you want Holymead to defend Fred. Tell him he must brief Holymead. Have nobody else but Holymead. Tell him that Holymead was a friend of Sir Horace Fewbanks, and that if he appears for the Fred, the jury will never believe that Fred had anything to do with the murder. And I don't think he had though he did lie to me and swear he hadn't been up there that night. He added, after a moment's reflection. End of chapter 13 Of the Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 14 of the Hampstead Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees. Chapter 14. "'There is one link in the chain missing,' said Rolfe, who was discussing with Inspector Chippenfield in the latter's room at Scotland Yard the strength of the case against Birchill. "'And what is that?' asked his superior. "'The piece of woman's handkerchief that I found in the dead man's hand. You remember, we agreed that it showed there was a woman in the case.' "'Well, what do you call this girl Fanning?' "'Isn't she in the case?' "'Surely you don't want any better explanation of the murder "'than a quarrel between her and Sir Horace over this man Birchill.' "'Yes, I see that plain enough,' replied Rolf. "'There's ample motive for the crime. "'But how that piece of handkerchief got into the dead man's hand "'is still a mystery to me.' It would be easily explained if this girl was present in the room or the house when the murder was committed. But she wasn't. Hill's story is that she was at the flat with him. When you've had as much experience in investigating crime as I have, you won't worry over little points that at first don't seem to fit in with what we know to be facts, responded the inspector in a patronizing tone. I noticed from the first roll that you were inclined to make too much of this handkerchief business. But I said nothing. Of course, it was your own discovery, and I have found during my career that young detectives are always inclined to make too much of their own discoveries. Perhaps I was myself when I was young and inexperienced. Now... As to this handkerchief, what is more likely than that Birchill had it in his pocket when he went out to Riversbrook on that fatal night? He was living in the flat with his skull fanning. What was more natural than that he should pick up a handkerchief off the floor or that the girl had dropped and put it in his pocket with the intention of giving it to her when she returned to the room? Instead of doing so, he forgot all about it. When he shot Sir Horace Fewbanks, he put his hands into his pocket for a handkerchief to wipe his forehead or his hands. It was a hot night, and I take it that a man who has killed another doesn't feel as cool as a cucumber. While stooping over his victim with the handkerchief still in his hand, the dying man made a convulsive movement and caught hold of a corner of the handkerchief, which was torn off. 
Inspector Chippenfield looked across at his subordinate with a smile of triumphant superiority. Yes, said Rolfe meditatively. There is nothing wrong about that as far as I can see. But I would like to know for certain how it got there. Inspector Chippenfield was satisfied with his subordinate's testimony to his perspicacity. That is all right, Rolf, he said in a tone of kindly banter, but don't make the mistake of regarding your idle curiosity as a virtue. After the trial, if you are still curious on the point, I have no doubt Birchill will tell you. He is sure to make a confession before he is hanged. But it was more a spirit of idle curiosity than anything else that brought Rolf to Crewe's chambers in Holborn an hour later. Having secured the murderer, he felt curious as to what Crewe's feelings were on his defeat. It was the first occasion that he had been on a case which Crewe had been commissioned to investigate. And he was naturally pleased that Inspector Chippenfield and he had arrested the author of the crime, while Crewe was all at sea. It was plain from the fact that the latter had thought it necessary to visit Scotland that he had got on a false scent. It was not Scotland, but Scotland Yard, that Crewe should have visited, Rolf said to himself with a smile. Crewe, in pursuance of his policy of keeping on the best of terms with the police, gave Rolf a very friendly welcome. He produced from a cupboard two glasses, a decanter of whisky, a siphon of soda, and a box of cigars. Rolf quickly discovered that the cigars were of a quality that seldom came his way, and he leaned back in his chair and puffed with steady enjoyment. "'Then you are determined to hang Birchill,' said Crewe, as with a cigar in his fingers he faced his visitor with a smile. "'We'll hang him right enough,' said Rolf. He pulled the cigar out of his mouth and looked at it approvingly. Though the talk was of hanging, he had never felt more thoroughly at peace with the world. "'It will be a pity if you do,' said Crewe. "'Why?' "'Because he's the wrong man?' "'It would take a lot to make me believe that,' said Rolf stoutly. "'We've got a strong case against him. "'There is not a weak point in it. "'I admit that Hill is a tainted witness, "'but they'll find it pretty hard to break down his story. "'We've tested it in every way and find it stands. "'Then there are the boot marks outside the window.' Birchill's boots fit them to the smallest fraction of an inch. The gem he found in the flat fits the mark made in the window at Riversbrook, and we've got something more, another witness who saw him in, in Tanton Gardens about the time of the murder. If Birchill can get his neck out of the noose, he's cleverer than I take him for. Crewe did not reply directly to Rolf's summary of the case. "'I see that they've briefed Holymead for the defence, he said after a pause. "'A waste of good money,' said the police officer. Something appealed to a sense of humour, for he broke out into a laugh. "'What are you laughing at?' asked Crewe. "'I was wondering how Sir Horace feels "'when he sees the money he gave this girl Fanning "'being used to defend his murderer.' "'You are a hardened scamp, Rolf, "'with a very perverse sense of humour, said Crewe. "'It was a cunning move of them to get Holymead, said Rolf. "'They think it will weigh with the jury "'because he was such a close friend of Sir Horace "'that he wouldn't have taken up the case "'unless he felt that Birchill was innocent. "'But you and I know better than that, Mr. Crewe.' A lawyer will prove that black is white if he's paid for it. I understand that, according to the etiquette of the bar, they have got to do it. A barrister has to abide by his brief and leave his personal feelings out of account. That's so, 
Theoretically, he is an officer of the court, and his services are supposed to be at the call of any man who is in want of him and can afford to pay for them. Of course, a leading barrister such as Holymead often declines a brief because he has so much to do. But he is not supposed to decline it for personal reasons. His heart will not be in the case, said Rolfe philosophically. On the contrary, I think it will, said Crewe. My own opinion is that, if necessary, he will exert his powers to the utmost in order to get Birchill off, and that he will succeed. Not he, said Rolfe confidently. Our case is too strong. You've got a lot of circumstantial evidence, but a clever lawyer will pull it to pieces. Circumstantial evidence has hung many a man, and it will hang many more. But a jury will hesitate to convict on circumstantial evidence when it can be shown that the conduct of the prisoner is at variance with what the conduct of a guilty man would be. I don't bet, but I'll wager you a box of cigars to nothing that Holymead gets Birchill off. It's a one-sided vagar, but I'll take the cigars because I could do with a box of these, said Rolfe. You might as well give them to me now, Mr. Crewe. No, no, said Crewe with a smile. Put a couple in your pocket now, because you won't win the box. Of course I understand, Mr. Crewe, why you say Birchill is a wrong man. You feel a bit sore because we have beaten you. I would feel sore myself in your place, and I don't deny that we got information that put us on Birchill's track, and therefore it was easier for us to solve the mystery than it was for you. I'm not a bit sore, said Crewe. I can take a beating, especially when the men who beat me are good sportsmen. He bowed towards Rolfe, and that officer blushed as he recalled how Inspector Chippenfield and he had agreed to withhold information from Crewe, and to try to put him on a false scent. "'I wish you'd tell me what you consider the weak points of our case against Birchill,' asked Rolfe. "'Your case is based on Hill's confession, and that, to my mind, is false in many details,' said Crewe. Take, for instance, his account of how he came into contact with Birchill again. This girl Fanning, after a quarrel with Sir Horace, came over to Riversbrook with a message for Hill, which was virtually a threat. Now, does that seem probable? The girl who had been in the habit of visiting Sir Horace goes over to see Hill. No woman in the circumstances would do anything of the sort. She had too good an opinion of herself to take a message to a servant at a house from which she had been expelled by the owner who had been keeping her. How would she have felt it if she had run into Sir Horace? It is true that Sir Horace left for Scotland the day before, but it is improbable that the girl who had quarrelled with Sir Horace a fortnight before knew the exact date on which he intended to leave. And how did Hill behave when he got the message? According to his story, he considered to go and see Birchill under threat of exposure, and he consented to become an accomplice in the burglary for the same reason. Sir Horace knew all about Hill's past, so why should he fear a threat of exposure? Hill explained that, interposed Rolfe. He pointed out that, though Sir Horace knew his past, he couldn't afford to have any scandal about it. Quite so. But could Birchill afford to threaten a man who was under the protection of Sir Horace Fewbanks? Would Birchill pit himself against Sir Horace? I think that Sir Horace, knowing the law pretty thoroughly, would soon have found a way to deal with Birchill. If Hill was threatened by Birchill, his first impulse, knowing what a powerful protector he had in Sir Horace Fewbanks, would have been to go to him and seek his protection 
against this dangerous old associate of his convict days. According to Hill's own story, he was something in the nature of a confidential servant, trusted to some extent with the secrets of Sir Horace's double life. What more likely than such a man, threatened as he describes, should turn to his master who had shielded him and trusted him? I confess that is a point which never struck me, said Rolf thoughtfully. Now, let us go on to the meeting between Hill and Birchill, continued Crewe. This girl Fanning, discarded by Sir Horace because he discovered she was playing him false with Birchill, is made ostensible reason for Birchill's wishing to commit a burglary at Riversbrook, because Birchill wants, as he says, to get even with Sir Horace Fewbanks. Is it likely that Birchill would confide his desire for revenge so frankly to Sir Horace's confidential servant, the trusted custodian of his master's valuables, who could rely on his master's protection, the protection of a highly placed man of whom Birchill stood admittedly in fear, and whom he knew, according to Hill's story, was unassailable from his slander? What had Hill to fear from the threats of a man like Birchill when he was living under Sir Horace Fewbank's protection? All that Hill had to do when Birchill tried to induce him by threats of exposure of his past to help in burglary at his master's house was to threaten to tell everything to Sir Horace. Birchill told Hill that he was frightened of Sir Horace Fewbanks, the judge who had sentenced him. Then Birchill's confidence in Hill is remarkable, any way you look at it. He sends for Hill, whom he had known in jail and whom he hadn't seen since, to confide in him that it is his intention to burgle his employer's house. He rashly assumes that Hill will do all that he wishes, and he proceeds to lay his cards on the table. But even supposing that Birchill was foolish enough to do this, to trust a chance jail acquaintance so implicitly there is a far more puzzling action on his part. Why did he want Hill's assistance to burgle a practically unprotected house? I confess I have great difficulty in understanding why such an accomplished flash burglar as Birchill, one of the best men at the game in London at the present time, should want the assistance of an amateur like Hill in such a simple job. Rolf looked startled. Hill says he wanted a plan of the house and to know what valuables it contained. Crewe smiled. And has it been your experience among criminals, Rolf, that a burglar must have a plan of the place he intends to burgle, and that to get this plan he will give himself away to any man who can supply it. A plan has its uses, but it is indispensable only when a very difficult job is being undertaken, such as breaking through a wall or a ceiling to get at a room which contains a safe. This job was as simple as A, B, C. And besides, as far as I can make out, Birchill knew the girl Fanning must have known that Sir Horace would be going away sometime in August, and that the house would be empty. Did he want a plan of an empty house? He would be free to room all over it when he had forced a window. He wanted to know what valuables were there, said Rolf and therefore took Hill into his confidence. If Hill had told his master, even Birchill would realize the risk of that. There would be no valuables to get. Next we come to Sir Horace Fewbank's unexpected return. According to Hill's story, he made some tentative efforts to commence a confession as soon as he saw his employer. But Sir Horace was upset about something and was too impatient to listen to a word. Is such a story reasonable or likely? Hill says that Sir Horace had always 
treated him well, and according to his earlier statement, when he permitted himself to be terrorized into agreeing to his burglary, he told himself that chance would throw in his way some opportunity of informing his master. And he told you that Birchill, mistrusting his unwilling accomplice, hurried on the date of the burglary so as to give him no such opportunity. Well, chance throws in Hill's way the very opportunity he has been seeking. But he is too frightened to use it, because Sir Horace happens to return in an angry or impatient mood. Let us take Birchill's attitude when Hills tells him that Sir Horace has unexpectedly returned from Scotland. Birchill is suspicious that Hill has played him false, and naturally so. But Hill, instead of letting him think so, and thus preventing the burglary from taking place, does all he can to reassure him, while at the same time begging him to postpone the burglary. That was hardly the best way to go about it. Let us charitably assume that Hill was too frightened to let Birchill remain under the impression that he'd played him false, and let us look at Birchill's attitude. It is inconceivable that Birchill should have permitted himself to be reassured when right through the negotiations between himself and Hill he showed the most marked distrust of the latter. Yet, according to Hill, he suddenly abandons this attitude for one of trusting credulity, meekly accepting the assurance of the man he distrusts that Sir Horace Fewbanks' unexpected return from Scotland on the very night the burglar is to be committed is not a trap to catch him, but a coincidence. Then, after drinking himself nearly blind, he sets forth with a revolver to commit a burglary on the house of the judge who tried him. On Hill's bare word that everything is all right, Gilliless, trusting, simple-minded Birchill. Hill is left locked up in the flat with the girl, for Birchill, who has just trusted him implicitly in a far more important matter, affecting his own liberty, has a belated sense of caution about trusting his unworthy accomplice while he is away committing the burglary. The time goes on. The couple in the flat hear the clock strike twelve before Birchill's returning footsteps are heard. He enters, and immediately announces to Hill and the girl, with every symptom of strongly marked terror, that while on his burglary's mission he has come across the dead body of Sir Horace Fewbanks, murdered in his own house. Mark that, he tells them freely and openly, tells Hill, as soon as he gets in the flat, allowing for the possible defects in my previous reasoning against Hill's story, admitting that an adroit prosecution counsel may be able to buttress up some of the weak points, allowing that you may have other circumstantial evidence supporting your case, that is the fatal flaw in your chain. Because of Birchill's statement on his return to the flat, no jury in the world ought to convict him. I don't see why, said Rolf. Crewe fixed his deep eyes intently on Rolf as he replied, "'Because if Birchill had committed this murder, he would never have admitted immediately on his returning, least of all to Hill, anything about the dead body.' "'But he told Hill that he didn't commit the murder,' protested Rolf. "'But you say that he did commit the murder,' retorted the detective. "'You cannot use that piece of evidence in both ways. "'Your case is that this man Birchill, "'while visiting Riversbrook to commit a burglary, "'which he and Hill arranged, "'encountered Sir Horace Fewbanks and murdered him. "'I say that his admission to Hill on his return "'to the flat that he had come across the body of Sir Horace Fewbanks,' is proof that Birchill did not commit the murder. No murderer would make such a damning admission, least of all to a man he didn't trust, to a man who he believed was capable of entrapping him. 
next you have birchill consenting to a message being sent to scotland yard conveying the information that sir horace had been murdered is that the action of a guilty man wouldn't it have been more to his interest to leave the dead man's body undiscovered in the empty house and bolt from the country it might have remained a week or more before being discovered true he would have had to find some way of silencing hill while he got away from the country he might have had to resort to the crude method of tying hill up gagging him and leaving him in the flat but even that would have been better than to inform the police immediately of the murder and place his life at the mercy of hill whom he distrusted looked at your way i admit that there are some weak points in our case said rolf but you'll find that our counsel will be able to answer most of them in his addresses to the jury if birchill didn't commit the murder who did do you deny that he went up to riversbrook that night the letter sent to scotland yard shows that someone was there besides the murderer if birchill was there and helped to write the letter and so much is part of your case he wasn't the murderer in short i believe birchill went up there to commit a burglary and found the murdered body of sir horace do you think that hill did it asked rolf that is more than i'd like to say as a matter of fact i have been so obtuse as to neglect hill somewhat in my investigations in fact i didn't know until i got hold of a copy of his statement to the police that he was an ex-convict inspector chippenfield omitted to inform me of the fact i didn't know that said rolf without a blush as he rose to go he ought to have told you end of chapter fourteen of the hampstead mystery by john watson and arthur rees read by lars rolander chapter fifteen of the hampstead mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by lars rolander the hampstead mystery by john watson and arthur rees chapter 15 when rolf left crew's office he went back to scotland yard he found inspector chippenfield still in his office and related to him the substance of his interview with crew the inspector listened to the recital in growing anger birchall not the right man he spluttered why of course he is the case against him is purely circumstantial but it's as clear as daylight then uh, you don't think there is anything in crew's points asked rolf i think so little of them that i look upon birchill as good as hanged that for crew's points inspector chippenfield snapped his fingers contemptuously and i'm surprised to think that you rolf whose loyalty to your superior officer is a thing i would have staked my life on should have sat there and listened to such rubbish i wouldn't have listened to him for two minutes no not for half a minute he was trying to pick our case to pieces out of blind spite and jealousy because we've got ahead of him in the biggest murder case london's had for many a long day a man who jaunts off to scotland looking for clues to a murder committed in london is a fool rolf that's what i call him we have beaten him beaten him badly and he doesn't like it but it's not the first time scotland yard has beaten him and it won't be the last i suppose you're right said rolf 
But there's one point he made which rather struck me. I must say that about Birchill telling Hill he'd found the dead body, would Birchill have told Hill that if he'd committed the murder? Nothing more likely, exclaimed the inspector. My theory is that Birchill, while committing the burglary at Riversbrook, was surprised by Sir Horace Fewbanks. It is possible that the judge tried to capture Birchill to hand him over to the police, and Birchill shot him. I believe that Birchill fired both shots, that he had two revolvers. But whatever took place, a dangerous criminal like Birchill would not require much provocation to silence a man who interrupted him while he was on business bent. And a man, moreover, against whom he nursed a bitter grudge. In this case, it is possible there was no provocation at all. Sir Horace Fewbanks may have simply heard a noise, entered the room where Birchill was, and been shot down without mercy. Birchill heard him coming and was ready for him with a revolver in each hand. You've got to bear in mind that Birchill went to the house in a dangerous mood, half mad with drink and furious with anger against Sir Horace Fewbanks for cutting off the allowance of the girl he was living with. He threatened, before he left the flat, to commit the burglary that he'd do for the judge if he interfered with him. "'That's according to Hill's statement,' said Rolfe. Inspector Chippenfield glanced at his subordinate in some surprise. "'Of course it's Hill's statement,' he said. "'Isn't he our principal witness? And doesn't his statement fit in with all the facts we've been able to gather?' Well, the murder of Sir Horace, no matter how it was committed, was committed in cold blood. But immediately Birchill had done it, the fact that he had committed a murder would have a sobering effect on him. Although he bragged before he left the flat for Riversbrook about killing the judge if he came across him, he had no intention of jeopardizing his neck unnecessarily. And after he had shot down the judge, in a moment of drunken passion, he would be anxious to keep Hill, whom he mistrusted, from knowing that he had committed the murder. But he was fully aware that Hill would be the person who would discover the body next day, and that if he wasn't put on his guard, he would bring in the police and probably give away everything that Birchill had said and done. So, to obviate the risk and prepare Hill, Birchill hit on the plan of telling him that he'd found the judge's dead body while burgling the place. It was a bold idea, and not without its advantages when you consider what an awkward fix Birchill was in. Not only did it keep Hill quiet, but it forced him into the position of becoming a kind of silent accomplice to the crime. He did not give the show away until he was trapped, and then he only confessed to save his own skin. He's a dangerous and deep scoundrel, this Birchall, but he'll swing this time, and you'll find that his confession of finding the body will do more than anything else to hang him, properly put to the jury, and I'll see that it is properly put. Rolf pondered much over these two conflicting points of views, Cruz and Inspector Chippenfield's, for the rest of the day. He inclined to Inspector Chippenfield's conclusions regarding Birchill's admission about the body. The idea that he had assisted in arresting the wrong man and had helped to build up a case against him was too unpalatable for him to accept it but he was forced to admit that Crewe's theory was distinctly a plausible one, though it was impossible for him to give up the conviction that Birchill was the murderer. He felt that Crewe's analysis of the case for the prosecution contained several telling points which might be used with some effect on a jury in the hands of an experienced counsel. Rolf had no doubt that Holymead would make the most of those points, and he also knew that the famous barrister was at his best in attacking circumstantial evidence. That night, while walking home, 
the idea occurred to rolfe of going over to camden town after supper to see if by questioning hill again he could throw a little more light on what had taken place at doris fanning's flat the night sir horace fewbanks was murdered hill had been questioned and cross-questioned at scotland yard by inspector chippenfield concerning the events of that night and professed to have confessed to everything that had happened but rolfe thought it possible he might be able to extract something more which might assist in strengthening what crewe regarded as the weak points in the police case against birchill rolfe had every justification for such a visit for though hill had not been arrested he had been ordered by inspector chippenfield to report himself daily to the camden town police station and the police of that district had been instructed to keep a strict eye on his movements inspector chippenfield did not regard his principal witness in the forthcoming murder trial as the sort of man likely to bolt but if he permitted him for politic reasons to retain his liberty he took every precaution to ensure that hill should not abuse his privilege rolfe lived in lodgings at king's cross and as the evening was fine and he was fond of exercise he decided to walk across to hill's place as he walked along his thoughts revolved round the murder of sir horace fewbanks and the baffling perplexities which had surrounded its elucidation had they got hold of the right man the real murderer in fred birchill rolfe kept asking himself that question again and again a few hours ago he had not the slightest doubt on the point he had looked upon the great murder case as satisfactorily solved and he had thought with increasing satisfaction of his own share in bringing the murderer to justice he had anticipated newspaper praise on his sharpness judicial commendation a favourable official entry in the departmental records of the scotland yard with perhaps promotion for the good work he had accomplished in this celebrated case these rosy visions had been temporarily dissipated by the conversation he had had with crewe that morning if crewe had not succeeded in destroying rolfe's conviction that the murder of sir horace fewbanks had been caught he had pointed out sufficient flaws in the police case to shake rolfe's previous assurance of the legal conviction of birchill for the crime the way in which crewe had pulled the police case to pieces had shown rolfe that the conviction of birchill was by no means a foregone conclusion and had left him a prey to doubts and anxiety which inspector chippenfield's subsequent depreciation of the detective's views had not altogether removed the little shop kept by the hills was empty when rolfe entered it but mrs hill appeared from the inner room in answer to his knock the faded little woman did not recognize the police officer at first but when he spoke she looked into his face with a start she timidly said in reply to his inquiry for her husband that he had just stepped out down the street then you had better send your little girl after him said rolfe seating himself on the one rickety chair on the outside of the counter i want to see him mrs hill seemed at a loss to reply for a moment then she answered nervously plucking at her apron the while i don't think it be much use doing that sir you say mr hill doesn't always tell me where he's going and i don't really know where he is then why did you tell me that he had just stepped out down the street asked rolf sharply because i thought he mightn't be far away then as a matter of fact you don't know where he is or when he'll be back no sir her prompt and uncompromising reply indicated that she did not want him to wait for her husband i think i'll wait said rolf looking at her steadily yes sir 
Daphne appeared at the door of the parlour, which led into the shop, and her mother waved her back angrily. "'Go to bed this instant, miss. It's long past your bedtime,' she said. It was obvious that Mrs. Hill retained a vivid recollection of how disastrous had been Daphne's appearance during Inspector Chippenfield's first visit to the shop. "'Perhaps your little girl knows where her father is?' said Rolf maliciously. "'No, she doesn't,' replied Mrs. Hill with some spirit. "'You can ask her if you like.' Rolf was suddenly struck with an idea, and he decided to test it. "'I won't wait. I've changed my mind. But if your husband comes in, tell him not to go to bed until I've seen him. I'll be back.' "'Yes, sir,' she replied. "'Do you think he was going to Riversbrook?' he asked. The woman flushed suddenly and then went pale. She knew as well as Rolf that her husband was strictly forbidden, pending the trial, to go near the place of his former employment, and that the police had relieved him of his keys, and taken possession of the silent house and locked everything up. "'No, sir,' she replied with trembling lips. Mr. Hill hasn't gone over there. How can you be certain if he didn't tell you where he was going? asked Rolf. Of course it's the last place in the world you think of going to, gasped Mrs. Hill. Such a thought would never enter his head. I do assure you, sir, Mr. Hill would never dream of going over there, sir. You can take my word for it. Rolf walked thoughtfully up High Street. Was it possible that Hill had gone to his late master's residence in defiance of the orders of the police? If so, only some very powerful motive, and probably one which affected the crime, could have induced him to risk his liberty by making such a visit after he had been commanded to keep away from the place. And how would he get into the house? Rolf had himself locked up the house, and had locked the gates, and the bunch of keys was at that moment hanging up in Inspector Chippenfield's room in Scotland Yard. But even as he asked that question, Rolf found himself smiling at himself for his simplicity. Nothing could be easier for a man like Hill, an ex-criminal, to have obtained a duplicate key, before handing over possession of the keys. Rolf had noticed with surprise, when he was locking up the house, that the French windows of the morning room were locked from the outside by a small key as well as being bolted from the inside. Hill had explained that the late Sir Horace Fewbanks had generally used this French window for gaining access to his room after a nocturnal excursion. Rolf looked at his watch. It was nine o'clock. He decided to go to Hampstead and put his suspicion to the test. It was quite possible he was mistaken. But if, on the other hand, Hill was paying a nocturnal visit to Riversbrook, and he had the luck to capture him, he might extract from him some valuable evidence for the forthcoming trial that Hill had kept back. And Rolf was above all things interested at that moment in making the case for the prosecution as strong as possible. Rolf walked to the Camden Town Underground Station, bought a ticket for Hampstead, and took his seat in the tube in that state of exhilarated excitement which comes to the detective when he feels that he is on the road to disclosure. The speed of the train seemed all too slow for the police officer, and he looked at his watch at least a dozen times during the short journey from Camden Town to Hampstead. When Rolf arrived at Hampstead, he set out at a rapid walk for Riversbrook. It was quite dark when he reached Tanton Gardens. He turned into the rustling avenue of chestnut trees and strode swiftly down till he reached the deserted house of the murdered man. The gate was locked as he had left it, but Rolf climbed over it. A late moon was already throwing a refulgent light 
through the evening mists, silvering the tops of the fir trees in front of the house. Rolf walked through the plantation, his footsteps falling noiselessly on the pine needles which strewed the paths. He quickly reached the other side of the little wood, and the Italian garden lay before him, stretching in a silver glory to the dark old house beyond. Rolf stood still at the edge of the wood, and glanced across the moonlit garden to the house. It seemed dark, deserted, and desolate. There was no sign of a light in any of the windows facing the plantation. The moon, rising above the fringe of trees in the woodland which skirted the meadows of the east side of the house, cast a sudden ray athwart the upper portion of the house. But the windows of the retreating first story still remained in shadow. Rolf scrutinized these windows closely. There were three of them. He knew that two of them opened out from the bedroom the dead man used to occupy, and a third one belonged to the library adjoining, the room where the murder had been committed. The moonlight gradually stealing over the house revealed the windows of the bedroom closed and the blinds down. But the library was still in shadow, for a large chestnut tree which grew in front of the house was directly in the line of Rolf's vision. Rolf remained watching the house for some time, but no sign or sound of life could be detected in its silent desolation. "'I must have been mistaken,' he muttered with a final glance at the windows of the first story. "'There's nobody in the house.' He turned to go and had taken a few steps through the pine wood when suddenly he started and stood still. His quick ear had caught a faint sound, a kind of rattle, coming from the direction of the house. What was that noise which sounded so strangely familiar to his ears? He had it. It was the fall of a Venetian blind. Instantaneously there came to Rolf the remembrance that Inspector Chippenfield had ordered the library blind to be left up, so that when the sun was high in the heavens, its rays striking in through the window over the top of the chestnut tree might dry up the stain of blood on the floor, which washing had failed to efface. Somebody was in the library and had dropped the blind. Rolf hurriedly retraced his steps to the edge of the plantation and raced across the Italian garden, feeling for his revolver as he ran. Some instinct told him that he would find entrance through the French windows on the west side of the morning room, and thither he directed his steps. He pulled out his electric torch and tried the windows. They were shut, and the first one was locked. The second one yielded to his hand. He pulled it open and stepped into the room. Making his way by the light of his torch to the stairs, he swiftly but silently crept up them and turned to the library on the left of the first landing. The door was closed, but not locked, and a faint light came through the keyhole. Rolf pushed the door open and looked into the room. A man was leaning over the dead judge's writing desk, examining its contents by the lights of a candle which he had set down on the desk. He was so engrossed in his occupation that he did not hear the door open. "'What are you doing there?' demanded Rolf sternly. His voice sounded hollow and menacing as it reverberated through the room. The man at the desk started up and turned round. It was Hill. When he saw Rolf, he looked as though he would fall. He made as if to step forward. Then he stood quite still, looking at the officer with ashen face. Hill, said Rolf quietly, what does this mean? The butler had regained his self-composure with wonderful quickness. The mask of reticence dropped over his face again, and it was in the smooth, deferential tones of a well-trained servant that he replied, "'Nothing, sir. 
I just slipped over from the shop to see if everything was all right. How did you get into the house? By the French window, sir. I had a duplicate key which Sir Horace had made. And I see you also have a duplicate key of the desk. Why didn't you give these keys up with the others to Inspector Chippenfield? I forgot about them at the time, sir. I found them in an old pocket this evening, and I was so uneasy about the house shut up with a lot of valuable things in it and nobody to give an eye to them that I just slipped across to see everything was all right. You came here after dark and let yourself in with a private key after you had been strictly ordered not to come near the place? You have the audacity to admit you have done this? Well, it's this way, sir. I was a trusted servant of Sir Horace's. I knew a great deal about his private life, if I may say so. I know he kept a lot of private papers in this room, and I wanted to make sure they were safe. I didn't like them being in this empty house, sir. I couldn't sleep in my bed of nights for thinking of them, sir. I felt last night as if my poor dead master was standing at my bedside, urging me to go over. I'm very sorry I disobeyed the police orders, Mr. Rolfe, but I acted for the best. Hill, you are lying. You are keeping something back. Unless you immediately tell me the real reason of your visit to this house tonight, I will take you down to the Hampstead police station and have you locked up. This visit of yours will take a lot of explaining away after your previous confession, Hill. It's enough to put you in the dock with Birchill. Hill's eyes, which had been fixed on Rolf's face, wavered towards the doorway, as though he were meditating a rush for freedom. But he merely remarked, "'I've told you the truth, sir, though perhaps not all of it. I came across to see if I could find some of Sir Horace's private papers which are missing.' "'How do you know there are any papers missing?' As I said before, Mr. Rolfe, Sir Horace trusted me, and he didn't take the trouble to hide things from me. You mean that he often left his desk open, with important papers scattered about it? Yes, sir. And you made a practice of going through them? I didn't make a practice of it, protested Hill but sometimes I glanced at one or two of them. I thought there was no harm in it, knowing that Sir Horace trusted me. And some papers that you knew were there are now missing. Do you mean stolen? Yes, sir. When did you see them last? Just before Inspector Chippenfield came, the morning after the body was discovered. You remember, sir, that he came straight up here while you stayed downstairs talking to Constable Flack. Do you mean to suggest that Inspector Chippenfield stole them? Oh, no, sir. I don't think he saw them. Sir Horace kept them in this little place at the back of the desk. Look at it, sir. It's a sort of secret drawer. Rolf went over to the desk and Hill explained to him how the hiding-place could be closed and opened. It was at the back of the desk under the pigeon-holes, and the fact that the pigeon-holes came close down to the desk hid the secret drawer and the spring which controlled it. "'What was the nature of these papers?' asked Rolf. "'Well, sir, I never read them.' Sir Horace set such store by them that I never dared to open them for fear he would find out. They were mostly letters, and they were tied up with a piece of silk ribbon. "'A lady's letters, of course,' said Rolf. "'Judging from the writing on the envelopes, they were sent by a lady,' said Hill. 
Rolfe breathed quickly, for he felt that he was on the verge of a discovery. Here was evidence of a lady in the case, which might lead to a startling development. Perhaps Crewe was right in declaring that Birchill was the wrong man, he said to himself. Perhaps the murder was not a man, but a woman. And who do you think stole them? he asked Hill. That is more than I would like to say, replied the butler. Are you sure they were in this hiding place when Inspector Chippenfield took charge of everything? Oh, yes, sir. I dusted out the room the morning you and he came to Riversbrook together, and the papers were there then, because I happened to touch the spring as I was dusting the desk, and it flew open and I saw the bundle there. Why didn't you tell Inspector Chippenfield about the papers and the secret drawer? That is what I intended to do, sir, if he didn't find them himself. But when I had found they had gone, I didn't like to say anything to him, because, as you may say, I had no right to know anything about them. When did they go? When did you find they were missing? When Inspector Chippenfield went out for his lunch, I looked in the desk and found they had gone. Who could have taken them? Who had access to the room? Well, sir, Mr. Chippenfield had some visitors that morning. Yes, there were about a dozen newspaper reporters during the day at various times. There were Dr. Slingsby and his assistant, who came out to make the post-mortem, Inspector Selden, who came to arrange about the inquest, and there was that man from the undertakers, who came to inquire about the funeral arrangements. But none of these men were likely to take the papers, and still less to know where they were hidden. In any case, no visitor could get at the desk while Mr. Chippenfield was in the room, and he is too careful to have left any visitor alone in this room. It was here that the murder was committed. He left one of his visitors alone here for a few minutes, said Hill in a voice which was little more than a whisper. Which one? asked Rolf eagerly. A lady. Who was she? Mrs. Holymead. Oh! Rolf's exclamation was one of disappointment. She is a friend of the family. She came out to see Miss Fewbanks. It was a visit of condolence. Yes, sir, said the obsequious butler. She was a friend of the family, as you say. She was a friend of Sir Horace's. I've heard that Sir Horace paid her considerable attention before she married Mr. Holymead. It was a toss-up which of them she married, so I've been told. Rolf saw that he had made a mistake in dismissing the idea of Mrs. Holymead having anything to do with the missing papers. Do you think that she stole these letters, these papers, he asked? Do you think she knew where they were? While she was in the room, Inspector Chippenfield came rushing downstairs for a glass of water. He said she had fainted. <whistles> Rolf gave a low, prolonged whistle. And after she left, you took the first opportunity of looking to see if the papers were still there, and you found they were gone? Yes, sir. What made you suspect Mrs. Holymead would take them? Well, sir, I didn't suspect her at the time. I just looked to see if Inspector Chippenfield had found them. I saw they had gone, and as I couldn't see any sign of them about anywhere else, I concluded they must have been taken without Inspector Chippenfield knowing anything about it. The reason I came over here tonight was to have another careful look round for them. "'What would you have done with the papers if you had found them?' he asked suddenly. "'I would have handed them over to the police, sir,' said the butler, 
who obviously had been prepared for a question of the kind. "'And what explanation would you have given for having found them, for having come over here in defiance of your orders from Inspector Chippenfield?' "'The true explanation, sir,' said the butler, with a mild note of protest in his voice. "'I would have told Inspector Chippenfield what I have already told you. "'And it is the simple truth.' "'Rolf was plainly taken back at this rebuke, but he did not reply to it. "'In your statement of what took place when Birchill returned to the flat after committing the murder,' He said something about having seen a woman leave the house by the front door as he was hiding in the garden. A fashionably dressed woman, I think he said. Yes, sir, that was it. Do you believe that part of his story was true? Well, sir, with a man like Birchill it is impossible to say when he's telling the truth and when he isn't. There was no lady with Sir Horace when you left him that night when he returned from Scotland? No, sir. I think you said he was in a hurry to get you out of the house and told you not to come back? That is what I thought at the time, sir. Well, Hill, said Rolf, resuming his severe official tone, all this does not excuse in any way your conduct in coming over here and forcing your way into the house in defiance of the police opening this desk and prying about for private papers that don't concern you the proper course for you to adopt was to come to scotland yard and tell your story about these missing papers to inspector chippenfield or to myself however i don't propose to take any action against you at present only there is to be no more of it. If you come hanging about here again on your own account, you'll find yourself in the dock beside Birchill. Hand me over the duplicate key of the door by which you came in, and also the key of the desk which you had still less right to have in your possession. Say nothing to anyone about those papers until I give you permission to do so. End of chapter 15 of The Hampstead Mystery by John Watson and Arthur Rees Read by Lars Rolander